Section 10 of The Fortune of the Rougeon, Book 1 of Rougeon Macas Cycle, by Emile Zola, translated by Henry Bizzatelli. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Mark Leder. Chapter 5, Part 1 The high road stretched far away, white with moonlight. The insurrectionary army was continuing its heroic march through the cold, clear country. It was like a mighty wave of enthusiasm. The thrill of patriotism which transported Miette and Silvère, big children that they were, eager for love and liberty, sped with generous fervor athwart the sordid intrigues of the Macarts and the Rougeons. At intervals, the trumpet voice of the people rose and drowned the prattle of the yellow drawing-room and the hateful discourses of Uncle Antoine. And vulgar, ignoble farce was turned into a great historical drama. On quitting Plassans, the insurgents had taken the road to Orcher. They expected to reach that town at about ten o'clock in the morning. The road skirts the course of the Viorne, following at some height the windings of the hillocks, below which the torrent flows. On the left, the plain spreads out like an immense green carpet, dotted here and there with grey villages. On the right, the chain of the Garrigue rears its desolate peaks, its plateau of stones, its huge rusty boulders that look as though they'd been reddened by the sun. The high road, embanked along the riverside, passes on amidst enormous rocks, between which glimpses of the valley are caught at every step. Nothing could be wilder or more strikingly grand than this road out of the hillside. At night time, especially, it inspires one with a feeling of deep awe. The insurgents advanced under the pale light, along what seemed the chief street of some ruined town, bordered on either side with fragments of temples. The moon turned each rock into a broken column, crumbling capital or stretch of wall pierced with mysterious arches. On high slumbered the mass of the Garrigue, suffused with a milky tinge and resembling some immense cyclopean city whose towers, obelisks, houses, and high terraces hid one half of the heavens. And in the depths below, on the side of the plain, was a spreading ocean of diffused light, vague and limitless, over which floated masses of luminous haze. The insurrectionary force might well have thought they were following some gigantic causeway, making their rounds along some military road built on the shore of a phosphorescent sea, encircling some unknown Babel. On the night in question, the Viorne roared hoarsely at the foot of the rocks bordering the route. Amidst the continuous rumbling of a torrent, the insurgents could distinguish the sharp, wailing notes of the toxin. The villages scattered about the plain on the other side of the river were rising, sounding alarm bells and lighting signal fires. Till daybreak, the marching column, which the persistent tolling of a mournful knell seemed to pursue in the darkness, thus beheld the insurrection spreading along the valley like a train of powder. The fires showed in the darkness like stains of blood, Echoes of distant songs were wafted to them. The whole vague distance, blurred by the whitish vapors of the moon, stirred confusedly, and suddenly broke into a spasm of anger. For leagues and leagues the scene remained the same. These men, marching on under the blind impetus of the fever with which the events in Paris had inspired Republican hearts, became elated at seeing that long stretch of country quivering with revolt. Intoxicated with enthusiastic belief in the general insurrection of which they dreamed, they fancied that France was following them. On the other side of the Viorne, in that vast ocean of diffused light, they imagined there were endless files of men rushing like themselves to the defense of the Republic. All simplicity and delusion as multitudes so often are, they imagined in their uncultured minds that victory was easy and certain, 
They would have seized and shot as a traitor anyone who had then asserted that they were the only ones who had the courage of their duty, and that the rest of the country, overwhelmed with fright, was pusillanimously allowing itself to be garroted. They derived fresh courage, too, from the welcome accorded to them by the few localities that lay along their route on the slope of the Garig. The inhabitants rose en masse immediately the little army drew near. Women ran to meet them, wishing them a speedy victory, while men, half-clad, seized the first weapons they could find and rushed to join their ranks. There was a fresh ovation at every village, shouts of welcome and farewell many times reiterated. Towards daybreak, the moon disappeared behind the Garig, and the insurgents continued their rapid march amidst the dense darkness of a winter night. They were now unable to distinguish the valley or the hills, they heard only the hoarse plaints of the bells, sounding through the deep obscurity like invisible drums, hidden they knew not where, but ever goading them on with despairing calls. Miette and Silver went on, all eagerness like the others. Towards daybreak, the girl suffered greatly from fatigue. She could only walk with short, hurried steps and was unable to keep up with the long strides of the men who surrounded her. Nevertheless, she courageously strove to suppress all complaints. It would have cost her too much to confess that she was not as strong as a boy. During the first few leagues of the march, Silver gave her his arm. Then, seeing that the standard was gradually slipping from her benumbed hands, he tried to take it in order to relieve her. But she grew angry, and would only allow him to hold it with one hand while she continued to carry it on her shoulder. She thus maintained her heroic demeanor with childish stubbornness, smiling at the young man each time he gave her a glance of loving anxiety. At last, when the moon hid itself, she gave way in the sheltering darkness. Silver felt her leaning more heavily on his arm. He now had to carry the flag and hold her round the waist to prevent her from stumbling. Nevertheless, she still made no complaint. "'Are you very tired, poor Miette?' Silver asked her. "'Yes, a little tired,' she replied in a weary tone. "'Would you like to rest a bit?' She made no reply, but he realized that she was staggering. He thereupon handed the flag to one of the other insurgents and quitted the ranks, almost carrying the girl in his arms." She struggled a little, she felt so distressed at appearing such a child. But he calmed her, telling her that he knew of a crossroad which shortened the distance by one half. They would be able to take a good hour's rest and reach or share at the same time as the others. It was then six o'clock. There must have been a slight mist rising from the Viorne, for the darkness seemed to be growing denser. The young people groped their way along the slope of the Garigue, till they came to a rock on which they sat down. Around them lay an abyss of darkness. They were stranded, as it were, on some reef above a dense void. And athwart that void, when the dull tramp of a little army had died away, they only heard two bells, the one clear-toned and ringing, doubtless at their feet, in some village across the road, and the other far off and faint, responding, as it were, with distant sobs to the feverish plaints of the first. One might have thought that these bells were recounting to each other, through the empty waste, the sinister story of a perishing world. Miette and Silver, warmed by their quick march, did not at first feel the cold. They remained silent, listening in great dejection to the sounds of a toxin, which made the darkness quiver. They could not even see one another. Miette felt frightened, and, seeking for Silvera's hand, clasped it in her own. After the feverish enthusiasm, which for several hours had carried them along with the others, this sudden halt and the solitude in which they found themselves side by side left them exhausted and bewildered as though they had suddenly awakened from a strange dream. They felt as if a wave had cast them beside the highway, then ebbed back and left them stranded. Irresistible reaction plunged them into listless stupor. They forgot their enthusiasm, 
They thought no more of the men whom they had to rejoin. They surrendered themselves to the melancholy sweetness of finding themselves alone, hand in hand, in the midst of the wild darkness. "'You are not angry with me?' the girl at length inquired. "'I could easily walk the whole night with you, but they were running too quickly. I could hardly breathe.' "'Why should I be angry with you?' the young man said. I don't know. I was afraid you might not love me any longer. I wish I could have taken long strides like you and have walked along without stopping. You will think that I'm a child. Sylvère smiled, and Miette, though the darkness prevented her from seeing him, guessed that he was doing so. Then she continued with determination. You must not always treat me like a sister. I want to be your wife some day. Forthwith, she clasped Sylvère to her bosom, and still with her arms about him, murmured, We shall grow so cold. Come close to me that we may be warm. Then they lapsed into silence. Until that troublous hour, they had loved one another with the affection of brother and sister. In their ignorance, they still mistook their feelings for tender friendship, although beneath their guileless love their ardent blood surged more wildly day by day. Given age and experience, a violent passion of southern intensity would at last spring from this edel. Every girl who hangs on a youth's neck is already a woman, a woman unconsciously, whom a caress may awaken to conscious womanhood. When lovers kiss on the cheeks, it is because they are searching, feeling for one another's lips. Lovers are made by a kiss. It was on that dark and cold December night, amid the bitter wailing of a toxin, that Miette and Sylvère exchanged one of those kisses that bring all the heart's blood to the lips. They remained silent, close to one another. A gentle glow soon penetrated them. Languor overcame them and steeped them in feverish drowsiness. They were quite warm at last, and lights seemed to flit before their closed eyelids while a buzzing mounted to their brains. This state of painful ecstasy, which lasted some minutes, seemed endless to them. Then, in a kind of dream, their lips met. The kiss they exchanged was long and greedy. It seemed to them as if they had never kissed before. Yet their embrace was fraught with suffering, and they released one another. And the chilliness of the night having cooled their fever, they remained in great confusion at some distance one from the other. Meanwhile, the bells were keeping up their sinister converse in the dark abyss which surrounded the young people. Miette, trembling and frightened, did not dare to draw near to Sylvère again. She did not even know if he were still there, for she could no longer hear him move. The stinging sweetness of their kiss still clung to their lips, to which passionate phrases surged, and they longed to kiss once more. But shame restrained them from the expression of any such desire. They felt that they would rather never taste that bliss again than speak of it aloud. If their blood had not been lashed by their rapid march, if the darkness had not offered complicity, they would, for a long time yet, have continued kissing each other on the cheeks like old playfellows. Feelings of modesty were coming to Miette. She remembered Justin's coarseness. A few hours previously she'd listened, without a blush, to that fellow who called her a shameless girl. She'd wept without understanding his meaning. She'd wept simply because she guessed that what he spoke of must be base. Now that she was becoming a woman, she wondered in a last innocent transport whether that kiss whose burning smart she could still feel, would not perhaps suffice to cover her with the shame to which her cousin had referred. Thereupon she was seized with remorse and burst into sobs. "'What's the matter? Why are you crying?' asked Sylvia in an anxious voice. "'Oh, leave me,' she faltered. "'I do not know.' Then in spite of herself, as it were, she continued amidst her tears, Ah, what an unfortunate creature I am! 
When I was ten years old, people used to throw stones at me. Today I am treated as the vilest of creatures. She stand it right to despise me before everybody. We've been doing wrong, Silvere. The young man, quite dismayed, clasped her in his arms again, trying to console her. I love you, he whispered. I am your brother. Why say that we've been doing wrong? We kissed each other because we were cold. You know very well that we used to kiss each other every evening before separating. Oh, not as we did just now, she whispered. It must be wrong, for a strange feeling came over me. The men will laugh at me now as I pass, and they'll be right in doing so. I shall not be able to defend myself. The young fellow remained silent, unable to find a word to calm the agitation in this big child, trembling at her first kiss of love. He clasped her gently, imagining that he might calm her by his embrace. She struggled, however, and continued, If you like, we will go away. We will leave the province. I can never return to Plassans. My uncle would beat me. All the townspeople would point their fingers at me. And then, as if seized with sudden irritation, she added, But no, I am cursed. I forbid you to leave Aunt Didet to follow me. You must leave me on the highway. Miet, Miet, Silvere implored, don't talk like that. Yes, I want to please you. Be reasonable. They've turned me out like a vagabond. If I went back with you, you would always be fighting for my sake, and I don't want that. At this the young man again pressed a kiss upon her lips, murmuring, You shall be my wife, and nobody will then dare to hurt you. Oh, please, I entreat you, she said with a stifled cry. Don't kiss me so. You hurt me. Then, after a short silence, You know quite well that I cannot be your wife now. We are too young. You would have to wait for me, and meanwhile I should die of shame. You're wrong in protesting. You'll be forced to leave me in some corner. At this, Silver, his fortitude exhausted, began to cry. A man's sobs are fraught with distressing hoarseness. Miette, quite frightened as she felt the poor fellow shaking in her arms, kissed him on the face, forgetting she was burning her lips. But it was all her fault. She was a little simpleton to have let a kiss upset her so completely. She now clasped her lover to her bosom as if to beg forgiveness for having pained him. These weeping children, so anxiously clasping one another, made the dark night yet more woeful than before. In the distance, the bells continued to complain unceasingly in panting accents. It is better to die, repeated Silver amidst his sobs. It is better to die. Don't cry. Forgive me, stammered Miette. I will be brave. I will do all you wish. When the young man had dried his tears. You are right, he said. We cannot return to Plassans. By the time for cowardice has not yet come. If we come out of the struggle triumphant, I will go for Aunt Didet, and we will take her ever so far away with us. If we are beaten... He stopped. If we are beaten, repeated Miette softly, then be it as God wills, continued Silvere in a softer voice. I most likely shall not be there, you will comfort the poor woman. That would be better. Ah, as you said just now, the young girl murmured, it would be better to die. At this longing for death, they tightened their embrace. Miette relied upon dying with Silver. He'd only spoken of himself, but she felt that he would gladly take her with him into the earth. They would there be able to love each other more freely than under the sun. Aunt Didet would die likewise and join them. It was, so to say, a rapid presentiment, 
a desire for some strange voluptuousness to which heaven, by the mournful accents of the toxin, was promising early gratification. To die, to die, the bells repeated these words with increasing passion, and the lovers yielded to the calls of a darkness. They fancied they experienced the foretaste of the last sleep in the drowsiness into which they again sank, whilst their lips met once more. Miette no longer turned away. It was she now who pressed her lips to Silver's, who sought with mute ardor for the delight whose stinging smart she had not at first been able to endure. The thought of approaching death had excited her. She no longer felt herself blushing, but hung upon her love while he in faltering voice repeated, I love you. I love you. But at this Miette shook her head, as if to say it was not true. With her free and ardent nature, she had a secret instinct of the meaning and purposes of life, and though she was right willing to die, she would fain have known life first. At last, growing calmer, she gently rested her head on the young man's shoulder, without uttering a word. Silver kissed her again, she tasted those kisses slowly, seeking their meaning, their hidden sweetness. As she felt them course through her veins, she interrogated them, asking if they were all love, all passion. But languor at last overcame her, and she fell into gentle slumber. Silver had enveloped her in her pelisse, drawing the skirt around himself at the same time. They no longer felt cold. The young man rejoiced to find from the regularity of her breathing that the girl was now asleep. This repose would enable them to proceed on their way with spirit. He resolved to let her slumber for an hour. The sky was still black, and the approach of day was but faintly indicated by a whitish line in the east. Behind the lovers there must have been a pine wood whose musical awakening it was that the young man heard amidst the morning breezes. And meantime, the wailing of the bells grew more sonorous in the quivering atmosphere, lulling me at slumber even as it had accompanied her passionate fever. Until that troublous night, these young people had lived through one of those innocent idols that blossom among the toiling masses, those outcasts and folks of simple mind amidst whom one may yet occasionally find amours as primitive as those of the ancient Greek romances. Miette had been scarcely nine years old at the time when her father was sent to the galleys for shooting a gendarme. The trial of Chantegre had remained a memorable case in the province. The poacher boldly confessed that he had killed the gendarme, but he swore that the latter had been taking aim at him. I only anticipated him, he said. I defended myself. It was a duel, not a murder. He never desisted from this line of argument. The presiding judge of the Assizes could not make him understand that, although a gendarme has the right to fire upon a poacher, a poacher has no right to fire upon a gendarme. Chantegray escaped the guillotine, owing to his obviously sincere belief in his own innocence and his previous good character. The man wept like a child when his daughter was brought to him prior to his departure for Toulon. The little thing who'd lost her mother in her infancy dwelt at this time with her grandfather at Chavanot, a village in the passes of the Sey. When the poacher was no longer there, the old man and the girl lived upon alms. The inhabitants of Chavanot, all sportsmen and poachers, came to the assistance of the poor creatures whom the convict had left behind him. After a while, however, the old man died of grief and Miette, left alone by herself, would have had to beg on the high roads if her neighbors had not remembered that she had an aunt at Plassans. The charitable soul was kind enough to take her to this aunt, who did not, however, receive her very kindly. Yulali Chantigray, the spouse of Major Rebuffat, was a big, dark, stubborn creature who ruled the home. She led her husband by the nose, and the people of the Faubourg of Plassans. The truth was, Rebuffat, avaricious and eager for work and gain, felt a sort of respect for this big creature, 
who combined uncommon vigor with strict sobriety and economy. Thanks to her, the household thrived. The Meje grumbled one evening when, on returning home from work, he found Miette installed there. But his wife closed his mouth by saying in her gruff voice, Ah, a little thing strongly built. She'll do for a servant. We'll keep her and save wages. This calculation pleased Rebuffat. He went so far as to feel the little thing's arms and declared with satisfaction that she was sturdy for her age. Miette was then nine years old. From the very next day he made use of her. The work of the peasant woman in the south of France is much lighter than in the north. One seldom sees them employed in digging the ground, carrying loads, or doing other kinds of men's work. They bind sheaves, gather olives and mulberry leaves. Perhaps their most laborious work is that of weeding. Miette worked away willingly. Open-air life was her delight, her health. So long as her aunt lived, she was always smiling. The good woman, in spite of her roughness, at last loved her as her own child. She forbade her doing the hard work which her husband sometimes tried to force upon her, saying to the latter, Ah, you're a clever fellow. You don't understand, you fool, that if you tire her too much today, she won't be able to do anything tomorrow. This argument was decisive. Rebuffant bowed his head and carried the load which he had desired to set on the young girl's shoulders. The latter would have lived in perfect happiness under the secret protection of her aunt Ulali, but for the teasing of her cousin, who was then a lad of sixteen and employed his idle hours in hating and persecuting her. She stands happiest moments were those when, by means of some gross falsehood, he succeeded in getting her scolded. Whenever he could tread on her feet or push her roughly, pretending not to have seen her, he laughed and felt the delight of those crafty folks who rejoice at other people's misfortunes. Miette, however, would stare at him with her large, black, childish eyes gleaming with anger and silent scorn, which checked the cowardly youngster's sneers. In reality, he was terribly afraid of his cousin. The young girl was just attaining her eleventh year when her aunt Ulali suddenly died. From that day, everything changed in the house. Rebuffat gradually came to treat her like a farm laborer. He overwhelmed her with all sorts of rough work and made use of her as a beast of burden. She never even complained, however, thinking that she had a debt of gratitude to repay him. In the evening, when she was worn out with fatigue, she mourned for her aunt, that terrible woman whose latent kindliness she now realized. However, it was not the hard work that distressed her, for she delighted in her strength and took a pride in her big arms and broad shoulders. What distressed her was her uncle's distrustful surveillance, his continual reproaches, and the irritated, employer-like manner he assumed towards her. She'd now become a stranger in the house. Yet even a stranger would not have been so badly treated as she was. Rebuffat took the most unscrupulous advantage of his poor little relative, whom he pretended to keep out of charity. She repaid his harsh hospitality ten times over with her work, and yet never a day passed but he grudged her the bread she ate. Justin especially excelled in wounding her. Since his mother had been dead, Seeing her without a protector, he'd brought all his evil instincts into play in trying to make the house intolerable to her. The most ingenious torture which he invented was to speak to Miette of her father. The poor girl living away from the world under the protection of her aunt, who had forbidden anyone ever to mention the words galleys or convict before her, hardly understood their meaning. It was Justin who explained it to her by relating, in his own manner, the story of the murder of the gendarme and Chantegray's conviction. There was no end to the horrible particulars he supplied. The convicts had a cannonball fastened to one ankle by a chain. They worked fifteen hours a day, and all died under their punishment. Their prison, too, was a frightful place, the horrors of which he described minutely. Miette listened to him, stupefied her eyes full of tears. 
Sometimes she was roused to sudden violence, and she stand quickly retired before her clenched fists. However, he took a savage delight in thus instructing her as to the nature of prison life. When his father flew into a passion with the child for any little negligence, he chimed in, glad to be able to insult her without danger. And if she attempted to defend herself, he would exclaim, Bah! Bad blood always shows itself. You'll end at the galleys like your father. At this, Miet sobbed, stung to the heart, powerless and overwhelmed with shame. She was already growing to womanhood at this period. Of precocious nature, she endured her martyrdom with extraordinary fortitude. She rarely gave way, excepting when her natural pride succumbed to her cousin's outrages. Soon, even, she was able to bear without a tear the incessant insults of this cowardly fellow, whoever watched her while he spoke for fear lest she should fly at his face. Then, too, she learned to silence him by staring at him fixedly. She had several times felt inclined to run away from the Jasme Frein, but she did not do so as her courage could not brook the idea of confessing that she was vanquished by the persecution she endured. She certainly earned her bread. She did not steal the Rebufas hospitality, and this conviction satisfied her pride. So she remained there to continue the struggle, stiffening herself and living on with the one thought of resistance. Her plan was to do her work in silence and revenge herself for all harsh treatment by mute contempt. She knew that her uncle derived too much advantage from her to listen readily to the insinuations of Justin, who longed to get her turned out of doors. And in a defiant spirit she resolved that she would not go away of her own accord. Her continuous voluntary silence was full of strange fancies. Passing her days in the enclosure, Isolated from all the world, she formed ideas for herself which would have strangely shocked the good people of the Faubourg. Her father's fate particularly occupied her thoughts. All Justin's abuse recurred to her, and she ended by accepting the charge of murder, saying to herself, however, that her father had done well to kill the gendarme who tried to kill him. She'd learnt the real story from a labourer who had worked for a time at the Jasme Frein. From that moment, on the few occasions when she went out, she no longer even turned if the ragamuffins of the Faubourg followed her, crying, Eh, hey, la chante gray! She simply hastened her steps homeward with lips compressed and black, fierce eyes. Then, after shutting the gate, she perhaps cast one long glance at the gang of urchins. She would have become vicious, have lapsed into fierce pariah savagery if her childishness had not sometimes gained the mastery. Her extreme youth brought her little girlish weaknesses, which relieved her. She would then cry with shame for herself and her father. She'd hide herself in a stable so that she might sob to her heart's content, for she knew that if the others saw her crying, they'd torment her all the more. And when she'd wept sufficiently, she'd bathe her eyes in the kitchen and then again subside into uncomplaining silence. It was not interest alone, however, which prompted her to hide herself. She carried her pride and her precocious strength so far that she was unwilling to appear a child. In time, she would have become very unhappy. Fortunately, she was saved by discovering the latent tenderness of her loving nature. The well in the yard of the house occupied by Aunt Didet and Silver was a party well. The wall of the Jacques Meffrin cut it in halves. Formerly, before the Fouquet's property was united to the neighboring estate, the market gardeners had used this well daily. Since the transfer of the Fouquet's ground, however, as it was at some distance from the outhouses, the inmates of the Jacques, who had large cisterns at their disposal, did not draw a pail of water from it in a month. On the other side, one could hear the grating of the pulley every morning when Silver drew the water for Aunt Didet. One day, the pulley broke. The young wheelwright made a good strong one of oak and put it up in the evening after his day's work. To do this, he had to climb upon the wall. When he'd finished the job, he remained resting astride the coping and surveyed with curiosity the large expanse of the Jacques Meffrin. 
At last, a peasant girl, who was weeding the ground a few feet from him, attracted his attention. It was in July, and the air was broiling, although the sun had already sank to the horizon. The peasant girl had taken off her jacket. In a white bodice, with a colored neckerchief tied over her shoulders, and the sleeves of her chemise turned up as far as her elbows, she was squatting amid the folds of her blue cotton skirt, which was secured to a pair of braces crossed behind her back. She crawled about on her knees as she pulled up the tarries and threw them into a basket. The young man could only see her bare, sun-tanned arms stretching out right and left to seize some overlooked weed. He followed this rapid play of her arms complacently, deriving a singular pleasure from seeing them so firm and quick. The young person had slightly raised herself on noticing that he was no longer at work, but had again lowered her head before he could distinguish her features. This shyness kept him in suspense. Like an inquisitive lad, he wondered who this weeder could be, and while he lingered there, whistling and beating time with a chisel, the latter suddenly slipped out of his hand. It fell into the jasme striking the curb of the well and then, and then bounding a few feet from the wall. Sylvère looked at it, leaning forward and hesitating to get over. But the peasant girl must have been watching the young man askance, for she jumped up without saying anything, picked up the chisel, and handed it to Sylvère, who then perceived that she was a mere child, he was surprised and rather intimidated. The young girl raised herself towards him in the red glare of the sunset. The wall at this spot was low, but nevertheless too high for her to reach him. So he bent low over the coping, while she still raised herself on tiptoes. They did not speak, but looked at each other with an air of smiling confusion. The young man would indeed have liked to keep the girl in that position, she turned to him a charming head with handsome black eyes and red lips, which quite astonished and stirred him. He'd never before seen a girl so near. He'd not known that lips and eyes could be so pleasant to look at. Everything about the girl seemed to possess a strange fascination for him. Her colored neckerchief, her white bodice, her blue cotton skirt hanging from braces which stretched with the motion of her shoulders— then his glance glided along the arm which was handing him the tool. As far as the elbow, this arm was of a golden brown, as though clothed with sunburn. But higher up, in the shadow of a tucked-up sleeve, Silvère perceived the bare, milk-white roundness. At this, he felt confused. However, he leant further over and at last managed to grasp the chisel. The little peasant girl was becoming embarrassed. Still, they remained there smiling at each other the child beneath with upturned face, and the lad half reclining on the coping of the wall. They could not part from each other. So far they had not exchanged a word, and Silvera even forgot to say thank you. "'What's your name?' he asked. "'Marie,' replied the peasant girl, "'but everybody calls me Miette.' Again she raised herself slightly, and in a clear voice inquired in her turn, "'And yours?' "'My name is Silvère,' the young workman replied. A pause ensued, during which they seemed to be listening complacently to the music of their names. "'I'm fifteen years old,' resumed Silvère. "'And you?' "'I,' said Miette. "'Oh, I shall be eleven on All Saints' Day.' The young workman made a gesture of surprise. "'Ah, really?' he said, laughing. "'And to think I took you for a woman. You've such big arms.' She also began to laugh as she lowered her eyes to her arms. Then they ceased speaking. They remained for another moment gazing and smiling at each other. And finally, as Silvere seemingly had no more questions to ask her, Miette quietly withdrew and went on plucking her weeds without raising her head. The lad, for his part, remained on the wall for a while. The sun was setting. A stream of oblique rays poured over the yellow soil of a jasme which seemed to be all ablaze. One would have said that a fire was running along the ground. 
and in the midst of the flaming expanse, Silver saw the little, stooping, peasant girl whose bare arms had resumed their rapid motion. The blue cotton skirt was now becoming white, and rays of light streamed over the child's copper-colored arms. At last Silver felt somewhat ashamed of remaining there, and accordingly got off the wall. In the evening, preoccupied with his adventure, he endeavored to question Aunt Dide. Perhaps she'd know who this Miet was who had such black eyes and such red lips. But since she had lived in the house in the alley, the old woman had never once given a look behind the wall of a little yard. It was to her like an impassable rampart which shut off her past. She did not know, she did not want to know, what there might now be on the other side of that wall, in that old enclosure of the Fouquet's, where she had buried her love, her heart, and her flesh. As soon as Silver began to question her, she looked at him with childish terror. Was he then going to stir up the ashes of those days, now dead and gone, and make her weep like her son Antoine had done? I don't know, she said in a hasty voice. I no longer go out. I never see anybody. Silver waited the morrow with considerable impatience, and as soon as he got to his master's workshop, he drew his fellow workmen into conversation. He did not say anything about his interview with Miette, but spoke vaguely of a girl whom he'd seen from a distance in the Josh Mefrain. Oh, that's La Chantagray, cried one of the workmen. There was no necessity for Sylvier to question them further, for they told him the story of the poacher Chantagray and his daughter Miette, with that unreasoning spite which is felt for social outcasts. The girl in particular they treated in a foul manner, and the insulting jibe of daughter of a galley slave constantly rose to their lips like an incontestable reason for condemning the poor, dear, innocent creature to eternal disgrace. However, Wheelwright Vian, an honest, worthy fellow, at last silenced his men. Hold your tongues, you foul mouths, he said, as he let fall the shaft of a cart that he'd been examining. You ought to be ashamed of yourselves for being so hard upon the child. I've seen her. The little thing looks a very good girl. Besides, I'm told she doesn't mind work, and already does as much as any woman of thirty. There are some lazy fellows here who aren't a match for her. I hope later on that she'll get a good husband who'll stop this evil talk. Silver, who'd been chilled by the workman's gross jests and insults, felt tears rise to his eyes at the last word spoken by Vian. However, he did not open his lips. He took up his hammer, which he'd laid down near him, and began with all his might to strike the knave of a wheel which he was binding with iron. In the evening, as soon as he'd returned home from the workshop, he ran to the wall and climbed upon it. He found Miette engaged upon the same labor as the day before. He called her. She came to him with a smile of embarrassment and the charming shyness of a girl who from infancy had grown up in tears. "'You're La Chantagre, aren't you?' he asked her abruptly. She recoiled. She ceased smiling and her eyes turned sternly black, gleaming with defiance. So this lad was going to insult her like the others. She was turning her back upon him without giving an answer when Silver. Perplexed by her sudden change of countenance, hastened to add, Stay, I beg you. I don't want to pain you. I've got so many things to tell you. She turned round, still distrustful. Silver, whose heart was full and who had resolved to relieve it, remained for a moment speechless, not knowing how to continue, for he feared lest he should commit a fresh blunder. At last he put his whole heart in one phrase. Would you like me to be your friend, he said, in a voice full of emotion. And as Miette in surprise raised her eyes, which were again moist and smiling, he continued with animation. I know that people try to vex you. It's time to put a stop to it. I will be your protector now, shall I? The child beamed with delight. 
This preferred friendship roused her from all her evil dreams of taciturn hatred. Still, she shook her head and answered, No, I don't want you to fight on my account. You'd have too much to do. Beside which, there are persons from whom you cannot protect me. Silverd wished to declare that he'd defend her against the whole world, but she closed his mouth with a coaxing gesture as she added, I'm satisfied to have you as a friend. They then conversed together for a few minutes, lowering their voices as much as possible. Miet spoke to Silver of her uncle and her cousin. For all the words, she would not have liked them to catch him astride the coping of the wall. Shistan would be implacable with such a weapon against her. She spoke of her misgivings with the fright of a schoolgirl, on meeting a friend with whom her mother has forbidden her to associate. Silver merely understood, however, that he would not be able to see Miet at his pleasure. This made him very sad. Still, he promised that he would not climb upon the wall any more. They were both endeavoring to find some expedient for seeing each other again, when Miet suddenly begged him to go away. She just caught sight of Justin, who was crossing the grounds in the direction of the wall. Silver quickly descended. When he was in the little yard again, he remained by the wall to listen, irritated by his flight. After a few minutes, he ventured to climb again and cast a glance into the Jachemefrain. But he saw Justin speaking with Miette and quickly withdrew his head. On the following day, he could see nothing of his friend, not even in the distance. She must have finished her work in that part of the Jass. A week passed in this fashion, and the young people had no opportunity of exchanging a single word. Silver was in despair. He thought of boldly going to the Rebufats to ask for Miette. The party well was a large one, but not very deep. On either side of the wall, the curb formed a large semicircle. The water was only ten or twelve feet down at the utmost. This slumbering water reflected the two apertures of the well, two half-moons between which the shadow of the wall cast a black streak. On leaning over, one might have fancied in the vague light that the half-moons were two mirrors of singular clearness and brilliance. Under the morning sunshine, when the dripping of the ropes did not disturb the surface of the water, these mirrors, these reflections of the heavens, showed like white patches on the green water, and in them the leaves of the ivy which had spread along the wall over the well were repeated with marvelous exactness. One morning, at an early hour, Silver, as he came to draw water for Auntie Day, bent over the well mechanically, just as he was taking hold of the rope. He started, and then stood motionless, still leaning over. He'd fancied that he could distinguish in the well the face of a young girl who was looking at him with a smile. However, he'd shaken the rope, and the disturbed water was now but a dim mirror that no longer reflected anything clearly. Silver, who did not venture to stir, and whose heart beat rapidly, then waited for the water to settle. As its ripples gradually widened and died away, he perceived the image reappearing. It oscillated for a long time with a swing which lent a vague, phantom-like grace to its features. But at last it remained stationary. It was the smiling countenance of Miette, with her head and shoulders, her colored neckerchief, her white bodice, and her blue braces. Silver next perceived his own image in the other mirror. Then, knowing that they could see each other, they nodded their heads. For the first moment they did not even think of speaking. At last they exchanged greetings. Good morning, Silver. Good morning, Miet. They were surprised by the strange sound of their voices, which became singularly soft and sweet in that damp hole. The sound seemed indeed to come from a distance, like the soft music of voices heard of an evening in the country. They understood that it would suffice to speak in a whisper in order to hear each other. The well echoed the faintest breath. Leaning over its brink, they conversed while gazing at one another's reflection. Miette related how sad she'd been the last week. She was now working at the other end of the Jasse and could only get out early in the morning. 
and she made a pout of annoyance which Silvere distinguished perfectly, and to which he replied by nodding his head with an air of vexation. They were exchanging all those gestures and facial expressions that speech entails. They cared but little for the wall which separated them now that they could see each other in those hidden depths. I knew, continued Miette with a knowing look, that you came here to draw water every morning at the same hour. I can hear the grating of the pulley from the house. So I made an excuse. I pretended that the water in this well boiled the vegetables better. I thought that I might come here every morning to draw water at the same time as you, so as to say good morning to you without anyone suspecting. She smiled innocently, as though well pleased with her device, and ended by saying, But I did not imagine we should see each other in the water. It was, in fact, this unhoped-for pleasure which so delighted them. They only spoke to see their lips move, so greatly did this new frolic amuse their childish natures and they resolved to use all means in their power to meet here every morning. When Miette had said she must go away, she told Silvere that he could draw his pail of water. But he did not dare to shake the rope. Miette was still leaning over. He could see her smiling face, and it was too painful to him to dispel that smile. As he slightly stirred his pail, the water murmured and the smile faded. Then he stopped seized with a strange fear. He fancied that he had vexed her and made her cry. But the child called to him, Go on, go on, with a laugh which the echo prolonged and rendered more sonorous. She herself then noisily sent down a pail. There was a perfect tempest. Everything disappeared under the black water. And Silvere made up his mind to fill two pitchers while listening to the retreating steps of Miette on the other side of the wall. From that day the young people never missed their assignations. The slumbering water, the white mirrors in which they gazed at one another, imparted to their interviews a charm which long sufficed their playful, childish imaginations. They had no desire to see each other face to face. It seemed much more amusing to them to use the well as a mirror and confide their morning greetings to its echo. They soon came to look upon the well as an old friend. They loved to bend over the motionless water that resembled molten silver. A greenish glimmer hovered below in a mysterious half-light and seemed to change the damp hole into some hiding place in the depths of a wood. They saw each other in a sort of greenish nest bedecked with moss in the midst of fresh water and foliage. And all the strangeness of a deep spring the hollow tower over which they bent, trembling with fascination, added unconfessed and delightful fear to their merry laughter. The wild idea occurred to them of going down and seating themselves on a row of large stones, which formed a kind of circular bench at a few inches above the water. They would dip their feet in the ladder, converse there for hours, and no one would think of coming to look for them in such a spot. But when they asked each other what there might be down there, their vague fears returned. They thought it quite sufficient to let their reflected images descend into the depths amidst those green glimmers which tinged the stones with strange moir-like reflections, and amidst those mysterious noises which rose from the dark corners. Those sounds issuing from the invisible made them particularly uneasy. They often fancied that voices were replying to their own, and then they would remain silent, detecting a thousand faint plaints which they could not understand. These came from the secret travail of the moisture, the sighs of the atmosphere, the drops that glided over the stones and fell below with the sonorousness of sobs. They would nod affectionately to each other in order to reassure themselves. Thus the attraction which kept them leaning over the brink had a tinge of secret terror like all poignant charms. But the well still remained their old friend. It was such an excellent pretext for meeting. Justin, who watched Miette's every movement, never suspected the cause of her eagerness to go and draw some water every morning. At times he saw her from a distance, leaning over and loitering. Ah, the lazy thing, he muttered. 
How fond she is of dawdling about. How could he suspect that on the other side of the wall there was a wooer contemplating the girl's smile in the water and saying to her, If that red-haired donkey Justin should ill-treat you, just tell me of it and he shall hear from me. This amusement lasted for more than a month. It was July then. The mornings were sultry. The sun shone brightly, and it was quite a pleasure to come to that damp spot. It was delightful to feel the cold breath of the well on one's face and make love amidst the spring water while the skies were kindling their fires. Miette would arrive out of breath after crossing the stubble fields. As she ran along, her hair fell down over her forehead and temples, and it was with flushed face and disheveled locks that she'd lean over, shaking with laughter, almost before she had had time to set her pitcher down. Silver, who was almost always the first at the well, felt as he suddenly saw her smiling face in the water, as keen a joy as he would have experienced had she suddenly thrown herself into his arms at the bend of a pathway. Around them the radiant morning hummed with mirth. A wave of warm light, sonorous with the buzzing of insects, beat against the old wall, the posts, and the curbstone. They, however, no longer saw the shower of morning sunshine, nor heard the thousand sounds rising from the ground. They were in the depths of their green hiding place, under the earth, in that mysterious and awesome cavity, and quivered with pleasure as they lingered there enjoying its fresh coolness and dim light. On some mornings, Miette, who by nature could not long maintain a contemplative attitude, began to tease. She would shake the rope and make drops of water fall in order to ripple the mirrors and deface the reflections. Silver would then entreat her to remain still. He, whose fervor was deeper than hers, knew no keener pleasure than that of gazing at his love's image reflected so distinctly in every feature. But she would not listen to him. She would joke and feign a rough old bogey's voice, to which the echo imparted a raucous melodiousness. No, no, she would say in chiding fashion. I don't love you today. I'm making faces at you. See how ugly I am. And she laughed at seeing the fantastic forms which their spreading faces assumed as they danced upon the disturbed water. One morning, she got angry in real earnest. She did not find Silver at the trysting place and waited for him for nearly a quarter of an hour, vainly making the pulley great. She was just about to depart in a rage when he arrived. As soon as she perceived him, she let a perfect tempest loose in the well, shook her pail in an irritated manner, and made the blackish water whirl and splash against the stones. In vain did Silver try to explain that Auntie Day had detained him. To all his excuses, she replied, You vexed me. I don't want to see you. The poor lad, in despair, vainly questioned that somber cavity, now so full of lamentable sounds, where, on other days, such a bright vision usually awaited him amidst the silence of the stagnant water. He had to go away without seeing me yet. On the morrow, arriving before the time, he gazed sadly into the well, hearing nothing, and thinking that the obstinate girl would not come, when she, who was already on the other side, slyly watching his arrival, bent over suddenly with a burst of laughter. All was at once forgotten. In this wise, the well was the scene of many a little drama and comedy, that happy cavity with its gleaming mirrors and musical echoes quickly ripened their love. They endowed it with such strange life, so filled it with their youthful love, that long after they had ceased to come and lean over the brink, Silver, as he drew water every morning, would fancy he could see me at smiling face in the dim light that still quivered with the joy they had set there. That month of playful love rescued me from her mute despair. She felt a revival of her affections, her happy childish carelessness, which had been held in check by the hateful loneliness in which she lived. The certainty that she was loved by somebody and that she was no longer alone in the world enabled her to endure the persecutions of Justin and the Faubourg urchins. A song of joy whose glad notes drowned their hootings now sounded in her heart. 
She thought of her father with tender compassion and did not now so frequently yield to dreams of bitter vengeance. Her dawning love cooled her feverish broodings like the fresh breezes of the dawn. At the same time, she acquired the instinctive cunning of a young girl in love. She felt that she must maintain her usual silent and rebellious demeanor if she were to escape Justin's suspicions. But in spite of her efforts, her eyes retained a sweet, unruffled expression when the lad bullied her. She was no longer able to put on her old black look of indignant anger. One morning, he heard her humming to herself at breakfast time. "'You seem very gay, Chantegray,' he said to her suspiciously, glancing keenly at her from his lowering eyes. "'I bet you've been up to some of your tricks again.' She shrugged her shoulders, but she trembled inwardly and she did all she could to regain her old appearance of rebellious martyrdom. However, though Justin suspected some secret happiness, it was long before he was able to discover how his victim had escaped him. This ends Chapter 5, Part 1. Section 11 of the Fortune of the Rougeon, Book One of Rougeon Maca Cycle, by Emile Zola, translated by Henry Bizzitelli. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Mark Leader. Chapter Five, Part Two. Silver, on his side, enjoyed profound happiness. His daily meetings with Miette made his idle hours pass pleasantly away. During his long, silent companionship with Aunt Didet, he recalled one by one his remembrances of the morning, reveling in their most trifling details. From that time forward, the fullness of his heart cloistered him yet more in the lonely existence which he had adopted with his grandmother. He was naturally fond of hidden spots, of solitary retirement, where he could give himself up to his thoughts. At this period already he'd eagerly begun to read all the old, odd volumes which he could pick up at broker shops in the Faubourg, and which were destined to lead him to a strange and generous social religion and morality. His reading, ill-digested and lacking all solid foundation, gave him glimpses of the world's vanities and pleasures, especially with regard to women, which would have seriously troubled his mind if his heart had not been contented. When Miette came, he received her at first as a companion, then as the joy and ambition of his life. In the evening, when he had retired to the little nook where he slept and hung his lamp at the head of his strap bedstead, he would find Miette on every page of a dusty old volume which he'd taken at random from a shelf above his head and was reading devoutly. He never came across a young girl, a good and beautiful creature in his reading, without immediately identifying her with his sweetheart. And he would set himself in the narrative as well. If he were reading a love story, it was he who married Miette at the end or died with her. If, on the contrary, he were perusing some political pamphlet, some grave dissertation on social economy, works which he preferred to romances, for he had that singular partiality for difficult subjects which characterizes persons of imperfect scholarship, he still found some means of associating her with the tedious themes which frequently he could not even understand. For instance, he tried to persuade himself that he was learning how to be good and kind to her when they were married. He thus associated her with all his visionary dreamings. Protected by the purity of his affection against the obscenity of certain 18th century tales which fell into his hands, he found particular pleasure in shutting himself up with her in those humanitarian utopias which some great minds of our own time, infatuated by visions of universal happiness, have imagined. Miette, in his mind, became quite essential to the abolition of pauperism and the definitive triumph of the principles of the revolution. There were nights of feverish reading when his mind could not tear itself from his book, which he would lay down and take up at least a score of times, nights of voluptuous weariness which he enjoyed till daybreak like some secret orgy, 
cramped up in that tiny room, his eyes troubled by the flickering yellow light, while he yielded to the fever of insomnia and schemed out new social schemes of the most absurdly ingenuous nature, in which woman, always personified by Miette, was worshipped by the nations on their knees. He was predisposed to utopian ideas by certain hereditary influences. His grandmother's nervous disorders became in him so much chronic enthusiasm, striving after everything that was grandiose and impossible. His lonely childhood, his imperfect education, had developed his natural tendencies in a singular manner. However, he had not yet reached the age when the fixed idea plants itself in a man's mind. In the morning, after he dipped his head in a bucket of water, he remembered his thoughts and visions of the night, but vaguely. Nothing remained of his dreams save a childlike innocence full of trustful confidence and yearning tenderness. He felt like a child again. He ran to the well, solely desirous of meeting his sweetheart's smile and tasting the delights of the radiant morning. And during the day, when thoughts of the future sometimes made him silent and dreamy, he would often, prompted by some sudden impulse, spring up and kiss Auntie Day on both cheeks, whereat the old woman would gaze at him anxiously, perturbed at seeing his eyes so bright and gleaming with a joy which she thought she could divine. At last, as time went on, Miette and Silver began to tire of only seeing each other's reflection. The novelty of their play was gone, and now they began to dream of keener pleasures than the well could afford them. In this longing for reality which came upon them, there was the wish to see each other face to face, to run through the open fields and return out of breath with their arms around each other's waist, clinging closely together in order that they might the better feel each other's love. One morning, Silver spoke of climbing over the wall and walking in the jasse with Miette, but the child implored him not to perpetrate such folly, which would place her at Justin's mercy. He then promised to seek some other means. The wall in which the well was set made a sudden bend a few paces farther on, thereby forming a sort of recess where the lovers would be free from observation if they were to take shelter there. The question was how to reach this recess. Silver could no longer entertain the idea of climbing over, as Mia had appeared so afraid. He secretly thought of another plan. The little door which McCartan and Adelaide had set up one night long years previously had remained forgotten in this remote corner. The owner of the Jasse Mefrin had not even thought of blocking it up. Blackened by damp and green with moss, its lock and hinges eaten away with rust, it looked like a part of the old wall. Doubtless the key was lost, the grass growing beside the lower boards against which slight mounds had formed amply proved that no one had passed that way for many a long year. However, it was the lost key that Silver hoped to find. He knew with what devotion his auntie day allowed the relics of the past to lie rotting wherever they might be. He searched the house for a week without any result, and went stealthily night by night to see if he had at last put his hand on the right key during the daytime. In this way he tried more than thirty keys, which had doubtless come from the old property of the Fouquets, and which he found all over the place, against the walls on the floors, and at the bottom of drawers. He was becoming disheartened when all at once he found the precious key. It was simply tied by a string to the street door latch key, which always remained in the lock. It had hung there for nearly forty years. Auntie Day must every day have touched it with her hand without ever making up her mind to throw it away although it could now only carry her back sorrowfully into the past. When Silver had convinced himself that it really opened the little door, he awaited the ensuing day, dreaming of the joyful surprise which he was preparing for Miette. He had not told her for what he'd been searching. On the morrow, as soon as he heard the girl set her pitcher down, he gently opened the door, 
sweeping away with a push the tall weeds which covered the threshold. Stretching out his head, he saw Miette leaning over the brink of the well, looking into the water, absorbed in expectation. Thereupon, in a couple of strides, he reached the recess formed by the wall and thence called, Miette, Miette, in a soft voice which made her tremble. She raised her head, thinking he was on the coping of the wall. But when she saw him in the jasse, at a few steps from her, she gave a faint cry of surprise and ran up to him. They took each other's hand and looked at one another, delighted to be so near, thinking themselves far handsomer like this in the warm sunshine. It was the middle of August, the Feast of the Assumption. In the distance, the bells were pealing in the limpid atmosphere that so often accompanies great days of festival, an atmosphere full of bright gaiety. Good morning, Silver. Good morning, Miette. The voices in which they exchanged their morning greetings sounded strange to them. They knew only the muffled accents transmitted by the echo of the well and now their voices seemed to them as clear as the notes of a lark. And, ah, how delightful it was in that warm corner, in that holiday atmosphere. They still held each other's hands, Silver leaning against the wall, yet with her figure slightly thrown backwards. They were about to tell each other all the soft things which they had not dared to confide to the reverberations of the well, when Silver, hearing a slight noise, started, and turning pale, dropped Miette's hands. He had just seen Aunt Dide standing before him, erect and motionless on the threshold of the doorway. The grandmother had come to the well by chance, and on perceiving in the old black wall the white gap formed by the doorway which Silver had left wide open, she'd experienced a violent shock. That open gap seemed to her like a gulf of light violently illumining her past, she once more saw herself running to the door amidst the morning brightness and crossing the threshold full of the transports of her nervous love. And Macart was there awaiting her. She hung upon his neck and pressed against his bosom, whilst the rising sun, following her through the doorway, which she left open in her hurry, enveloped them with radiance. It was a sudden vision which roused her cruelly from the slumber of old age, like some supreme chastisement, and awakened a multitude of bitter memories within her. Had the well, had the entire wall disappeared beneath the earth, she would not have been more stupefied. She had never thought that this door would open again. In her mind it had been walled up ever since the hour of McCart's death. And amidst her amazement she felt angry, indignant with the sacrilegious hand that had perpetrated this violation, and left that white open space agape like a yawning tomb. She stepped forward, yielding to a kind of fascination, and halted erect within the framework of the door. Then she gazed out before her with a feeling of dolorous surprise. She had certainly been told that the old enclosure of the Fouquets was now joined to the Jacques Meffrin, but she would never have thought the associations of her youth could have vanished so completely. It seemed as though some tempest had carried off everything that her memory cherished. The old dwelling, the large kitchen garden, the beds of green vegetables, all had disappeared. Not a stone, not a tree of former times remained. And instead of a scene amidst which she had grown up, and which in her mind's eye she had seen but yesterday, there lay a strip of barren soil, a broad patch of stubbles, bare like a desert. Henceforward, when, on closing her eyes, she might try to recall the objects of the past, that stubble would always appear to her like a shroud of yellowish drugget spread over the soil in which her youth lay buried. In the presence of that unfamiliar, commonplace scene, her heart died, as it were, a second time. Now all was completely, finally ended. She was robbed even of her dreams of the past. Then she began to regret that she'd yielded to the attraction of that white opening, of that doorway gaping upon the days which were now forever lost. 
She was about to retire and close the accursed door without even seeking to discover who had opened it when she suddenly perceived Miette and Silver, and the sight of the two young lovers who, with hanging heads, nervously awaited her glance, kept her on the threshold, quivering with yet keener pain. She now understood all. To the very end, she was destined to picture herself there, clasped in McCart's arms in the bright sunshine. Yet a second time had the door served as an accomplice. Where love had once passed, there was it passing again. T'was the eternal and endless renewal with present joys and future tears. Auntie Day could only see the tears, and a sudden presentiment showed her the two children bleeding with stricken hearts. Overwhelmed by the recollection of her life's sorrow, which this spot had just awakened within her, she grieved for her dear Silver. She alone was guilty. If she'd not formerly had that door made, Silver would not now be at a girl's feet in that lonely nook, intoxicating himself with a bliss which prompts and angers the jealousy of death. After a brief pause, she went up to the young man and, without a word, took him by the hand. She might perhaps have left them there, chattering under the wall, had she not felt that she herself was to some extent an accomplice in this fatal love. As she came back with Sylvere, she turned on hearing the light footfall of Miette, who, having quickly taken up her pitcher, was hastening across the stubble. She was running wildly, glad at having escaped so easily, and Auntie Day smiled involuntarily as she watched her bound over the ground like a runaway goat. "'She's very young,' she murmured. "'She has plenty of time.' She meant, no doubt, that Miette had plenty of time before her to suffer and weep. Then, turning her eyes upon Silver, who with a glance of ecstasy had followed the child as she ran off in the bright sunshine, she simply added, "'Take care, my boy. This sort of thing sometimes kills one.' These were the only words she spoke with reference to the incident which had awakened all the sorrows that lay slumbering in the depths of her being." Silence had become a real religion with her. When Silvera came in, she double-locked the door and threw the key down the well. In this wise, she felt certain that the door would no longer make her an accomplice. She examined it for a moment, glad at seeing it reassume its usual gloomy, barrier-like aspect. The tomb was closed once more. The white gap was forever boarded up with that damp-stained, mossy timber over which the snails had shed silvery tears. In the evening, Auntie Day had another of those nervous attacks which came upon her at intervals. At these times she would often talk aloud and ramble incoherently, as though she was suffering from nightmare. That evening, while Silver held her down on her bed, he heard her stammer in a panting voice, such words as custom house officer, fire, and murder. And she struggled and begged for mercy and dreamed aloud of vengeance. At last, as always happened when the attack was drawing to a close, she fell into a strange fright, her teeth chattering while her limbs quivered with abject terror. Finally, after raising herself into a sitting posture, she cast a haggard look of astonishment at one and another corner of the room, and then fell back upon the pillow, heaving deep sighs. She was doubtless a prey to some hallucination. However, she drew Silver to her bosom, and seemed to some degree to recognize him, though ever and anon she confused him with someone else. "'There they are,' she stammered. "'Do you see?' They're going to take you. They'll kill you again. I don't want them to. Send them away. Tell them I won't. Tell them they're hurting me, staring at me like that. Then she turned to the wall to avoid seeing the people of whom she was talking. And after an interval of silence, she continued, You are near me, my child, aren't you? You must not leave me. I thought I was going to die just now. We did wrong to make an opening in the wall. I have suffered ever since. 
I was certain that door would bring us further misfortune. Oh, the innocent darlings, what sorrow! They will kill them as well. They will be shot down like dogs. Then she relapsed into catalepsy. She was no longer even aware of Silver's presence. Suddenly, however, she sat up and gazed at the foot of her bed with a fearful expression of terror. Why didn't you send them away? she cried, hiding her white head against the young man's breast. They are still there. The one with the gun is making signs that he's going to fire. Shortly afterwards, she fell into the heavy slumber that usually terminated these attacks. On the next day, she seemed to have forgotten everything. She never again spoke to Silver of the morning on which she'd found him with a sweetheart behind the wall. The young people did not see each other for a couple of days. When Miette ventured to return to the well, they resolved not to recommence the pranks which had upset Auntie Day. However, the meeting which had been so strangely interrupted had filled them with a keen desire to meet again in some happy solitude. Weary of the delights afforded by the well, and unwilling to vex Aunt Day by seeing Miette again on the other side of the wall, Silver begged the girl to meet him somewhere else. She required but little pressing. She received the proposal with the willing smile of a frolicsome lass who has no thought of evil. What made her smile was the idea of outwitting that spy of a Justin. When the lovers had come to agreement, they discussed at length the choice of a favorable spot. So there proposed the most impossible trysting places. He planned regular journeys and even suggested meeting the young girl at midnight in the barns of the Jachemefrain. Miette, who was much more practical, shrugged her shoulders, declaring she would try to think of some spot. On the morrow, she tarried but a minute at the well, just time enough to smile at Sylvere and tell him to be at the far end of the Air saint mitre at about ten o'clock in the evening. One may be sure that the young man was punctual. All day long Miette's choice had puzzled him, and his curiosity increased when he found himself in the narrow lane formed by the piles of planks at the end of the plot of ground. "'She will come this way,' he said to himself, looking along the road to Nice." but he suddenly heard a loud shaking of boughs behind the wall and saw a laughing head with tumbled hair appear above the coping whilst a joyous voice crawled out, It's me! And it was, in fact, Miette, who had climbed like an urchin up one of the mulberry trees, which even nowadays still border the boundary of the Jasmefrain. In a couple of leaps, she reached the tombstone half buried in the corner at the end of a lane. Silver watched her descend with delight and surprise, without even thinking of helping her. As soon as she had alighted, however, he took both her hands in his and said, How nimble you are! You climb better than I do! It was thus that they met for the first time in that hidden corner where they were destined to pass such happy hours. From that evening forward they saw each other there nearly every night, they now only used the well to warn each other of unforeseen obstacles to their meetings, of a change of time, and of all the trifling little news that seemed important in their eyes and allowed of no delay. It sufficed for the one who had a communication to make to set the pulley in motion, for its creaking noise could be heard a long way off. But although on certain days they summoned one another two or three times in succession to speak of trifles of immense importance, it was only in the evening, in that lonely little passage, that they tasted real happiness. Miette was exceptionally punctual. She fortunately slept over the kitchen, in a room where the winter provisions had been kept before her arrival, and which was reached by a little private staircase. She was thus able to go out at all hours, without being seen by Rebuffat or Justin. Moreover, if the latter should ever see her returning, she intended to tell him some tale or other, staring at him the while with that stern look which always reduced him to silence. Ah, how happy those warm evenings were! 
The lovers had now reached the first days of September, a month of bright sunshine in Provence. It was hardly possible for them to join each other before nine o'clock. Miette arrived from over the wall, in surmounting which she soon acquired such dexterity that she was almost always on the old tombstone before Silver had time to stretch out his arms. She would laugh at her own strength and agility, as, for a moment, with her hair in disorder, she remained almost breathless, tapping her skirt to make it fall. Her sweetheart laughingly called her an impudent urchin. In reality, he much admired her pluck. He watched her jump over the wall with the complacency of an older brother supervising the exercises of a younger one. Indeed, there was yet much that was childlike in their growing love. On several occasions they spoke of going on some bird's nesting expedition on the banks of the Viorne. "'You'll see how I can climb,' said Miette proudly. "'When I lived at Chavanot, I used to go right up to the top of old Andre's walnut trees. "'Have you ever taken a magpie's nest? It's very difficult.' Then a discussion arose as to how one ought to climb a poplar. Miette stated her opinions with all a boy's confidence. However, Silver, clasping her round the knees, had by this time lifted her to the ground, and then they would walk on side by side, their arms encircling each other's waist. Though they were but children, fond of frolicsome play and chatter, and knew not even how to speak of love, yet they already partook of love's delight. It sufficed them to press each other's hands, Ignorant whither their feelings and their hearts were drifting, they did not seek to hide the blissful thrills which the slightest touch awoke. Smiling, often wondering at the delight they experienced, they yielded unconsciously to the sweetness of new feelings, even while talking, like a couple of schoolboys, of the magpies' nests which are so difficult to reach. And as they talked, they went down the silent path between the piles of planks and the wall of the Jachemefrain. They never went beyond the end of that narrow blind alley, but invariably retraced their steps. They were quite at home there. Miette, happy in the knowledge of their safe concealment, would often pause and congratulate herself on her discovery. "'Wasn't I lucky?' she would gleefully exclaim. We might walk a long way without finding such a good hiding place. The thick grass muffled the noise of their footsteps. They were steeped in gloom, shut in between two black walls, and only a strip of dark sky spangled with stars was visible above their heads. And as they stepped along, pacing this path which resembled a dark stream flowing beneath the black star sprent sky, they were often thrilled with undefinable emotion and lowered their voices, although there was nobody to hear them, surrendering themselves, as it were, to the silent waves of night over which they seemed to drift. They recounted to one another with lover's rapture the thousand trifles of the day. At other times, on bright nights, when the moonlight clearly outlined the wall and the timber stacks, Miette and Silver would romp about with all the carelessness of children. The path stretched out, alight with white rays and retaining no suggestion of secrecy, and the young people laughed and chased each other like boys at play, at times venturing even to climb upon the piles of timber. Silver was occasionally obliged to frighten Miette by telling her that Justin might be watching her from over the wall. Then... Quite out of breath, they would stroll side by side and plan how they might some day go for a scamper in the St. Clair meadows to see which of the two would catch the other. Their growing love thus accommodated itself to dark and clear nights. Their hearts were ever on the alert and a little shade sufficed to sweeten the pleasure of their embrace and soften their laughter. This dearly loved retreat so gay in the moonshine, so strangely thrilling in the gloom, seemed an inexhaustible source of both gaiety and silent emotion. They would remain there until midnight, while the town dropped off to sleep, and the lights in the windows of the Faubourg went out, one by one. They were never disturbed in their solitude. 
At that late hour, children were no longer playing at hide-and-seek behind the piles of planks. Occasionally, when the young couple heard sounds in the distance, the singing of some workmen as they passed along the road, or conversation coming from the neighboring sidewalks, they would cast stealthy glances over the Ars Saint-Mitre. The timber yard stretched out, empty of all, save here and there some falling shadows. On warm evenings they sometimes caught glimpses of loving couples there, and of old men sitting on the big beams by the roadside. When the evenings grew colder, all that they ever saw on the melancholy, deserted spot was some gypsy fire, before which, perhaps, a few black shadows passed to and fro. Through the still night air, words and sundry faint sounds were wafted to them, the good night of a townsman shutting his door, the closing of a window shutter, the deep striking of a clock, all the parting sounds of a provincial town retiring to rest. And when Plasson was slumbering, they might still hear the quarreling of the gypsies and the crackling of their fires, amidst which suddenly rose the guttural voices of girls singing in a strange tongue, full of rugged accents. But the lovers did not concern themselves much with what went on in the Ars Saint-Mitre. They hastened back into their own little privacy and again walked along their favorite retired path. Little did they care for others, or for the town itself. The few planks which separated them from the wicked world seemed to them, after a while, an insurmountable rampart. They were so secluded, so free in this nook, situated though it was in the very midst of the Faubourg, at only fifty paces from the Rome gate, that they sometimes fancied themselves far away in some hollow of the Viorne with the open country around them. Of all the sounds which reached them, only one made them feel uneasy, that of the clock striking slowly in the darkness. At times when the hour sounded, they pretended not to hear. At other moments they stopped short as if to protest. However, they could not go on forever, taking just another ten minutes, and so the time came when they were at last obliged to say good night. Then Miette reluctantly climbed upon the wall again. But all was not ended yet. They would linger over their leave-taking for a good quarter of an hour. When the girl had climbed upon the wall, she remained there with her elbows on the coping and her feet supported by the branches of the mulberry tree, which served her as a ladder. Silver, perched on the tombstone, was able to take her hands again and renew their whispered conversation. They repeated, till tomorrow, a dozen times, and still and ever found something more to say. At last, Silver began to scold. Come, you must get down. It's past midnight. But Miette, with the girl's waywardness, wished him to descend first. She wanted to see him go away. And as he persisted in remaining, she ended by saying abruptly, by way of punishment, perhaps, Look, I'm going to jump down. Then she sprang from the mulberry tree to the great consternation of Silver. He heard the dull thought of her fall and the burst of laughter with which she ran off without choosing to reply to his last to do. For some minutes he would remain watching her vague figure as it disappeared in the darkness. Then, slowly descending, he regained the impasse Saint-Mitre. During two years they came to the path every day. At the time of their first meetings they enjoyed some beautiful warm nights. They might almost have fancied themselves in the month of May, the month of seething sap, when a pleasant odor of earth and fresh leaves pervades the warm air. This renouveau, this second spring, was like a gift from heaven which allowed them to run freely about the path and tighten their bonds of affection. At last came rain and snow and frost. But the disagreeableness of winter did not keep them away. Miette put on her long brown pelisse, and they both made light of the bad weather. 
When the nights were dry and clear and puffs of wind raised the hoar frost beneath their footsteps and fell on their faces like taps from a switch, they refrained from sitting down. They walked quickly to and fro, wrapped in the police, their cheeks blue with cold and their eyes watering, and they laughed heartily, quite quivering with mirth at the rapidity of their march through the freezing atmosphere. One snowy evening they amused themselves with making an enormous snowball which they rolled into a corner. It remained there fully a month, which caused them fresh astonishment each time they met in the path. Nor did the rain frighten them. They came to see each other through the heaviest downpours, though they got wet to the skin in doing so. Silver would hasten to the spot, saying to himself that Miette would never be mad enough to come. And when Miette arrived, he could not find it in his heart to scold her. In reality, he'd been expecting her. At last he sought some shelter against the inclement weather, knowing quite well that they would certainly come out, however much they might promise one another not to do so when it rained. To find a shelter, he only had to disturb one of the timber stacks, pulling out several pieces of wood and arranging them so that they would move easily, in such wise that he could displace and replace them at pleasure. From that time forward, the lovers possessed a sort of low and narrow sentry box, a square hole which was only big enough to hold them closely squeezed together on a beam which they'd left at the bottom of the little cell. Whenever it rained, the first to arrive would take shelter here, and on finding themselves together again, they would listen with delight to the rain beating on the piles of planks. Before and around them, through the inky blackness of the night, came a rush of water which they could not see, but which resounded continuously like the roar of a mob. They were nevertheless quite alone, as though they'd been at the end of the world or beneath the sea. They never felt so happy, so isolated, as when they found themselves in that timber stack, in the midst of some such deluge which threatened to carry them away at every moment. Their bent knees almost reached the opening, and though they thrust themselves back as far as possible, the spray of the rain bathed their cheeks and hands. The big drops, falling from the planks, splashed at regular intervals at their feet. The brown police kept them warm, and the nook was so small that Miette was compelled to sit almost on Silver's knees. And they would chatter and then lapse into silence, overcome with languor, lulled by the warmth of their embrace and the monotonous beating of the shower. For hours and hours they remained there, with that same enjoyment of the rain which prompts little children to stroll along solemnly in stormy weather with open umbrellas in their hands. After a while they came to prefer the rainy evenings, though their parting became more painful on those occasions. Miette was obliged to climb the wall in the driving rain and cross the puddles of the Jachemefrain in perfect darkness. As soon as she had left his arms, she was lost to Silver amidst the gloom and the noise of the falling water. In vain he listened. He was deafened, blinded. However, the anxiety caused by this brusque separation proved an additional charm, and until the morrow each would be uneasy lest anything should have befallen the other in such weather, when one would not even have turned a dog out of doors. Perchance one of them had slipped or lost the way. Such were the mutual fears which possessed them, and rendered their next interval yet more loving. At last the fine days returned. April brought mild nights, and the grass in the green alley sprouted up wildly. Amidst the stream of life flowing from heaven and rising from the earth, amidst all the intoxication of the budding springtime, the lovers sometimes regretted their winter solitude, the rainy evenings and the freezing nights, during which they had been so isolated so far from all human sounds. At present the days did not draw to a close soon enough, and they grew impatient with the lagging twilights. When the night had fallen sufficiently for Miette to climb upon the wall without danger of being seen, and they could at last glide along their dear path, 
they no longer found there the solitude congenial to their shy, childish love. People began to flock to the ass San Mitre. The urchins of the Faubourg remained there, romping about the beams and shouting till eleven o'clock at night. It even happened occasionally that one of them would go and hide behind the piles of timber and assail Miette and Sylvia with boyish jeers. The fear of being surprised amidst that general awakening of life as the season gradually grew warmer tinged their meetings with anxiety. Then, too, they began to stifle in the narrow lane. Never had it throbbed with so ardent a quiver. Never had that soil in which the last bones left of the former cemetery lay moldering sent forth such oppressive and disturbing odors. They were still too young to relish the voluptuous charm of that secluded nook which the springtide filled with fever. The grass grew to their knees. They moved to and fro with difficulty, and certain plants, when they crushed their young shoots, sent forth a pungent odor which made them dizzy. Then, seized with strange drowsiness and staggering with giddiness, their feet as though entangled in the grass, they would lean against the wall with half-closed eyes, unable to move a step. All the soft languor from the skies seemed to penetrate them. With the petulance of beginners, impatient and irritated at this sudden faintness, they began to think their retreat too confined and decided to ramble through the open fields. Every evening came fresh frolics. Miette arrived with her police. They wrapped themselves in it, and then, gliding past the walls, reached the high road and the open country, the broad fields where the wind rolled with full strength, like the waves at high tide. And here they no longer felt stifled. They recovered all their youthfulness, free from the giddy intoxication born of the tall, rank weeds of the Ars saint mitre During two summers they rambled through the district. Every rock ledge, every bed of turf soon knew them. There was not a cluster of trees, a hedge, or a bush which did not become their friend. They realized their dreams. They chased each other wildly over the meadows of St. Clair, and Miette ran so well that Silver had to put his best foot forward to catch her. Sometimes, too, they went in search of magpies' nests. Headstrong Miette, wishing to show how she'd climb trees at Chavanon, would tie up her skirts with a piece of string and ascend the highest poplars, while Severo stood trembling beneath, with his arms outstretched to catch her should she slip. These frolics so turned them from thoughts of love that one evening they almost fought like a couple of lads coming out of school. But there were nooks in the countryside which were not healthful for them. So long as they rambled on, they were continually shouting with laughter, pushing and teasing one another. They covered miles and miles of ground. Sometimes they went as far as the chain of the Garrigue, following the narrowest paths and cutting across the fields. The region belonged to them. They lived there as in a conquered territory, enjoying all that the earth and the sky could give them. Miette, with a woman's lack of scruple, did not hesitate to pluck a bunch of grapes or a cluster of green almonds, from the vines and almond trees whose boughs brushed her as she passed. And at this, Silver, with his absolute ideas of honesty, felt vexed, although he did not venture to find fault with the girl, whose occasional sulking distressed him. Oh, the bad girl, thought he, childishly exaggerating the matter. She'd make a thief of me. But Miette would thereupon force his share of the stolen fruit into his mouth. The artifices he employed, such as holding her round the waist, avoiding the fruit trees, and making her run after him when they were near the vines, so as to keep her out of the way of temptation, quickly exhausted his imagination. At last there was nothing to do but to make her sit down. And then they again began to experience their former stifling sensations. The gloomy valley of the Viorn particularly disturbed them, when weariness brought them to the banks of a torrent, all their childish gaiety seemed to disappear. A gray shadow floated under the willows, like the scented crepe of a woman's dress. The children felt this crepe descend warm and balmy from the voluptuous shoulders of the night, 
kiss their temples and envelop them with irresistible languor. In the distance, the crickets chirped in the meadows of St. Clair, and at their feet, the ripples of the Viorn sounded like lovers' whispers, like the soft cooing of humid lips. The stars cast a rain of sparkles from the slumbering heavens, and amidst the throbbing of the sky, the waters and the darkness, the children reposing on the grass sought each other's hands and pressed them. Silver, who vaguely understood the danger of these ecstasies, would sometimes jump up and propose to cross over to one of the islets left by the low water in the middle of the stream. Both ventured forth with bare feet. Miette made light of the pebbles, refusing Silver's help. And it once happened that she sat down in the very middle of the stream. However, there were only a few inches of water, and she escaped with nothing worse than a wet petticoat. Then, having reached the island, they threw themselves on the long neck of sand, their eyes on a level with the surface of the river, whose silvery scales they saw quivering far away in the clear night. Then Miette would declare that they were in a boat, that the island was certainly floating, she could feel it carrying her along. The dizziness caused by the rippling of the water amused them for a moment, and they lingered there, singing in an undertone, like boatmen as they strike the water with their oars. At other times, when the island had a low bank, they sat there as on a bed of verdure, and let their bare feet dangle in the stream. And then, for hours, they chatted together, swinging their legs and splashing the water, delighted to set a tempest raging in the peaceful pool whose freshness cooled their fever. These footbaths suggested a dangerous idea to Miette. Nothing would satisfy her but a complete bath. A little above the bridge over the Viorne, there was a very convenient spot, she said, barely three or four feet deep and quite safe. The weather was so warm, it would be so nice to have the water up to their necks. Besides which, she'd been dying to learn to swim for such a long time, and Sylvia would be able to teach her. Sylvia raised objections. It was not prudent at night time. They might be seen. Perhaps, too, they might catch cold. However, nothing could turn Miette from her purpose. One evening she came with a bathing costume which she'd made out of an old dress, and Sylvia was then obliged to go back to Auntie Day's for his bathing drawers. Their proceedings were characterized by great simplicity. Miette disrobed herself beneath the shade of a stout willow, and when both were ready, enveloped in the blackness which fell from the foliage around them, they gaily entered the cool water, oblivious of all previous scruples, and knowing in their innocence no sense of shame. They remained in the river quite an hour, splashing and throwing water into each other's faces, yet now getting cross, now breaking out into laughter, while Silvera gave her her first lesson, dipping her head under every now and again so as to accustom her to the water. As long as he held her up, she threw her arms and legs about violently, thinking she was swimming, but directly he let her go, she cried and struggled, striking the water with her outstretched hands, clutching at anything she could get hold of, the young man's waist or one of his wrists. She leant against him for an instant, resting, out of breath and dripping with water, and then she cried, once more, but you do it on purpose. You don't hold me. At the end of a fortnight, the girl was able to swim. With her limbs moving freely, rocked by the stream, playing with it, she yielded form and spirit alike to its soft motion, to the silence of the heavens and the dreaminess of the melancholy banks. As she and Sevier swam noiselessly along, she seemed to see the foliage of both banks thicken and hang over them, draping them round as with a huge curtain. When the moon shone, its rays glided between the trunks of the trees, and phantoms seemed to flit along the riverside in white robes. Miette felt no nervousness, however, only an indefinable emotion as she followed the play of the shadows. As she went onward with slower motion, the calm water, which the moon converted into a bright mirror, rippled at her approach like a silver-broidered cloth. Eddies widened and lost themselves amid the shadows of the banks, 
under the hanging willow branches whence issued weird, plashing sounds. At every stroke she perceived recesses full of sound, dark cavities which she hastened to pass by, clusters and rows of trees whose somber masses were continually changing form, stretching forward and apparently following her from the summit of the bank. And when she threw herself on her back, the depths of the heavens affected her still more. From the fields, from the distant horizon which she could no longer see, a solemn lingering strain composed of all the sighs of the night was wafted to her. She was not of a dreamy nature. It was physically, through the medium of each of her senses, that she derived enjoyment from the sky, the river, and the play of light and shadow. The river in particular bore her along with endless caresses. When she swam against the current, she was delighted to feel the stream flow rapidly against her bosom and limbs. She dipped herself in yet more deeply, with the water reaching to her lips so that it might pass over her shoulders and envelop her from chin to feet with flying kisses. Then she would float, languid and quiescent on the surface, whilst the ripples glided softly between her costume and her skin. And she would also roll over in the still pools like a cat on a carpet and swim from the luminous patches where the moonbeams were bathing to the dark water shaded by the foliage, shivering the while as though she had quitted a sunny plain and then felt the cold from the boughs falling on her neck. She now remained quite silent in the water and would not allow Sylvia to touch her. Gliding softly by his side, she swam on with the light rustling of a bird flying across the copse, or else she would circle round him, a prey to vague disquietude which she did not comprehend. He himself darted quickly away if he happened to brush against her. The river was now but a source of enervating intoxication, voluptuous languor, which disturbed them strangely. When they emerged from their bath, they felt dizzy, weary and drowsy. Fortunately, the girl declared one evening that she would bathe no more, and the cold water made the blood run to her head. And it was in all truth and innocence that she said this. Then their long conversations began anew. The dangers to which the innocence of their love had lately been exposed had left no other trace in Silver's mind than great admiration for Miette's physical strength. She had learned to swim in a fortnight, and often, when they raced together, he'd seen her stem the current with a stroke as rapid as his own. He, who delighted in strength and bodily exercises, felt a thrill of pleasure at seeing her so strong, so active and adroit. He entertained at heart a singular admiration for her stout arms. One evening, after one of the first baths that had left them so playful, they caught each other round the waist on a strip of sand, and wrestled for several minutes without Silver being able to throw me at. At last, indeed, it was the young man who lost his balance, while the girl remained standing. Her sweetheart treated her like a boy, and it was those long rambles of theirs, those wild races across the meadows, those bird's nests filched from the tree crests, those struggles and violent games of one and another kind that so long shielded them and their love from all impurity. Then, too, apart from his youthful admiration for his sweetheart's dashing pluck, Silver felt for her all the compassionate tenderness of a heart that ever softened towards the unfortunate. He, who could never see any forsaken creature, a poor man or a child, walking barefooted along the dusty roads without a throb of pity, loved Miette because nobody else loved her, because she virtually led an outcast's hard life. When he saw her smile, he was deeply moved by the joy he brought her. Moreover, the child was a wilding like himself, and they were of the same mind in hating all the gossips of the Faubourg, the dreams in which Silver indulged in the daytime while he plied his heavy hammer round the cartwheels in his master's shop were full of generous enthusiasm. He fancied himself Miet's redeemer. All his reading rushed to his head. He meant to marry his sweetheart some day, in order to raise her in the eyes of the world. It was like a holy mission that he imposed upon himself, that of redeeming and saving the convict's daughter. 
and his head was so full of certain theories and arguments that he did not tell himself these things in simple fashion, but became lost in perfect social mysticism, imagining rehabilitation in the form of an apotheosis in which he pictured Miette seated on a throne at the end of the course au vert, while the whole town prostrated itself before her, entreating her pardon and singing her praises. Happily, he forgot all these fine things as soon as Miette jumped over the wall and said to him on the high road, Let's have a race. I'm sure you won't catch me. However, if the young man dreamt like this of the glorification of his sweetheart, he also showed such passion for justice that he often made her weep on speaking to her about her father. In spite of the softening effect which Silver's friendship had had upon her, she still at times gave way to angry outbreaks of temper when all the stubbornness and rebellion latent in her nature stiffened her with scowling eyes and tightly drawn lips. She would then contend that her father had done quite right to kill the gendarme, that the earth belongs to everybody and that one has the right to fire a gun when and where one likes. Thereupon Silver, in a grave voice, explained the law to her as he understood it, with strange commentaries which would have startled the whole magistracy of Plassans. These discussions took place most often in some remote corner of the St. Clair Meadows. The grassy carpet of a dusky green hue stretched further than they could see, undoubted even by a single tree, and the sky seemed colossal, spangling the bare horizon with the stars. It seemed to the young couple as if they were being rocked on a sea of verdure. Miette argued the point obstinately. She asked Silver if her father should have let the gendarme kill him. And Silver, after a momentary silence, replied that, in such a case, it was better to be the victim than the murderer, and that it was a great misfortune for anyone to kill a fellow man, even in legitimate defense. The law was something holy to him and the judges had done right in sending Chantegray to the galleys. At this the girl grew angry and almost struck her sweetheart, crying out that he was as heartless as the rest. And as he still firmly defended his ideas of justice, she finished by bursting into sobs and stammering that he was doubtless ashamed of her, since he was always reminding her of her father's crime. These discussions ended in tears, in mutual emotion, but although the child cried and acknowledged that she was perhaps wrong, she still retained deep within her a wild, resentful temper. She once related, with hearty laughter, that she had seen a gendarme fall off his horse and break his leg. Apart from this, Miette only lived for Silver. When he asked her about her uncle and cousin, she replied that she did not know, and if he pressed her, fearing that they were making her too unhappy at the Jasmefrain, she simply answered that she worked hard and that nothing had changed. She believed, however, that Justin had at last found out what made her sing in the morning and filled her eyes with delight. But she added, What does it matter? If ever he comes to disturb us, we'll receive him in such a way that he won't be in a hurry to meddle with our affairs any more. Now and again, the open country... Their long rambles in the fresh air wearied them somewhat. They then invariably returned to the Air saint mitre to the narrow lane whence they had been driven by the noisy summer evenings, the pungent scent of the trodden grass, all the warm, oppressive emanations. On certain nights, however, the path proved cooler, and the winds freshened it so they could remain there without feeling faint. They then enjoyed a feeling of delightful repose. Seated on the tombstone, deaf to the noise of the children and gypsies, they felt at home again. Silver had on various occasions picked up fragments of bones, even pieces of skulls, and they were fond of speaking of the ancient burial ground. It seemed to them in their lively fancies that their love had shot up like some vigorous plant in this nook of soil which dead men's bones had fertilized. It had grown indeed like those wild weeds. It had blossomed as blossom the poppies which sway like bare, bleeding hearts at the slightest breeze. And they ended by fancying that the warm breaths passing over them, the whisperings heard in the gloom, 
The long quivering which thrilled the path came from the dead folk sighing their departed passions in their face, telling them the stories of their bridals as they turned restlessly in their graves, full of a fierce longing to live and love again. Those fragments of bone, they felt convinced of it, were full of affection for them. The shattered skulls grew warm again by contact with their own youthful fire. The smallest particle surrounded them with passionate whispering, anxious solicitude, throbbing jealousy. And when they departed, the old burial ground seemed to groan. Those weeds in which their entangled feet often stumbled on sultry nights were fingers tapered by tomb life that sprang up from the earth to detain them and cast them into each other's arms. That pungent and penetrating odor exhaled by the broken stems was the fertilizing perfume, the mighty quintessence of life which is slowly elaborated in the grave and intoxicates the lovers who wander in the solitude of the paths. The dead, the old departed dead, longed for the bridal of Miette and Silver. They were never afraid. The sympathy which seemed to hover around them thrilled them and made them love the invisible beings whose soft touch they often imagined they could feel, like a gentle flapping of wings. Sometimes they were saddened by sweet melancholy and could not understand what the dead desired of them. They went on basking in their innocent love amidst this flood of sap, this abandoned cemetery, whose rich soil teemed with life and imperiously demanded their union. They still remained ignorant of the meaning of the buzzing voices which they heard ringing in their ears. The sudden glow which sent the blood flying to their faces. This ends Chapter 5, Part 2. Section 12 of The Fortune of the Rougeon Book One of Rougeon Maca Cycle by Emile Zola, translated by Henry Vizitelli. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Mark Leader. Chapter Five, Part Three. They often questioned each other about the remains which they discovered. Miette, after a woman's fashion, was partial to lugubrious subjects. At each new discovery, she launched into endless suppositions. If the bone was small, she spoke of some beautiful girl a prey to consumption or carried off by fever on the eve of her marriage. If the bone were large, she pictured some big old man, a soldier or a judge, someone who had inspired others with terror. For a long time, the tombstone particularly engaged their attention. One fine moonlight night, Miette distinguished some half-obliterated letters on one side of it, and thereupon she made Silver scrape the moss away with his knife. Then they read the mutilated inscription, Here lieth Marie died. And Miette, finding her own name on the stone, was quite terror-stricken. Silver called her a big baby, but she could not restrain her tears. She had received a stab in the heart, she said. She would soon die, and that stone was meant for her. The young man himself felt alarmed. However, he succeeded in shaming the child out of these thoughts. What? She's so courageous to dream about such trifles. They ended by laughing. Then they avoided speaking of it again. But in melancholy moments, when the cloudy sky saddened the pathway, Miette could not help thinking of that dead one, that unknown Marie, whose tomb had so long facilitated their meetings. The poor girl's bones were perhaps still lying there. And at this thought, Miette one evening had a strange whim, and asked Silver to turn the stone over to see what might be under it. He refused as though it were sacrilege, and his refusal strengthened Miette's fancies with regard to the dear phantom which bore her name. She positively insisted that the girl had died young, as she was, and in the very midst of her love. She even began to pity the stone, that stone which she climbed so nimbly, and on which they had sat so often, a stone which death had chilled, and which their love had warmed again. 
You'll see, this tombstone will bring us misfortune, she added. If you were to die, I should come and lie here, and then I should like to have this stone set over my body. At this, Silver, choking with emotion, scolded her for thinking of such mournful things. And so, for nearly two years, their love grew alike in the narrow pathway and the open country. Their idyll passed through the chilling rains of December and the burning solicitations of July, free from all touch of impurity, ever retaining the sweet charm of some old Greek love tale, all the naive hesitancy of youth which desires but knows not. In vain did the long-departed dead whisper in their ears. They carried nothing away from the old cemetery but emotional melancholy and a vague presentiment of a short life. A voice seemed to whisper to them that they would depart amidst their virginal love, long ere the bridal day would give them wholly to each other. It was there, on the tombstone and among the bones that lay hidden beneath the rank grass, that they'd first come to indulge in that longing for death, that eager desire to sleep together in the earth, that now set them stammering and sighing beside the Osher road on that December night while the two bells repeated their mournful warnings to one another. Miette was sleeping calmly, with her head resting on Silver's chest, while he mused upon their past meeting, their lovely years of unbroken happiness. At daybreak, the girl awoke. The valley now spread out clearly under the bright sky. The sun was still behind the hills, but a stream of crystal light, limpid and cold as spring water, flowed from the pale horizon. In the distance, the Viorne, like a white satin ribbon, disappeared among an expanse of red and yellow land. It was a boundless vista with gray seas of olive trees and vineyards that looked like huge pieces of striped cloth. The whole country was magnified by the clearness of the atmosphere and the peaceful cold. However, sharp gusts of wind chilled the young people's faces and thereupon they sprang to their feet, cheered by the sight of the clear morning. Their melancholy forebodings had vanished with the darkness, and they gazed with delight at the immense expanse of the plain, and listened to the tolling of the two bells that now seemed to be joyfully ringing in a holiday. "'Ah, I've had a good sleep,' Miette cried. "'I dreamt you were kissing me. "'Tell me now, did you kiss me?' It's very possible, Sylvain replied, laughing. I was not very warm. It's bitterly cold. I only feel cold in the feet, Miette rejoined. Well, let us have a run, said Sylvain. We have still two good leagues to go. You will get warm. Thereupon they descended the hill and ran until they reached the high road. When they were below, they raised their heads as if to say farewell to that rock on which they had wept while their kisses burned their lips. But they did not again speak of that ardent embrace which had thrilled them so strongly with vague, unknown desire. Under the pretext of walking more quickly, we did not even take each other's arm. They experienced some slight confusion when they looked at one another, though why they could not tell. Meantime, the dawn was rising around them. The young man, who had sometimes been sent to or share by his master, knew all the shortest cuts. Thus they walked on for more than two leagues, along dingle paths by the side of interminable ledges and walls. Now and again Miette accused Silvere of having taken her the wrong way, for at times, for a quarter of an hour at a stretch, they lost all sight of the surrounding country, seeing above the walls and hedges nothing but long rows of almond trees whose slender branches showed sharply against the pale sky. All at once, however, they came out just in front of Orcher. Loud cries of joy, the shouting of a crowd, sounded clearly in the limpid air. The insurrectionary forces were only now entering the town. Miette and Silver went in with the stragglers. Never had they seen such enthusiasm. To judge from the streets, one would have thought it was a procession day, when the windows are decked with the finest drapery to honor the passage of the canopy. The townsfolk welcomed the insurgents as though they were deliverers. The men embraced them while the women brought them food. 
Old men were to be seen weeping at the doors. And the joyousness was of an essentially southern character, pouring forth in clamorous fashion, in singing, dancing, in gesticulation. As Miette passed along, she was carried away by a farandole. Footnote. The farandole is the popular dance of Provence, which spread whirling all round the grand place. Silver followed her. His thoughts of death and his discouragement were now far away. He wanted to fight, to sell his life dearly at least. The idea of a struggle intoxicated him afresh. He dreamed of victory to be followed by a happy life with Miette amidst the peacefulness of the Universal Republic. The fraternal reception accorded them by the inhabitants of Orchere proved to be the insurgents' last delight. They spent the day amidst radiant confidence and boundless hope. The prisoners, Commander Sicardot, Monsieur Garçonnet, Perrot, and the others, who'd been shut up in one of the rooms at the mayor's, the windows of which overlooked the Grand Place, watched the farandoles and wild outbursts of enthusiasm with surprise and dismay. The villains, muttered the commander, leaning upon a window bar, as though bending over the velvet-covered handrest of a box at a theater, to think that there isn't a battery or two to make a clean sweep of all that rabble. Then he perceived Miette, and addressing himself to Monsieur Garçonnet, he added, Do you see, sir, that big girl in red over yonder? How disgraceful! They've even brought their mistresses with them. If this continues much longer, we shall see some fine goings-on. Monsieur Garcinet shook his head, saying something about unbridled passions and the most evil days of history. Monsieur Perrault, as white as the sheet, remained silent. He only opened his lips once to say to Sicardot, who was still bitterly railing, Not so loud, sir, not so loud, you'll get us all massacred. As a matter of fact, the insurgents treated the gentlemen with the greatest kindness. They even provided them with an excellent dinner in the evening. Such attentions, however, were terrifying to such a Quaker as the receiver of taxes. The insurgents, he thought, would not treat them so well unless they wished to make them fat and tender for the day when they might wish to devour them. At dusk that day, Silver came face to face with his cousin, Dr. Pascal. The latter had followed the band on foot, chatting with the workmen who held him in the greatest respect. At first he'd striven to dissuade them from the struggle, and then, as if convinced by their arguments, he'd said to them with his kindly smile, Well, perhaps you're right, my friends. Fight if you like. I shall be here to patch up your arms and legs. Then in the morning he began to gather pebbles and plants along the high road. He regretted that he'd not brought his geologist's hammer and botanical wallet with him. His pockets were now so full of stones that they were almost bursting, while bundles of long herbs peered forth from the surgeon's case, which he carried under his arm. "'Hello! You here, my lad?' he cried, as he perceived Silver. "'I thought I was the only member of the family here.' He spoke these last words with a touch of irony, as if deriding the intrigues of his father and his uncle Antoine. Silver was very glad to meet his cousin. The doctor was the only one of the Rougeon who ever shook hands with him in the street and showed him any sincere friendship. Seeing him, therefore, still covered with dust from the march, the young man thought him gained over to the Republican cause and was much delighted thereat. He talked to the doctor with youthful magniloquence, of the people's rights, their holy cause, and their certain triumph. Pascal smiled as he listened and watched the youth's gestures and the ardent play of his features with curiosity, as though he were studying a patient or analyzing an enthusiasm to ascertain what might be at the bottom of it. "'How you run on! How you run on!' he finally exclaimed. "'Ah, you are your grandmother's true grandson!' and in a whisper he added, like some chemist taking notes, Hysteria or enthusiasm, shameful madness or sublime madness, it's always those terrible nerves. Then again speaking aloud, as if summing up the matter, he said, The family is complete now. 
it will count a hero among its members. Silver did not hear him. He was still talking of his dear republic. Miette had dropped a few paces off. She was still wrapped in her large red pelisse. She and Silver had traversed the town arm in arm. The sight of this tall red girl at last puzzled Pascal, and again interrupting his cousin, he asked him, Who is this child with you? She's my wife, Silver gravely answered. The doctor opened his eyes wide, for he did not understand. He was very shy with women. However, he raised his hat to me as he went by. The night proved an anxious one. Forebodings of misfortune swept over the insurgents. The enthusiasm and confidence of the previous evening seemed to die away in the darkness. In the morning there were gloomy faces. Sad looks were exchanged, followed by discouraging silence. Terrifying rumors were now circulating. Bad news, which the leaders had managed to conceal the previous evening, had spread abroad, though nobody in particular was known to have spoken. It was the work of that invisible voice, which, with a word, throws a mob into a panic. According to some reports, Paris was subdued, and the provinces had offered their hands and feet, eager to be bound. And it was added that a large party of troops which had left Marseille under the command of Colonel Masson and Monsieur de Blériot, the prefect of the department, was advancing by forced marches to disperse the insurrectionary bands. This news came like a thunderbolt, at once awakening rage and despair. These men, who on the previous evening had been all aglow with patriotic fever, now shivered with cold, chilled to the hearts by the shameful submissiveness of prostrate France. They alone, then, had had the courage to do their duty. And now they were to be left to perish amidst the general panic, the death-like silence of the country. They had become mere rebels, who would be hunted down like wild beasts. They who had dreamed of a great war, of a whole nation in revolt, and of the glorious conquest of the people's rights. Miserably baffled and betrayed, this handful of men could but weep for their dead faith in their vanished dreams of justice. There were some who, while taunting France with their cowardice, flung away their arms and sat down by the roadside, declaring that they would there await the bullets of the troops and show how Republicans could die. Although these men had nothing now but death or exile before them, there were very few desertions from their ranks. A splendid feeling of solidarity kept them together. Their indignation turned chiefly against their leaders, who'd really proved incapable. Irreparable mistakes had been committed, and now the insurgents, without order or discipline, barely protected by a few sentries and under the command of irresolute men, found themselves at the mercy of the first soldiers that might arrive. They spent two more days at Orcher, Tuesday and Wednesday, thus losing time and aggravating the situation. The general, the man with the saber, whom Silver had pointed out to Miette on the Plassan Road, vacillated and hesitated under the terrible responsibility that weighed upon him. On Thursday, he came to the conclusion that the position of Orcher was the decidedly dangerous one, so towards one o'clock he gave orders to march and led his little army to the heights of saint Ruhr. That was indeed an impregnable position for anyone who knew how to defend it. The houses of saint Ruhr rise in tiers along a hillside, Behind the town, all approach is shut off by enormous rocks, so that this kind of citadel can only be reached by the Nor Plain, which spread out at the foot of the plateau. An esplanade, converted into a public walk planted with magnificent elms, overlooks the plain. It was on this esplanade that the insurgents encamped. The hostages were imprisoned in the Hôtel de la Mule Blanche, standing halfway along the promenade. The night passed away heavy and black. The insurgents spoke of treachery. As soon as it was morning, however, the man with the saber, who had neglected to take the simplest precautions, reviewed the troops. The contingents were drawn up in line with their backs turned to the plain. They presented a wonderful medley of costume, 
some wearing brown jackets, others dark greatcoats, and others again blue blouses girded with red sashes. Moreover, their arms were an equally odd collection. They were newly sharpened scythes, large navvy spades, and fowling pieces with burnished barrels glittering in the sunshine. And at the very moment when the improvised general was riding past the little army, a sentry who'd been forgotten in an olive plantation ran up gesticulating and shouting, The soldiers! The soldiers! There was indescribable emotion. At first, they thought it a false alarm. Forgetting all discipline, they rushed forward to the end of the esplanade in order to see the soldiers. The ranks were broken, and as the dark line of troops appeared, marching in perfect order with a long glitter of bayonets, on the other side of the grayish curtain of olive trees there came a hasty and disorderly retreat, which sent a quiver of panic to the other end of the plateau. Nevertheless, the contingents of La Palou and saint martin de vaux had again formed in line in the middle of the promenade, and stood there erect and fierce. A woodcutter, who was a head taller than any of his companions, shouted as he waved his red neckerchief, To arms, Chavanot, Grahil, Pougeot, saint europe To arms, Letulette, to arms, Plessant! Crowds streamed across the esplanade. The man with the sabre, surrounded by the folks from Faverolles, marched off with several of the country contingents, Vernou, Corbière, Massan, and Puinas, to outflank the enemy and then attack him. Other contingents, from Vaqueras, Nazaire, Castellevieux, Les Roches Noires, and Murderin, dashed to the left, scattering themselves in skirmishing parties over the North Plain. And meantime, the men of the towns and villages that the woodcutter had called to his aid mustered together under the elms, there forming a dark, irregular mass, grouped without regard to any of the rules of strategy, simply placed there like a rock, as it were, to bar the way or die. The men of Plassans stood in the middle of this heroic battalion. Amid the gray hues of the blouses and jackets and the, and the bluish glitter of the weapons, the police worn by Miette, who was holding the banner with both hands, looked like a large red splotch, a fresh and bleeding wound. All at once perfect silence fell. Monsieur Perrault's pale face appeared at a window of the Hôtel de la Mule Blanche, and he began to speak, gesticulating with his hands. Go in! Close the shutters! The insurgents furiously shouted. You'll get yourself killed! Thereupon the shutters were quickly closed, and nothing was heard save the regular, rhythmical tramp of the soldiers who were drawing near. A minute that seemed an age went by. The troops had disappeared, hidden by an undulation of the ground, but over yonder, on the side of a Nor plain, the insurgents soon perceived the bayonets shooting up, one after another, like a field of steel-eared corn under the rising sun. At that moment, Silver, who was glowing with feverish agitation, fancied he could see the gendarme whose blood had stained his hands. He knew from the accounts of his companions that Rancard was not dead, that he'd only lost an eye and he clearly distinguished the unlucky man with his empty socket bleeding horribly. The keen recollection of the gendarme, to whom he had not given a thought since his departure from Plessant, proved unbearable. He was afraid that fear might get the better of him, and he tightened his hold on his carbine while a mist gathered before his eyes. He felt a longing to discharge his gun and fire at the phantom of that one-eyed man so as to drive it away. Meantime, the bayonets were still and ever slowly ascending. When the heads of the soldiers appeared on a level with the esplanade, Silver instinctively turned to Miette. She stood there with flushed face, looking taller than ever amidst the folds of the red banner. She was indeed standing on tiptoes in order to see the troops, and nervous expectation made her nostrils quiver and her red lips part so as to show her white eager, gleaming teeth. Silver smiled at her, but he had scarcely turned his head when the fusillade burst out. The soldiers, who could only be seen from their shoulders upwards, had just fired their first volley. 
It seemed to Silvere as though a great gust of wind was passing over his head, while a shower of leaves, lopped off by the bullets, fell from the elms. A sharp sound like the snapping of a dead branch made him look to his right. Then, prone on the ground, he saw the big woodcutter, who was a head taller than the others. There was a little black hole in the middle of his forehead, and thereupon Silver fired straight before him, without taking aim, reloaded and fired again, like a madman or an unthinking wild beast, in haste only to kill. He could not even distinguish the soldiers now. Smoke, resembling strips of grey muslin, was floating under the elms. The leaves still rained upon the insurgents, for the troops were firing too high. Every now and then, athwart the fierce crackling of the fusillade, the young man heard a sigh or a low rattle, and a rush was made among the band, as if to make room for some poor wretch clutching hold of his neighbors as he fell. The firing lasted ten minutes. Then, between two volleys, someone exclaimed in a voice of terror, Every man for himself, sauf qui peut. This roused shouts and murmurs of rage, as if to say, The cowards! Oh, the cowards! Sinister rumors were spreading. The general had fled. Cavalry were sabering the skirmishers in Menor Plain. However, the irregular firing did not cease. Every now and again, sudden bursts of flame sped through the clouds of smoke. A gruff voice, the voice of terror, shouted yet louder, Every man for himself, sauf qui peur! Some men took to flight, throwing down their weapons and leaping over the dead. The others closed their ranks. At last there were only some ten insurgents left. Two more took to flight, and of the remaining eight, three were killed at one discharge. The two children had remained there mechanically, without understanding anything. As the battalion diminished in numbers, Miette raised the banner still higher in the air. She held it in front of her with clenched fists, as if it were a huge taper. It was completely riddled by bullets. When Silver had no more cartridges left in his pocket, he ceased firing and gazed at the carbine with an air of stupor. It was then that a shadow passed over his face as though the flapping wings of some colossal bird had brushed against his forehead. And raising his eyes, he saw the banner fall from Miet's grasp. The child, her hands clasped to her breast, her head thrown back with an expression of excruciating suffering, was staggering to the ground. She did not utter a single cry, but sank at last upon the red banner. "'Get up! Come quickly!' Silver said." in despair as he held out his hand to her. But she lay upon the ground without uttering a word, her eyes wide open. Then he understood and fell on his knees beside her. You are wounded, eh? Tell me, where are you wounded? She still spoke no word. She was stifling and gazing at him out of her large eyes while short quivers shook her frame. Then he pulled away her hands. It's there, isn't it? It's there. And he tore open her bodice and lay her bosom bare. He searched, but saw nothing. His eyes were brimming with tears. At last, under the left breast, he perceived a small pink hole. A single drop of blood stained the wound. It's nothing, he whispered. I'll go and find Pascal. He'll put you all right again. If you could only get up, can't you move? The soldiers were not firing now. They dashed to the left in pursuit of the contingents led away by the man with the saber. And in the center of the esplanade, there only remained Silver kneeling beside Miette's body. With the stubbornness of despair, he'd taken her in his arms. He wanted to set her on her feet. But such a quiver of pain came upon the girl that he laid her down again and said to her entreatingly, Speak to me, pray. Why don't you say something to me? She could not. She slowly, gently shook her hand as if to say that it was not her fault. Her close-pressed lips were already contracting beneath the touch of death. 
with her unbound hair streaming around her and her head resting amid the folds of the blood-red banner, all her life now centered in her eyes, those black eyes glittering in her white face. Silver sobbed. The glance of those big, sorrowful eyes filled him with distress. He read in them bitter, immense regret for life. Miette was telling him that she was going away all alone and before their bridal day, that she was leaving him ere she'd become his wife. She was telling him, too, that it was he who had willed that it should be so, that he should have loved her as other lovers love their sweethearts. In the hour of her agony, amidst that stern conflict between death and her vigorous nature, she bewailed her fate in going like that to the grave. Silver, as he bent over her, understood how bitter was the pang. He recalled their caresses, how she'd hung round his neck and had yearned for his love, but he had not understood. And now she was departing from him forevermore. Bitterly grieved at the thought that throughout her eternal rest she'd remember him solely as a companion and playfellow, he kissed her on the bosom while his hot tears fell upon her lips. Those passionate kisses brought a last gleam of joy to Miette's eyes. They loved one another, and their idyll ended in death. But Silver could not believe she was dying. No, you will see. It will prove only a trifle, he declared. D don't speak if it hurts you. Wait, I will raise your head and then warm you. Your hands are quite frozen. But the fusillade had begun afresh, this time on the left in the olive plantations. A dull sound of galloping cavalry rose from the plain. At times there were loud cries as of men being slaughtered, and thick clouds of smoke were wafted along and hung about the elms on the esplanade. Silver, for his part, no longer heard or saw anything. Pascal, who came running down in the direction of the plain, saw him stretched upon the ground and hastened towards him, thinking he was wounded. As soon as the young man saw him, he clutched hold of him and pointed to Miette. Look, he said, she's wounded, there under the breast. How good of you to come. You will save her. At that moment, however, a slight convulsion shook the dying girl. A pain-fraught shadow passed over her face, and as her contracted lips suddenly parted, a faint sigh escaped from them. Her eyes, still wide open, gazed fixedly at the young man. Then Pascal, who'd stooped down, rose again, saying in a low voice, She's dead. Dead! Silver reeled at the sound of the word. He'd been kneeling forward, but now he sank back, as though thrown down by Miette's last faint sigh. Dead. Dead, he repeated. It's not true. She's looking at me. See how she is looking at me. Then he caught the doctor by the coat, entreating him to remain there, assuring him that he was mistaken, that she was not dead, and that he could save her if he only would. Pascal resisted gently, saying in his kindly voice, I can do nothing for her. Others are waiting for me. Let go, my poor child. She is quite dead. At last, Silver released his hold and again fell back. Dead. Dead. Still that word, which rang like a knell in his dazed brain. When he was alone, he crept up close to the corpse. Miette still seemed to be looking at him. He threw himself upon her, laid his head upon her bosom and watered it with his tears. He was beside himself with grief. He pressed his lips wildly to her and breathed out all his passion, all his soul, in one long kiss, as though in the hope that it might bring her to life again. But the girl was turning cold in spite of his caresses. He felt her lifeless and nerveless beneath his touch. Then he was seized with terror, and with haggard face and listless hanging arms, he remained crouching in a state of stupor, 
and repeating, She's dead, yet she is looking at me. She does not close her eyes. She sees me still. This fancy was very sweet to him. He remained there perfectly still, exchanging a long look with Miette, in whose glance, deepened by death, he still seemed to read the girl's lament for her sad fate. In the meantime, the cavalry were still sabering the fugitives over the Nor plain. The cries of the wounded and the galloping of the horses became more distant, softening like music wafted from afar through the clear air. Sylvia was no longer conscious of the fighting. He did not even see his cousin, who mounted the slope again and crossed the promenade. Pascal, as he passed along, picked up Macart's carbine, which Sylvia had thrown down. He knew it, as he'd seen it hanging over Aunt Dide's chimney piece, and he thought he might as well save it from the hands of the victors. He had scarcely entered the Hôtel de la Mule Blanche, whither a large number of the wounded had been taken, when a band of insurgents, chased by the soldiers like a herd of cattle, once more rushed into the Esplanade. The man with the saber had fled. It was the last contingents from the country who were being exterminated. There was a terrible massacre. In vain did Colonel Masson and the prefect, Monsieur de Blériot, overcome by pity, order a retreat. The infuriated soldiers continued firing upon the mass and pinning isolated fugitives to the walls with their bayonets. When they had no more enemies before them, they riddled the facade of the Mule Blanche with bullets. The shutters flew into splinters. One window which had been left half open was torn out, and there was a loud rattle of broken glass. Pitiful voices were crying out from within, the prisoners! The prisoners! But the troops did not hear. They continued firing. All at once, Commander Sicardot, growing exasperated, appeared at the door, waved his arms and endeavored to speak. Monsieur Perrault, the receiver of taxes, with his slim figure and scared face, stood by his side. However, another volley was fired, and Monsieur Perrault fell, face foremost, with a heavy thud to the ground. Silver and Miette were still looking at each other. Silver had remained by the corpse, through all the fusillade and the howls of agony, without even turning his head. He was only conscious of the presence of some men around him, and from a feeling of modesty he drew the red banner over Miette's breast. Then their eyes still continued to gaze at one another. The conflict, however, was at an end. The death of the receiver of taxes had satiated the soldiers. Some of these ran about, scouring every corner of the esplanade to prevent the escape of a single insurgent. A gendarme who perceived Silver under the trees ran up to him, and seeing that it was a lad he had to deal with, called, "'What are you doing there, youngster?' Silver, whose eyes were still fixed on those of Miette, made no reply. Ah, the bandit, his hands are black with powder, the gendarme exclaimed as he stooped down. Come, get up, you scoundrel. You know what you've got to expect. Then as Silver only smiled vaguely and did not move, the other looked more attentively and saw that the corpse swathed in the banner was that of a girl. A fine girl. What a pity, he muttered. Your mistress, eh? You rascal. Then he made a violent grab at Silver, and setting him on his feet, led him away like a dog that's dragged by one leg. Silver submitted in silence, as quietly as a child. He just turned round to give another glance at Miette. He felt distressed at thus leaving her alone under the trees. For the last time he looked at her from afar. She was still lying there in all her purity, wrapped in the red banner, her head slightly raised, and her big eyes turned upward towards heaven. This ends Chapter 5, Part 3.
Section 13 of The Fortune of the Rougeon, Book 1 of Rougeon Macas Cycle, by Emile Zola, translated by Henry Vizitelli. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Mark Leder. Chapter 6, Part 1. It was about five o'clock in the morning when Rougeon at last ventured to leave his mother's house. The old woman had gone to sleep on a chair. He crept stealthily to the end of the impasse Saint-Mitre. There was not a sound, not a shadow. He pushed on as far as the Porte de Rome. The gate stood wide open in the darkness that enveloped the slumbering town. Plasson was sleeping as sound as a top, quite unconscious, apparently, of the risk it was running in allowing the gates to remain unsecured. It seemed like a city of the dead. Rougeon, taking courage, made his way into the Rue de Nice. He scanned from a distance the corners of each successive lane and trembled at every door, fearing lest he should see a band of insurgents rush out upon him. However, he reached the Cour Sauveur without any mishap. The insurgents seemed to have vanished in the darkness like a nightmare. Pierre then paused for a moment on the deserted pavement, heaving a deep sigh of relief and triumph. So those rascals had really abandoned Plasson to him. The town belonged to him now. It slept like the foolish thing it was. There it lay, dark and tranquil, silent and confident, and he had only to stretch out his hand to take possession of it. That brief halt, the supercilious glance which he cast over the drowsy place thrilled him with unspeakable delight. He remained there, alone in the darkness, and crossed his arms in the attitude of a great general on the eve of a victory. He could hear nothing in the distance but the murmur of the fountains of the Cour Sauvaire, whose jets of water fell into the basins with a musical plashing. Then he began to feel a little uneasy. What if the empire should unhappily have been established without his aid? What if Sicardot, Garcenet, and Perrot, instead of being arrested and led away by the insurrectionary band, had shut the rebels up in prison? A cold perspiration broke out over him, and he went on his way again, hoping that Felicité would give him some accurate information. He now pushed on more rapidly and was skirting the houses of the Rue de la Banque, when a strange spectacle which caught his eyes as he raised his head riveted him to the ground. One of the windows of the yellow drawing-room was brilliantly illuminated, and in the glare he saw a dark form which he recognized as that of his wife, bending forward and shaking its arms in a violent manner. He asked himself what this could mean but unable to think of any explanation, was beginning to feel seriously alarmed when some hard object bounded over the pavement at his feet. Felicité had thrown him the key of the cart-house, where he had concealed a supply of muskets. This key clearly signified that he must take up arms. So he turned away again, unable to comprehend why his wife had prevented him from going upstairs and imagining the most horrible things. He now went straight to Roudier, whom he found dressed and ready to march, but completely ignorant of the events of the night. Roudier lived at the far end of the new town, as in a desert, whither no tidings of the insurgents' movements had penetrated. Pierre, however, proposed to him that they should go to Granou, whose house stood on one of the corners of the Place des Recollets, and under whose windows the insurgent contingents must have passed. The municipal councillor's servant remained for a long time parleying before consenting to admit them, and they heard poor Granou calling from the first floor in a trembling voice, "'Don't open the door, Catherine! The streets are full of bandits!' He was in his bedroom, in the dark. When he recognized his two faithful friends, he felt relieved, but he would not let the maid bring a lamp, fearing lest the light might attract a bullet." He seemed to think that the town was still full of insurgents. Lying back on an armchair near the window, in his pants, and with a silk handkerchief round his head, 
he moaned. Ah, my friends, if you only knew. I tried to go to bed, but they were making such a disturbance. At last I lay down in my armchair here. I've seen it all, everything. Such awful-looking men, a band of escaped convicts. Then they passed by again, dragging brave Commander Sicardo, worthy Monsieur Garçonnet, the postmaster, and others away with them, and howling the while like cannibals. Rougeon felt his thrill of joy. He made Grenou repeat to him how he had seen the mayor and the others surrounded by the brigands. I saw it all, the poor man wailed. I was standing behind the blind. They had just seized Monsieur Perrot, and I heard him saying as he passed under my window, Gentlemen, don't hurt me. They were certainly maltreating him. It's abominable, abominable. However, Rudier calmed Grenou by assuring him that the town was free, and the worthy gentleman began to feel quite a glow of martial ardor when Pierre informed him that he had come to recruit his services for the purpose of saving Plassans. These three saviors then took counsel together. They each resolved to go and rouse their friends and appoint a meeting at the cart shed, the secret arsenal of the reactionary party. Meantime, Rougeon constantly bethought himself of Felicité's wild gestures, which seemed to betoken danger somewhere. Granou, assuredly the most foolish of the three, was the first to suggest that there must be some Republicans left in the town. This proved a flash of light, and Rougeon, with a feeling of conviction, reflected, There must be something of the Macart's doing under all this. An hour or so later, the friends met again in the cart shed, which was situated in a very lonely spot. They had glided stealthily from door to door, knocking and ringing as quietly as possible and picking up all the men they could. However, they'd only succeeded in collecting some forty who arrived one after the other, creeping along in the dark with the pale and drowsy countenances of men who had been violently startled from their sleep. The cart shed, let to a cooper, was littered with old hoops and broken casks, of which there were piles in every corner. The guns were stored in the middle in three long boxes. A taper stuck on a piece of wood illumined the strange scene with a flickering glimmer. When Rougeon had removed the covers of the three boxes, the spectacle became weirdly grotesque. Above the firearms, whose barrels shone with a bluish, phosphorescent glitter, were outstretched necks and heads that bent with a sort of secret fear, while the yellow light of a taper cast shadows of huge noses and locks of stiffened hair upon the walls. However, the reactionary forces counted their numbers, and the smallness of a total filled them with hesitation. They were only thirty-nine, all told, and this adventure would mean certain death for them. A father of a family spoke of his children. Others, without troubling themselves about excuses, turned towards the door. Then, however, two fresh conspirators arrived, who lived in the neighborhood of a town hall, and knew for certain that there were not more than about twenty Republicans still at the mayor's. The band thereupon deliberated afresh. Forty-one against twenty. These seemed practicable conditions, so the arms were distributed amid a little trembling. It was Rougeon who took them from the boxes, and each man present, as he received his gun, the barrel of which on that December night was icy cold, felt a sudden chill freeze him to his bones. The shadows on the walls assumed the clumsy postures of bewildered conscripts stretching out their fingers. Pierre closed the boxes regretfully, he left there a hundred and nine guns which he would willingly have distributed. However, he now had to divide the cartridges. Of these, there were two large barrels full in the furthest corner of the cart shed, sufficient to defend Plasson against an army. And as this corner was dark, one of the gentlemen brought the taper near, whereupon another conspirator, a burly pork butcher with immense fists, grew angry declaring that it was most imprudent to bring a light so close. They strongly approved his words, so the cartridges were distributed in the dark. 
They completely filled their pockets with them. Then, after they had loaded their guns with endless precautions, they lingered there for another moment, looking at each other with suspicious eyes, or exchanging glances in which cowardly ferocity was mingled with an expression of stupidity. In the streets they kept close to the houses, marching silently and in single file, like savages on the warpath. Rougeon had insisted upon having the honor of marching at their head. The time had come when he must needs run some risk if he wanted to see his schemes successful. Drops of perspiration poured down his forehead in spite of the cold. Nevertheless, he preserved a very martial bearing. Rudier and Grenou were immediately behind him. Upon two occasions the column came to an abrupt halt. They fancied they'd heard some distant sound of fighting, but it was only the jingle of little brass shaving dishes hanging from chains, which are used as signs by the barbers of southern France. These dishes were gently shaking to and fro in the breeze. After each halt, the saviors of Plesson continued their stealthy march in the dark, retaining the while the mien of terrified heroes. In this manner they reached the square in front of a town hall. There they formed a group round Rougeon and took counsel together once more. In the façade of the building in front of them only one window was lighted. It was now nearly seven o'clock and the dawn was approaching. After a good ten minutes' discussion, it was decided to advance as far as the door, so as to ascertain what might be the meaning of this disquieting darkness and silence. The door proved to be half open. One of the conspirators thereupon popped his head in, but quickly withdrew it, announcing that there was a man under the porch, sitting against the wall fast asleep with a gun between his legs. Rougeon, seeing a chance of commencing with a deed of valor, thereupon entered first, and seizing the man, held him down while Routier gagged him. His first triumph, gained in silence, singularly emboldened the little troop, who had dreamed of a murderous fusillade, and Rougeon had to make imperious signs to restrain his soldiers from indulging in over-boisterous delight. They continued their advance on tiptoes. Then, on the left, in the police guard room, which was situated there, they perceived some fifteen men lying on camp beds and snoring amid the dim glimmer of a lantern hanging from the wall. Rougeon, who was decidedly becoming a great general, left half of his men in front of the guard room with orders not to rouse the sleepers, but to watch them and make them prisoners if they stirred. He was personally uneasy about the lighted window which they'd seen from the square. He still scented Makoff's hand in the business, and as he felt that he would first have to make prisoners of those who were watching upstairs, he was not sorry to be able to adopt surprise tactics before the noise of a conflict should impel them to barricade themselves in the first-floor rooms. So we went up quietly, followed by the twenty heroes whom he still had at his disposal. Rudier commanded the detachment remaining in the courtyard. As Rougeon had surmised, it was Macar who was comfortably installed upstairs in the mayor's office. He sat in the mayor's armchair with his elbows on the mayor's writing table. With the characteristic confidence of a man of coarse intellect, who was absorbed by a fixed idea and bent upon his own triumph, he had imagined after the departure of the insurgents that Plasson was now at his complete disposal and that he would be able to act there like a conqueror. In his opinion, that body of 3,000 men who had just passed through the town was an invincible army whose mere proximity would suffice to keep the bourgeois humble and docile in his hands. The insurgents had imprisoned the gendarme in their barracks. The National Guard was already dismembered. The nobility must be quaking with terror, and the retired citizens of the new town had certainly never handled a gun in their lives. Moreover, there were no arms any more than there were soldiers. Thus, McCart did not even take the precautions to have the gate shut. His men carried their confidence still further by falling asleep, 
while he calmly awaited the dawn, which he fancied would attract and rally all the Republicans of the district round him. He was already meditating important revolutionary measures, the nomination of a commune of which he would be the chief, the imprisonment of all bad patriots, and particularly of all such persons as had incurred his displeasure. The thought of the baffled Rougeon and their yellow drawing-room, of all that clique entreating him for mercy, thrilled him with exquisite pleasure. In order to while away the time, he resolved to issue a proclamation to the inhabitants of Plassans. Four of his party set to work to draw up this proclamation, and when it was finished, Macart, assuming a dignified manner in the mayor's armchair, had it read to him before sending it to the printing office of the Independent, on whose patriotism he reckoned. One of the writers was commencing in an emphatic voice, Inhabitants of Plassans, the hour of independence has struck, the reign of justice has begun, when a noise was heard at the door of the office, which was slowly pushed in. Is it you, Cassel? Macar asked, interrupting the perusal. Nobody answered, but the door opened wider. Come in, do, he continued impatiently. Is my brigand of a brother at home? Then all at once both leaves of a door were violently thrown back and slammed against the walls, and a crowd of armed men, in the midst of whom marched Rougeon, with his face very red and his eyes starting out of their sockets, swarmed into the office, brandishing their guns like cudgels. Ah, the blackguards! They're armed! shouted Macart. He was about to seize a pair of pistols which were lying on the writing table when five men caught hold of him by the throat and held him in check. The four authors of the proclamation struggled for an instant. There was a good deal of scuffling and stamping and a noise of persons falling. The combatants were greatly hampered by their guns, which they would not lay aside, although they could not use them. In the struggle, Rougeon's weapon, which an insurgent had tried to wrest from him, went off of itself with a frightful report and filled the room with smoke. The bullet shattered a magnificent mirror that reached from the mantelpiece to the ceiling and was reputed to be one of the finest mirrors in the town. This shot, fired no one knew why, deafened everybody and put an end to the battle. Then, while the gentlemen were panting and puffing, three other reports were heard in the courtyard. Granu immediately rushed to one of the windows, and as he and the others anxiously leaned out, their faces lengthened perceptibly, for they were in no wise eager for a struggle with the men in the guardroom whom they'd forgotten amidst their triumph. However, Rudier cried out from below that all was right, and Granu then shut the window again, beaming with joy. The fact of the matter was that Rougeon's shot had aroused the sleepers who had promptly surrendered, seeing that resistance was impossible. Then, however, three of Rudier's men, in their blind haste to get the business over, had discharged their firearms in the air as a sort of answer to the report from above, without knowing quite why they did so. It frequently happens that guns go off of their own accord when they are in the hands of cowards. And now in the room upstairs, Rougeon ordered Macoff's hands to be bound with the bands of the large green curtains which hung at the windows. At this, Macart, wild with rage, broke into scornful jeers. All right, go on, he muttered. This evening or tomorrow, when the others return, we'll settle accounts. This allusion to the insurrectionary forces sent a shudder to the victor's very marrow. Rougeon, for his part, almost choked. His brother, who was exasperated at having been surprised like a child by these terrified bourgeois, who, old soldier that he was, he disdainfully looked upon as good-for-nothing civilians, defied him with a glance of the bitterest hatred. Ah, I can tell some pretty stories about you, very pretty ones, the rascal exclaimed, without removing his eyes from the retired oil merchant. Just send me before the assize court, so that I may tell the judge a few tales that'll make them laugh. At this, Rougeon turned pale. He was terribly afraid lest Macar should blab then and there, 
and ruin him in the esteem of the gentleman who had just been assisting him to save Plasson. These gentlemen, astounded by the dramatic encounter between the two brothers, and foreseeing some stormy passages, had retired to a corner of the room. Rougeon, however, formed a heroic resolution. He advanced towards the group and in a very proud tone exclaimed, "'We will keep this man here. When he's reflected on his position, he'll be able to give us some useful information.' Then, in a still more dignified voice, he went on, "'I will discharge my duty, gentlemen. I've sworn to save the town from anarchy, and I will save it, even should I have to be the executioner of my nearest relative.' One might have thought him some old Roman sacrificing his family on the altar of his country. Grenou, who felt deeply moved, came to press his hand with a tearful countenance, which seemed to say, I understand you. You are sublime. And then he did him the kindness to take everybody away, under the pretext of conducting the four other prisoners into the courtyard. When Pierre was alone with his brother, he felt all his self-possession return to him. You hardly expected me, did you? He resumed. I understand things now. You've been laying plots against me. You wretched fellow. See what your vices in disorderly life have brought you to. McCart shrugged his shoulders. Shut up, he replied. Go to the devil. You're an old rogue. He laughs best who laughs last. Thereupon Rougeon, who'd formed no definite plan with regard to him, thrust him into a dressing room whither Monsieur Garçonnet retired to rest sometimes. This room lighted from above, had no other means of exit than the doorway by which one entered. It was furnished with a few armchairs, a sofa, and a marble washstand. Pierre double-locked the door after partially unbinding his brother's hands. McCart was then heard to throw himself on the sofa and start singing the Sa Ira in a loud voice, as though he were trying to sing himself to sleep. Rougeon, who at last found himself alone, now in his turn sat down in the mayor's armchair. He heaved a sigh as he wiped his brow. How hard indeed it was to win fortune and honors. However, he was nearing the end at last. He felt the soft seat of the armchair yield beneath him, while with a mechanical movement he caressed the mahogany writing table with his hands, finding it apparently quite silky and delicate, like the skin of a beautiful woman. Then he spread himself out and assumed the dignified attitude which McCart had previously affected while listening to the proclamation. The silence of the room seemed fraught with religious solemnity, which inspired Rougeon with exquisite delight. Everything, even the dust and the old documents lying in the corners, seemed to exhale an odor of incense which rose to his dilated nostrils. This room, with its faded hangings redolent of petty transactions, all the trivial concerns of a third-rate municipality, became a temple of which he was the god. Nevertheless, amidst his rapture, he started nervously at every shout from Macar. The words aristocrat and lamppost, the threats of hanging that formed the refrain of the famous revolutionary song, the Sa Ira, reached him in angry bursts, interrupting his triumphant dreams in the most disagreeable manner. Always that man, and his dream in which he saw Plasson at his feet, ended with a sudden vision of the assize court, of the judges, the jury, and the public listening to McCart's disgraceful revelations, the story of the fifty thousand francs, and many other unpleasant matters. Or else, while enjoying the softness of Monsieur Gassonnet's armchair, he suddenly pictured himself suspended from a lamppost in the Rue de la Banne. Who would rid him of that wretched fellow? At last Antoine fell asleep, and then Pierre enjoyed ten good minutes pure ecstasy. Roudier and Grenou came to rouse him from this state of beatitude. They had just returned from the prison, whither they had taken the insurgents. Daylight was coming on apace, 
The town would soon be awake, and it was necessary to take some decisive step. Rudier declared that, before anything else, it would be advisable to issue a proclamation to the inhabitants. Pierre was, at that moment, reading the one which the insurgents had left upon the table. Why, cried he, this will suit us admirably. There are only a few words to be altered. And, in fact, a quarter of an hour sufficed for the necessary changes, after which Granou read out in an earnest voice, Inhabitants of Plasson, the hour of resistance has struck. The reign of order has returned. It was decided that the proclamation should be printed at the office of the Gazette and posted at all the street corners. Now, listen, said Rougeon, we'll go to my house. And in the meantime, Monsieur Granou will assemble here the members of the municipal council who had not been arrested and acquaint them with the terrible events of the night. Then he added majestically, I am quite prepared to accept the responsibility of my actions. If what I have already done appears a satisfactory pledge of my desire for order, I am willing to place myself at the head of a municipal commission until such time as the regular authorities can be reinstated, but in order that nobody may accuse me of ambitious designs, I shall not re-enter the town hall unless called upon to do so by my fellow citizens. At this, Granou and Rudier protested that Plasson would not be ungrateful. Their friend had indeed saved the town, and they recalled all that he'd done for the cause of order the yellow drawing-room always open to the friends of authority, his services as spokesman in the three quarters of a town, the store of arms which had been his idea, and especially that memorable night, that night of prudence and heroism in which he'd rendered himself forever illustrious. Granou added that he felt sure of the admiration and gratitude of the municipal councillors. "'Don't stir from your house,' he concluded." I will come and fetch you to lead you back in triumph. Then Rudier said he quite understood the tact and modesty of their friend and approved it. Nobody would think of accusing him of ambition, but all would appreciate the delicacy which prompted him to take no office save with the consent of his fellow citizens. That was very dignified, very noble, altogether grand. Under the shower of eulogies, Rougeon humbly bowed his head. No, no, you go too far, he murmured, with voluptuous thrillings of exquisite pleasure. Each sentence that fell from the retired hosier and the old almond merchant, who stood on his right and left respectively, fell sweetly on his ears, and leaning back in the mayor's armchair, steeped in the odor of officiality which pervaded the room, he bowed to the right and to the left, like a royal pretender whom a coup d'etat is about to convert into an emperor. When they were tired of belauding each other, they all three went downstairs. Granou started off to call the municipal council together, while Rudier told Rougeon to go on in front, saying that he would join him at his house after giving the necessary orders for guarding the town hall. The dawn was now fast rising, and Pierre proceeded to the Rue de la Ban, tapping his heels in a martial manner on the still deserted pavement. He carried his hat in his hand in spite of the bitter cold, for puffs of pride sent all his blood to his head. On reaching his house, he found Cassut at the bottom of the stairs. The navvy had not stirred, for he'd seen nobody enter. He sat there on the first step, resting his big head in his hands, and gazing fixedly in front of him, with the vacant stare and mute stubbornness of a faithful dog. "'You are waiting for me, weren't you?' Pierre said to him, taking in the situation at a glance. "'Well, go and tell Monsieur Macart that I've come home. Go and ask for him at the town hall.' Cassoute rose and took himself off with an awkward bow. He was going to get himself arrested like a lamb, to the great delight of Pierre, who laughed as he went upstairs, asking himself with a feeling of vague surprise, I have certainly plenty of courage. Shall I turn out as good a diplomatist? 
Felicite had not gone to bed last night. He found her dressed in her Sunday clothes, wearing a cap with lemon-colored ribbons, like a lady expecting visitors. She'd sat at the window in vain. She'd heard nothing and was dying with curiosity. Well, she asked, rushing to meet her husband. The latter, quite out of breath, entered the yellow drawing room, whither she followed him, carefully closing the door behind her. He sank into an armchair and in a gasping voice faltered, It's done. We shall get the receivership. At this she fell on his neck and kissed him. Really? Really? she cried. But I, I haven't heard anything. Oh, my darling husband, do tell me. Tell me all. She felt fifteen years old again and began to coax him and whirl round him like a grasshopper, fascinated by the light and heat. And Pierre, in the effusion of his triumph, poured out his heart to her. He did not omit a single detail. He even explained his future projects, forgetting that, according to his theories, wives were good for nothing, and that his must be kept in complete ignorance of what went on if he wished to remain master. Felicité leant over him and drank in his words. She made him repeat certain parts of his story, declaring that she had not heard. In fact, her delight bewildered her so much that at times she seemed quite deaf. When Pierre related the events at the town hall, she burst into a fit of laughter, changed her chair three times, and moved the furniture about, quite unable to sit still. After forty years of continuous struggle, Fortune had at last yielded to them. Eventually, she became so mad over it that she forgot all prudence. "'It's to me you owe all this!' she exclaimed, in an outburst of triumph. "'If I hadn't looked after you, you would have been nicely taken in by the insurgents. You booby! It was Garcinet, Sicardo, and the others that had got to be thrown to those wild beasts!' Then, showing her teeth, Loosened by age, she added with a girlish smile, Well, the Republic forever. It's made our path clear. But Pierre had turned cross. That's just like you, he muttered. You always fancy that you've foreseen everything. It was I who had the idea of hiding myself, as though women understood anything about politics. Bah! My poor girl, if you were to steer the bark, we should very soon be shipwrecked. Felicité bit her lip. She'd gone too far and forgotten her self-assigned part of good, silent fairy. Then she was seized with one of those fits of covert exasperation, which she generally experienced when her husband tried to crush her with his superiority. And she again promised herself, when the right time should arrive, some exquisite revenge— which would deliver this man into her power, bound hand and foot. Ah, I was forgetting, resumed Rougeon. Monsieur Perrot is amongst them. Grenou saw him struggling in the hands of the insurgents. Felicité gave a start. She was just at that moment standing at the window, gazing with longing eyes at the house where the receiver of taxes lived. She'd felt a desire to do so, for in her mind the idea of triumph was always associated with envy of that fine house. "'So Monsieur Perrot is arrested!' she exclaimed in a strange tone as she turned round. For an instant she smiled complacently. Then a crimson blush rushed to her face. A murderous wish had just ascended from the depths of her being. "'Ah, if the insurgents would only kill him!' Pierre no doubt read her thoughts in her eyes. "'Well, if some ball were to hit him,' he murmured, "'our business would be settled. "'There would be no necessity to supersede him, eh? "'And it would be no fault of ours.' But Felicité shuddered. She felt that she just condemned a man to death. If Monsieur Perrot should now be killed, she would always see his ghost at night time. He would come and haunt her so she only ventured to cast furtive glances, full of fearful delight, at the unhappy man's window. Henceforward, all her enjoyment would be fraught with a touch of guilty terror. Moreover, Pierre, having now poured out his soul, began to perceive the other side of the situation. He mentioned Macart. 
How could they get rid of that blackguard? But Felicite, again fired with enthusiasm, exclaimed, Oh, one can't do everything at once. We'll gag him somehow. We'll soon find some means or other. She was now walking to and fro, putting the armchairs in order and dusting their backs. Suddenly she stopped in the middle of the room and gave the faded furniture a long glance. Good heavens, she said, how ugly it is here, and we shall have everybody coming to call upon us. Ah, replied Pierre, with supreme indifference, we'll alter all that. He, who the night before had entertained almost religious veneration of the armchairs and the sofa, would now have willingly stamped on them. Felicité, who felt the same contempt, even went so far as to upset an armchair which was short of a caster, it did not yield to her quickly enough. It was at this moment that Rudier entered. It at once occurred to the old woman that he'd become much more polite. His monsieur and madame rolled forth in delightfully musical fashion. But the other habitués were now arriving one after the other, and the drawing-room was fast getting full. Nobody yet knew the full particulars of the events of the night, and all had come in haste, with wondering eyes and smiling lips, urged on by the rumors which were beginning to circulate through the town. These gentlemen who, on the previous evening, had left the drawing-room with such precipitation at the news of the insurgents' approach, came back, inquisitive and importunate, like a swarm of buzzing flies which a puff of wind would have dispersed. Some of them had not even taken time to put on their braces. They were very impatient, but it was evident that Rougeon was waiting for someone else before speaking out he constantly turned an anxious look towards the door. For an hour there was only significant handshaking, vague congratulation, admiring whispering, suppressed joy of uncertain origin, which only awaited a word of enlightenment to turn to enthusiasm. At last, Granou appeared. He paused for a moment on the threshold, with his right hand pressed to his breast between the buttons of his frock coat. His broad, pale face was beaming. In vain he strove to conceal his emotion beneath an expression of dignity. All the others became silent on perceiving him. They felt that something extraordinary was about to take place. Grenou walked straight up to Rougeon through two lines of visitors and held out his hand to him. "'My friend,' he said, "'I bring you the homage of the municipal council. "'They call you to their head.' until our mayor shall be restored to us. You have saved Plassans. In the terrible crisis through which we are passing, we want men who, like yourself, unite intelligence with courage. Come. At this point, Grenou, who was reciting a little speech which he'd taken great trouble to prepare on his way from the town hall to the Rue de la Banne, felt his memory fail him. But Rougeon, overwhelmed with emotion, broke in, shaking his hand and repeating, Thank you, my dear Granou. I thank you very much. He could find nothing else to say. However, a loud burst of voices followed. Everyone rushed upon him, tried to shake hands, poured forth praises and compliments, and eagerly questioned him. But he, already putting on official dignity, begged for a few minutes' delay in, in order that he might confer with Monsieur Granou and Roudier. Business before everything. The town was in such a critical situation. Then the three accomplices retired to a corner of a drawing room, where, in an undertone, they divided power amongst themselves. The rest of the visitors, who remained a few paces away, trying meanwhile to look extremely wise and furtively glancing at them with mingled admiration and curiosity. It was decided that Rougeon should take the title of President of the Municipal Commission. Granou was to be secretary, whilst as for Rudier, he became commander-in-chief of the reorganized National Guard. They also swore to support each other against all opposition. However, Felicité, who had drawn near, abruptly inquired, And Vuillet? At this they looked at each other. Nobody had seen Vuillet. 
Jean seemed somewhat uneasy. Perhaps they've taken him away with the others, he said, to ease his mind. But Felicite shook her head. Pouillet was not the man to let himself be arrested. Since nobody had seen or heard him, it was certain he'd been doing something wrong. Suddenly the door opened and Pouillet up entered, bowing humbly with blinking glance and stiff sacristan smile. Then he held out his moist hand to Rougeon and the two others. Fouillet had settled his little affairs alone. He had cut his own slice out of the cake, as Felicite would have said. While peeping through the ventilator of his cellar, he'd seen the insurgents arrest the postmaster, whose offices were near his bookshop. At daybreak, therefore, at the moment when Rougeon was comfortably seated in the mayor's armchair, he had quietly installed himself in the postmaster's office. He knew the clerks, so he received them on their arrival, told them that he would replace their chief until his return, and that meantime they need be in no wise uneasy. Then he ransacked the morning mail with ill-concealed curiosity. He examined the letters and seemed to be seeking a particular one. His new birth doubtless suited his secret plans, for his satisfaction became so great that he actually gave one of the clerks a copy of the Oeuvre Badine de Piron. Fouillet, it should be mentioned, did business in objectionable literature, which he kept concealed in a large drawer under the stock of heads and religious images. It is probable that he felt some slight qualms at the free and easy manner in which he'd taken possession of the post office and recognized the desirability of getting his usurpation confirmed as far as possible. At all events, he thought it well to call upon Rougeon, who was fast becoming an important personage. "'Why, where have you been?' Felicite asked him in a distrustful manner. Thereupon he related his story with sundry embellishments. According to his own account, he had saved the post office from pillage, all right, then. That's settled. Stay on there, said Pierre, after a moment's reflection. Make yourself useful. The last sentence revealed the one great fear that possessed the Rougeon. They were afraid that someone might prove too useful and do more than themselves to save the town. Still, Pierre saw no serious danger in leaving Vouillet as provisional postmaster. It was even a convenient means of getting rid of him. Felicité, however, made a sharp gesture of annoyance. The consultation having ended, the three accomplices mingled with the various groups that filled the drawing room. They were at last obliged to satisfy the general curiosity by giving detailed accounts of recent events. Rougeon proved magnificent. He exaggerated, embellished, and dramatized the story which he'd related to his wife. The distribution of the guns and cartridges made everybody hold their breath. But it was the march through the deserted streets and the seizure of the town hall that most amazed these worthy bourgeois. At each fresh detail, there was an interruption. And you were only forty-one? It's marvelous! Ah, indeed, it must have been frightfully dark. No, I confess, I never should have dared it. Then you seized him like that by the throat? And the insurgents, what did they say? These remarks and questions only incited Rougeon's imagination the more. He replied to everybody. He mimicked the action. This stout man, in his admiration of his own achievements, became as nimble as a schoolboy. He began afresh repeated himself amidst the exclamations of surprise and individual discussions which suddenly arose about some trifling detail. And thus he continued blowing his trumpet, making himself more and more important, as if some irresistible force impelled him to turn his narrative into a genuine epic. Moreover, Granou and Rudier stood by his side prompting him, reminding him of such trifling matters as he omitted. They also were burning to put in a word, and occasionally they could not restrain themselves, so that all three went on talking together. When, in order to keep the episode of the broken mirror for the denouement, like some crowning glory, 
Rujon began to describe what had taken place downstairs in the courtyard. After the arrest of the guard, Rudier accused him of spoiling the narrative by changing the sequence of events. For a moment, they wrangled about it somewhat sharply. Then Rudier, seeing a good opportunity for himself, suddenly exclaimed, Very well, let it be so. But you aren't there, so let me tell it. He thereupon explained at great length how the insurgents had awoke and how the muskets of a town deliverers had been leveled at them to reduce them to impotence. He added, however, that no blood, fortunately, had been shed. This last sentence disappointed his audience, who counted upon one corpse at least. But I thought you fired, interrupted Felicite, recognizing that the story was wretchedly deficient in dramatic interest. Yes, yes, three shots, resumed the old hosier. The pork butcher de Brule, Monsieur Lievin, and Monsieur Massicot discharged their guns with really culpable alacrity. And as there were some murmurs at this remark, culpable, I repeat the word, he continued, there are quite enough cruel necessities in warfare without any useless shedding of blood. Besides, these gentlemen swore to me that it was not their fault. They can't understand how it was their guns went off. Nevertheless, a spent ball after ricocheting grazed the cheek of one of the insurgents and left a mark on it. This graze, this unexpected wound, satisfied the audience. Which cheek, right or left, had been grazed, and how was it that a bullet, a spent one even, could strike a cheek without piercing it? These points supplied material for some long discussions. Meantime, continued Jean at the top of his voice, without giving time for the excitement to abate, meantime we had plenty to do upstairs. The struggle was quite desperate. Then he described at length the arrival of his brother and the four other insurgents, without naming Macart, whom he simply called the leader. The words, the mayor's office, the mayor's armchair, the mayor's writing table, recurred to him every instant, and in the opinion of his office imparted marvelous grandeur to the terrible scene. It was not at the porter's lodge that the fight was now being waged, but in the private sanctum of the chief magistrate of a town. Rudier was quite cast into the background. Then Rougeon at last came to the episode which he'd been keeping in reserve from the commencement, and which would certainly exalt him to the dignity of a hero. Thereupon, said he, an insurgent rushes upon me. I push the mayor's armchair away and seize the man by the throat. I hold him tightly, you may be sure of it. But my gun was in my way. I didn't want to let it drop. A man always sticks to his gun. I held it like this under the left arm. All of a sudden it went off. The whole audience hung on Rougeon's lips. But Granu, who was opening his mouth wide with a violent itching to say something, shouted, No, no, that isn't right. You were not in a position to see things, my friend. You were fighting like a lion. But I saw everything while I was helping to bind one of the prisoners. The man tried to murder you. It was he who fired the gun. I saw him distinctly slip his black fingers under your arm. Really? said Rougeon, turning quite pale. He did not know he'd been in such danger, and the old almond merchant's account of the incident chilled him with fright. Grenou, as a rule, did not lie, but on a day of battle, it's surely allowable to view things dramatically. I tell you, the man tried to murder you, he repeated with conviction. Ah, said Rougeon in a faint voice. That's how it is I heard the bullet whiz past my ear. At this, violent emotion came upon the audience. Everybody gazed at the hero with respectful awe. He'd heard a bullet whiz past his ear. Certainly, none of the other bourgeois who were there could say as much. Felicité felt bound to rush into her husband's arms so as to work up the emotion to boiling point. But Rougeon immediately freed himself 
and concluded his narrative with this heroic sentence, which has become famous at Plosson. The shot goes off. I hear the bullet whiz past my ear and wish it smashes the mayor's mirror. This caused complete consternation. Such a magnificent mirror, too. It was scarcely credible. The damage done to that looking-glass almost outbalanced Rougeon's heroism in the estimation of the company. The glass became an object of absorbing interest, and they talked about it for a quarter of an hour, with many exclamations and expressions of regret, as though it had been some dear friend that had been stricken to the heart. This was the culminating point that Rougeon had aimed at, the denouement of his wonderful odyssey. A loud hubbub of voices filled the yellow drawing room. The visitors were repeating what they just heard, and every now and then one of them would leave a group to ask the three heroes the exact truth with regard to some contested incident. The heroes set the matter right with scrupulous minuteness, for they felt that they were speaking for history. At last, Rougeon and his two lieutenants announced that they were expected at the town hall. Respectful silence was then restored, and the company smiled at each other discreetly. Grinu was swelling with importance. He was the only one who'd seen the insurgent pull the trigger and smash the mirror. This sufficed to exalt him, and almost made him burst his skin. On leaving the drawing room, he took Rudier's arm with the air of a great general who's broken down with fatigue. I've been up for thirty-six hours, he murmured, and heaven alone knows when I shall get to bed. Rougeon, as he withdrew, took Fouillet aside and told him that the party of order relied more than ever on him and the Gazette. He would have to publish an effective article to reassure the inhabitants and treat the band of villains who'd passed through Plassan as it deserved. Be easy, replied Fouillet. In the ordinary course, the Gazette ought not to appear till tomorrow morning, but I'll issue it this very evening. When the leaders had left, the rest of the visitors remained in the yellow drawing room for another moment, chattering like so many old women, whom the escape of a canary had gathered together on the pavement. These retired tradesmen, oil dealers, and wholesale hatters felt as if they were in a sort of fairyland. Never had they experienced such thrilling excitement before. They could not get over their surprise at discovering such heroes as Rougeon, Granou and Roudier in their midst. At last, half stifled by the stuffy atmosphere and tired of ever telling each other the same things, they decided to go off and spread the momentous news abroad. They glided away one by one, each anxious to have the glory of being the first to know and relate everything. And Felicité, as she leaned out the window, on being left alone, saw them dispersing in the Rue de la Bonne, waving their arms in an excited manner, eager as they were to diffuse emotion to the four corners of the town. It was ten o'clock, and Plassans, now wide awake, was running about the streets, wildly excited by the reports which were circulating. Those who had seen or heard the insurrectionary forces related the most foolish stories, contradicting each other and indulging in the wildest suppositions. The majority, however, knew nothing at all about the matter. They lived at the further end of the town and listened with gaping mouths, like children to a nursery tale, to the stories of how several thousand bandits had invaded the streets during the night and vanished before daybreak like an army of phantoms. A few of the most skeptical said, Nonsense. Yet some of the details were very precise, and Plasson at last felt convinced that some frightful danger had passed over it while it slept. The darkness which had shrouded this danger, the various contradictory reports that spread, all invested the matter with mystery and vague horror, which made the bravest shudder. Whose hand had diverted the thunderbolt from them? There seemed to be something quite miraculous about it. There were rumors of unknown deliverers, 
of a handful of brave men who'd cut off the Hydra's head, but no one seemed acquainted with the exact particulars, and the whole story appeared scarcely credible, until the company from the yellow drawing room spread through the streets, scattering tidings, ever repeating the same narrative at each door they came to. It was like a train of powder. In a few minutes, the story had spread from one end of town to the other. Rougeon's name flew from mouth to mouth, with exclamations of surprise in the new town and of praise in the old quarter. The idea of being without a sub-prefect, a mayor, a postmaster, a receiver of taxes, or authorities of any kind, at first threw the inhabitants into consternation. They were stupefied at having been able to sleep through the night and get up as usual in the absence of any settled government. Their first stupor over, they threw themselves recklessly into the arms of their liberators. The few Republicans shrugged their shoulders, but the petty shopkeepers, the small householders, the conservatives of all shades invoked blessings on those modest heroes whose achievements had been shrouded by the night. When it was known that Rougeon had arrested his own brother, the popular admiration knew no bounds. People talked of Brutus, and thus the indiscretion which had made Pierre rather anxious really redounded to his glory. At this moment when terror still hovered over them, the townsfolk were virtually unanimous in their gratitude. Rougeon was accepted as their savior without the slightest show of opposition. Just think of it, the poltroons exclaimed. There were only 41 of them. That number of 41 amazed the whole town. And this was the origin of the Passan legend of how 41 bourgeois had made 3,000 insurgents bite the dust. There were only a few envious spirits of a new town, lawyers without work and retired military men ashamed of having slept ingloriously through that memorable night, who raised any doubts. The insurgents, these skeptics hinted, had no doubt left the town of their own accord. There were no indications of a combat, no corpses, no bloodstains, so the deliverers had certainly had a very easy task. But the mirror, the mirror, repeated the enthusiasts. You can't deny that the mayor's mirror has been smashed. Go and see it for yourselves. And, in fact, until nighttime, quite a stream of townspeople flowed, under one pretext or another, into the mayor's private office, the door of which Rougeon left wide open. The visitors planted themselves in front of the mirror, which the bullet had pierced and starred. And they all gave vent to the same exclamation. By Jove, that ball must have had terrible force. Then they departed, quite convinced. Felicité at her window listened with delight to all the rumors and laudatory and grateful remarks which arose from the town. At that moment, old Plasson was talking of her husband, she felt that the two districts below her were quivering, wafting her the hope of approaching triumph. Ah, how she would crush that town which she'd been so long in getting beneath her feet. All her grievances crowded back to her memory, and her past disappointments redoubled her appetite for immediate enjoyment. At last she left the window and walked slowly round the drawing room. It was there that, a little, while previously everybody had held out their hands to her husband and herself. He and she had conquered. The citizens were at their feet. The yellow drawing room seemed to her a holy place. The dilapidated furniture, the frayed velvet, the chandelier soiled with fly marks, all those poor wrecks now seemed to her like the glorious bullet-riddled debris of a battlefield. The plain of Austerlitz would not have stirred her to deeper emotion. When she returned to the window, she perceived Aristide wandering about the place of the sub-prefecture, with his nose in the air. She beckoned him to come up, which he immediately did. It seemed as if he had only been waiting for this invitation. "'Come in,' his mother said to him on the landing, seeing that he hesitated. "'Your father's not here.' Aristide evinced all the shyness of a prodigal son returning home. 
he had not been inside the yellow drawing room for nearly four years. He still carried his arm in a sling. Does your hand still pain you? his mother asked him, ironically. He blushed as he answered with some embarrassment. Oh, it's getting better. It's a nearly well again now. Then he lingered there, loitering about not knowing what to say. Felicite came to the rescue. I suppose you've heard them talking about your father's noble conduct, she resumed. He replied that the whole town was talking of it. And then as he regained his self-possession, he paid his mother back for her raillery in her own coin. Looking her full in the face, he added, I came to see if father was wounded. Come, don't play the fool, cried Felicite petulantly. If I were you, I'd act boldly and decisively. Confess now that you made a false move in joining those good-for-nothing Republicans. You would be very glad, I'm sure, to be well rid of them and to return to us who are the stronger party. Well, the house is open to you. But Aristide protested. The Republic was a grand idea. Moreover, the insurgents might still carry the day. Don't talk nonsense to me, retorted the old woman with some irritation. You're afraid that your father won't have a very warm welcome for you. But I'll see to that. Listen to me. Go back to your newspaper, and between now and tomorrow, prepare a number strongly favoring the coup d'etat. Tomorrow evening, when this number has appeared, come back here, and you'll be received with open arms. Then, seeing that the young man remained silent, Do you hear, she added, in a lower and more eager tone, it's necessary for our sake and for your own, too, that it should be done. Don't let us have any more nonsense and folly. You've already compromised yourself enough in that way. The young man made a gesture, the gesture of a Caesar crossing the Rubicon, and by doing so escaped entering into any verbal engagement. As he was about to withdraw, his mother, looking for the knot in his sling, remarked, First of all, you must let me take off this rag. It's getting a little ridiculous, you know. Aristide let her remove it. When the silk handkerchief was untied, he folded it neatly and placed it in his pocket. And as he kissed his mother, he exclaimed, Till tomorrow, then. This ends Chapter 6, Part 1. Section 14 of The Fortune of the Rougeon, Book 1 of Rougeon Maca Cycle, by Emile Zola, translated by Henri Visitelli. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Mark Leader. Chapter 6, Part 2. In the meanwhile, Rougeon was taking official possession of the mayor's offices. There were only eight municipal councillors left. The others were in the hands of the insurgents, as well as the mayor and his two assessors. The eight remaining gentlemen, who were all on a par with Granu, perspired with fright when the latter explained to them the critical situation of the town. It requires an intimate knowledge of the kind of men who compose the municipal councils of some of the smaller towns in order to form an idea of a terror with which these timid folk threw themselves into Rougeon's arms. At Plassans, the mayor had the most incredible blockheads under him, men without any ideas of their own and accustomed to passive obedience. Consequently, as Monsieur Gossonet was no longer there, the municipal machine was bound to get out of order and fall completely under the control of the man who might know how to set it working. Moreover, as the sub-prefect had left the district, Rougeon naturally became sole and absolute master of the town, and thus, strange to relate, the chief administrative authority fell into the hands of a man of indifferent repute, to whom on the previous evening not one of his fellow citizens would have lent a hundred francs. Pierre's first act was to declare the provisional commission en permanence. 
Fenny gave his attention to the organization of the National Guard and succeeded in raising 300 men. The 109 muskets left in the cart shed were also distributed to volunteers, thereby bringing up a number of men armed by the reactionary party to 150. The remaining 150 guards consisted of well-affected citizens and some of Sicardot's soldiers. When Commander Rudier reviewed the little army in front of a town hall, he was annoyed to see the market people smiling in their sleeves. The fact is that several of his men had no uniforms, and some of them looked very droll with their black hats, frock coats, and muskets. But at any rate, they meant well. A guard was left at the town hall, and the rest of the forces were sent in detachments to the various town gates. Rudier reserved to himself the command of the guard stationed at the Grand Porte, which seemed to be more liable to attack than the others. Rougeon, who now felt very conscious of his power, repaired to the Rue Quincoin to beg the gendarmes to remain in their barracks and interfere with nothing. He certainly had the doors of the gendarmerie opened, the keys having been carried off by the insurgents, but he wanted to triumph alone and had no intention of letting the gendarme rob him of any part of his glory. If he should really have need of them, he could always send for them. So he explained to them that their presence might tend to irritate the working men and thus aggravate the situation. The sergeant in command thereupon complimented him on his prudence. When Rougeon was informed that there was a wounded man in the barracks, he asked to see him by way of rendering himself popular. He found Rangard in bed with his eye bandaged and his big moustaches just peeping out from under the linen. With some high-sounding words about duty, Rougeon endeavored to comfort the unfortunate fellow who, having lost an eye, was swearing with exasperation at the thought that his injury would compel him to quit the service. At last, Rougeon promised to send the doctor to him. "'I'm much obliged to you, sir,' Rengard replied. "'But, you know, what would do me more good than any quantity of doctor stuff "'would be to wring the neck of the villain who put my eye out. "'Oh, I shall know him again. "'He's a little, thin, palish fellow, quite young.' "'Thereupon, Pierre bethought himself of the blood he'd seen on Silvère's hand. "'He stepped back a little.' as though he was afraid that Rangard would fly at his throat and cry, It was your nephew who blinded me, and you will have to pay for it. And whilst he was mentally cursing his disreputable family, he solemnly declared that if the guilty person were found, he should be punished with all the rigor of the law. No, no, it isn't worth all that trouble, the one-eyed man replied. I'll just wring his neck for him when I catch him. Rougeon hastened back to the town hall. The afternoon was employed in taking various measures. The proclamation posted up about one o'clock produced an excellent impression. It ended by an appeal to the good sense of the citizens and gave a firm assurance that order would not again be disturbed. Until dusk, in fact, the streets presented a picture of general relief and perfect confidence. On the pavements, the groups who were reading the proclamation exclaimed, it's all finished now. We shall soon see the troops who have been sent in pursuit of the insurgents. This belief that some soldiers were approaching was so general that the idols of the Cours Sauveur repaired to the Nice Road in order to meet and hear the regimental band. But they returned at nightfall disappointed, having seen nothing, and then a feeling of vague alarm began to disturb the townspeople. At the town hall, the Provisional Commission had talked so much without coming to any decision that the members, whose stomachs were quite empty, began to feel alarmed again. Rougeon dismissed them to dine, saying that they would meet afresh at nine o'clock in the evening. He was just about to leave the room himself when Macaw awoke and began to pummel the door of his prison. He declared he was hungry then asked what time it was, and when his brother had told him it was five o'clock, he feigned great astonishment and muttered, with diabolical malice, that the insurgents had promised to return much earlier, and that they were very slow in coming to deliver him. Rougeon, having ordered some food to be taken to him, went downstairs. 
quite worried by the earnestness with which the rascal spoke of the return of the insurgents. When he reached the street, his disquietude increased. The town seemed to him quite altered. It was assuming a strange aspect. Shadows were gliding along the footpaths, which were growing deserted and silent, while gloomy fear seemed like fine rain to be slowly, persistently falling with the dusk over the mournful-looking houses. The babbling confidence of a daytime was fatally terminating in groundless panic, in growing alarm as the night drew nearer. The inhabitants were so weary and so satiated with their triumph that they had no strength left but to dream of some terrible retaliation on the part of the insurgents. Rougeon shuddered as he passed through this current of terror. He hastened his steps, feeling as if he would choke. As he passed a café on the Place de Recollet, where the lamps had just been lit and where the petty sits of the new town were assembled, he heard a few words of terrifying conversation. "'Well, Monsieur Picou,' said one man in a thick voice, "'you've heard the news? The regiment that was expected has not arrived.' "'But nobody expected any regiment, Monsieur Touche,' a shrill voice replied. "'I beg your pardon. You haven't read the proclamation, then?' "'It's true the placards declared that order will be maintained by force, if necessary. "'You see, then, there's force mentioned. That means armed forces, of course.' "'What do people say, then?' Well, you know, folks are beginning to feel rather frightened. They say that this delay on the part of the soldiers isn't natural and that the insurgents may well have slaughtered them. A cry of horror resounded through the café. Rougeon was inclined to go in and tell those bourgeois that the proclamation had never announced the arrival of a regiment, that they had no right to strain its meaning to such a degree, nor to spread such foolish theories abroad. But he himself, amidst the disquietude which was coming over him, was not quite sure he had not counted upon a dispatch of troops, and he did in fact consider it strange that not a single soldier had made his appearance. So he reached home in a very uneasy state of mind. Felicité, still petulant and full of courage, became quite angry at seeing him upset by such silly trifles. Over the dessert she comforted him. "'Well, you great simpleton,' she said, "'so much the better if the prefect does forget us. "'We shall save the town by ourselves. "'For my part, I should like to see the insurgents return "'so that we might receive them with bullets "'and cover ourselves with glory. "'Listen to me. "'Go and have the gates closed and don't go to bed. "'Bustle about all night. "'It will all be taken into account later on.' Pierre returned to the town hall in rather more cheerful spirits. He required some courage to remain firm amidst the woeful maunderings of his colleagues. The members of the Provisional Commission seemed to reek with panic, just as they might with damp in the rainy season. They all professed to have counted upon the dispatch of a regiment and began to exclaim that brave citizens ought not to be abandoned in such a manner to the fury of the rabble. Pierre, to preserve peace, almost promised they should have a regiment on the morrow. Then he announced in a solemn manner that he was going to have the gates closed. This came as a relief. Detachments of the National Guards had to repair immediately to each gate and double lock it. When they had returned, several members confessed that they really felt more comfortable and when Pierre remarked that this critical situation of the town imposed upon them the duty of remaining at their posts, some of them made arrangements with the view of spending the night in an armchair. Grenou put on a black silk skull cap, which he'd brought with him by way of precaution. Towards eleven o'clock, half of the gentlemen were sleeping round Monsieur Garcinet's writing table. Those who still managed to keep their eyes open fancied as they listened to the measured tramp of the National Guards in the courtyard, but they were heroes and were receiving decorations. A large lamp placed on the writing table illumined this strange vigil. All at once, however, Rougeon, who had seemed to be slumbering, jumped up and sent for Vouillet. He had just remembered that he had not received the Gazette. The bookseller made his appearance in a very bad humor. "'Well?' 
Rougeon asked him as he took him aside. What about the article you promised me? I haven't seen the paper. Is that what you disturbed me for? Fouillet angrily retorted. The Gazette has not been issued. I've no desire to get myself murdered tomorrow should the insurgents come back. Rougeon tried to smile as he declared that, thank heaven, nobody would be murdered at all. It was precisely because false and disquieting rumors were running about that the article in question would have rendered great service to the good cause. Possibly, Bouillet resumed, but the best of causes at the present time is to keep one's head on one's shoulders. And he added with maliciousness, and as I was under the impression you killed all the insurgents, you've left too many of them for me to run any risk. Rougeon, when he was alone again, felt amazed at this mutiny on the part of a man who was usually so meek and mild. Bouillet's conduct seemed to him suspicious, but he had no time to seek an explanation. He'd scarcely stretched himself out afresh in his armchair when Roudier entered with a big saber, which he'd attached to his belt, clattering noisily against his legs. The sleepers awoke in a fright. Granou thought it was a call to arms. Eh? What? What's the matter? he asked, as he hastily put his black silk cap into his pocket. Gentlemen, said Roudier, breathlessly, without thinking of taking any oratorical precautions, I believe that a band of insurgents is approaching the town. These words were received with the silence of terror. Rougeon alone had the strength to ask, Have you seen them? No. The retired hosier replied, but we hear strange noises out in the country. One of my men assured me that he'd seen fires along the slopes of the Garrigue. Then, as all the gentlemen stared at each other, white and speechless, I return to my post, he continued. I fear an attack. You had better take precautions. Rougeon would have followed him to obtain further particulars, but he was already too far away. After this, the commission was by no means inclined to go to sleep again. Strange noises, fires, an attack, and in the middle of the night, too. It was very easy to talk of taking precautions, but what were they to do? Grenou was very near advising the course which had proved so successful the previous evening that is, of hiding themselves, waiting till the insurgents had passed through Plassans, and then triumphing in the deserted streets. Pierre, however, fortunately remembering his wife's advice, said that Roudier might have made a mistake, and that the best thing would be to go and see for themselves. Some of the members made a wry face at this suggestion, but when it had been agreed that an armed escort should accompany the commission, they all descended very courageously. They only left a few men downstairs. They surrounded themselves with about thirty of the National Guards, and then they ventured into the slumbering town, where the moon, creeping over the house roofs, slowly cast lengthened shadows. They went along the ramparts from one gate to the other, seeing nothing and hearing nothing. The National Guards at the various posts certainly told them that peculiar sounds occasionally reached them from the country through the closed gates. When they strained their ears, however, they detected nothing but a distant murmur, which Grenou said was merely the noise of the Viorne. Nevertheless, they remained doubtful, and they were about to return to the town hall in a state of alarm, though they made a show of shrugging their shoulders and of treating Rudier as a poltroon and a dreamer, when Rougeon, anxious to reassure them, thought of enabling them to view the plain over a distance of several leagues. Thereupon he led the little company to the Saint-Marc quarter and knocked at the door of the Valqueras mansion. At the very outset of the disturbances, Comte de Valqueras had left for his chateau at Corbières. There was no one but the Marquis de Carnavant at the Plassans house. He, since the previous evening, had prudently kept aloof, not that he was afraid, but because he did not care to be seen plotting with the Rougeon at the critical moment. As a matter of fact, he was burning with curiosity. 
he'd been compelled to shut himself up in order to resist the temptation of hastening to the yellow drawing room. When the footman came to tell him in the middle of the night that there were some gentlemen below asking for him, he could not hold back any longer. He got up and went downstairs in all haste. "'My dear Marquis,' said Rougeon, as he introduced to him the members of the Municipal Commission, "'we want to ask a favor of you. Will you allow us to go into the garden of the mansion?' "'By all means,' replied the astonished Marquis. "'I will conduct you there myself.' On the way thither he ascertained what their object was. At the end of the garden rose a terrace which overlooked the plain. A large portion of the ramparts had there tumbled in, leaving a boundless prospect to the view. It had occurred to Rougeon that this would serve as an excellent post of observation. While conversing together, the members of the commission leaned over the parapet. The strange spectacle that spread out before them soon made them silent. In the distance, in the valley of the Viorne, across the vast hollow which stretched westward between the chain of the Garrigue and the mountains of the Sei, the rays of the moon were streaming like a river of pale light. The clumps of trees, the gloomy rocks, looked here and there like islets in tongues of land emerging from a luminous sea. And according to the bends of the Viorne, one could now and again distinguish detached portions of the river, glittering like armor amidst the fine silvery dust falling from the firmament. It all looked like an ocean, a world magnified by the darkness, the cold, and their own secret fears. At first the gentlemen could neither hear nor see anything. The quiver of light and of distant sound blinded their eyes and confused their ears. Grenou, though he was not naturally poetic, was struck by the calm serenity of that winter night and murmured, What a beautiful night, gentlemen! Rudier was certainly dreaming, exclaimed Rougeon, rather disdainfully. But the Marquis, whose ears were quick, had begun to listen. Ah, he observed in his clear voice, I hear the tocsin. At this they all leant over the parapet, holding their breath and light and pure as crystal the distant tolling of a bell rose from the plain. The gentleman could not deny it. It was indeed the tocsin. Rougeon pretended that he recognized the bell of Béage, a village fully a league from Plessant. This, he said, in order to reassure his colleagues. But the Marquis interrupted him. Listen, listen. This time it is the bell of saint Maur and he indicated another point of the horizon to them. There was, in fact, a second bell wailing through the clear night. And very soon there were ten bells, twenty bells, whose despairing tollings were detected by their ears, which had by this time grown accustomed to the quivering of the darkness. Ominous calls rose from all sides, like the faint rattles of dying men. Soon the whole plain seemed to be wailing, the gentleman no longer jeered at Rudier, particularly as the Marquis, who took a malicious delight in terrifying them, was kind enough to explain the cause of all this bell ringing. It is the neighboring villages, he said to Rougeon, banding together to attack Plassan at daybreak. At this, Grenou opened his eyes wide. Didn't you see something just this moment over there? he asked all of a sudden. Nobody had looked. The gentlemen had been keeping their eyes closed in order to hear the better. Ah, look, he resumed after a short pause. There, beyond the Viorn, near that black mass. Yes, I see, replied Rougeon in despair. It's a fire they're kindling. A moment later, another fire appeared almost immediately in front of the first one, then a third and a fourth. In this wise, red splotches appeared at nearly equal distances throughout the whole length of the valley, resembling the lamps of some gigantic avenue. The moonlight, which dimmed their radiance, made them look like pools of blood. This melancholy illumination gave a finishing touch to the consternation of the municipal commission. Of course, the Marquis muttered with his bitterest sneer, those brigands are signaling to each other. 
and he counted the fires complacently to get some idea, he said, as to how many men the brave National Guard of Plassans would have to deal with. Rougeon endeavored to raise doubts by saying the villages were taking up arms in order to join the army of the insurgents and not for the purpose of attacking the town. But the gentlemen, by their silent consternation, made it clear that they'd formed their own opinion and were not to be consoled. I can hear the Marseillaise now, remarked Grenou in a hushed voice. It was indeed true. The detachment must have been following the course of the Viorne, passing at that moment just under the town. The cry, to arms, citizens, form your battalions, reached the onlookers in sudden bursts with vibrating distinctness. Ah, oh, what an awful night it was! The gentlemen spent it leaning over the parapet of a terrace, numbed by the terrible cold, and yet quite unable to tear themselves away from the sight of that plain which resounded with the tocsin and the Marseillaise and was all ablaze with signal fires. They feasted their eyes upon that sea of light flecked with blood-red flames, and they strained their ears in order to listen to the confused clamor, till at last their senses began to deceive them, and they saw and heard the most frightful things. Nothing in the world would have induced them to leave the spot. If they had turned their backs, they would have fancied that a whole army was at their heels. After the manner of a certain class of cowards, they wished to witness the approach of a danger, in order that they might take flight at the right moment. Towards morning, when the moon had set, and they could see nothing in front of them but a dark void, they fell into a terrible fright. They fancied they were surrounded by invisible enemies who were crawling along in the darkness, ready to fly at their throats. At the slightest noise, they imagined there were enemies deliberating beneath the terrace prior to scaling it. There was nothing, nothing but darkness upon which they fixed their eyes distractedly. The Marquis, as if to console them, said in his ironical way, don't be uneasy. They will certainly wait till daybreak. Meanwhile, Rougeon cursed and swore. He felt himself giving way to fear. As for Granou, his hair turned completely white. At last the dawn appeared with weary slowness. This again was a terribly anxious moment. The gentleman, at the first ray of light, expected to see an army drawn up in line before the town. It so happened that day that the dawn was lazy and lingered a while on the edge of the horizon. With outstretched necks and fixed gaze, the party on the terrace peered anxiously into the misty expanse. In the uncertain light, they fancied they caught glimpses of colossal profiles. The plain seemed to be transformed into a lake of blood. The rocks looked like corpses floating on its surface, and the clusters of trees took the forms of battalions drawn up in threatening attack. When the growing light had at last dispersed these phantoms, the morning broke so pale, so mournful, so melancholy, that even the Marquis' spirits sank. Not a single insurgent was to be seen, and the high roads were free. But the Grey Valley wore a gruesomely sad and deserted aspect. The fires had now gone out, but the bells still rang on. Towards eight o'clock, Rougeon observed a small party of men who were moving off along the Viorne. By this time, the gentlemen were half dead with cold and fatigue. Seeing no immediate danger, they determined to take a few hours' rest. A National Guard was left on the terrace as a sentinel, with orders to run and inform Rudier if he should perceive any band approaching in the distance. Then Grenou and Rougeon, quite worn out by the emotions of the night, repaired to their homes, which were close together, and supported each other on the way. Felicité put her husband to bed with every care. She called him poor dear and repeatedly told him that he ought not to give way to evil fancies and that all would end well. But he shook his head. He felt grave apprehensions. She let him sleep till eleven o'clock. Then, after he'd had something to eat, she gently turned him out of doors, making him understand that he must go through with the matter to the end. 
At the town hall, Rougeon found only four members of the commission in attendance. The others had sent excuses. They were really ill. Panic had been sweeping through the town with growing violence all through the morning. The gentlemen had not been able to keep quiet respecting the memorable night they had spent on the terrace of the Valquera mansion. Their servants had hastened to spread the news, embellishing it with various dramatic details. By this time it had already become a matter of history that from the heights of Plassans, troops of cannibals had been seen dancing and devouring their prisoners. Yes, Bands of witches had circled hand in hand round their cauldrons in which they were boiling children, while on and on marched endless files of bandits whose weapons glittered in the moonlight. People spoke, too, of bells that of their own accord sent the toxin ringing through the desolate air, and it was even asserted that the insurgents had fired the neighboring forests so that the whole countryside was in flames. It was Tuesday, the market day at Plassans, and Rudy had thought it necessary to have the gates opened in order to admit the few peasants who had brought vegetables, butter, and eggs. As soon as it had assembled the municipal commission, now composed of five members only, including its president, declared that this was unpardonable imprudence. Although the sentinel stationed at the Valkyra mansion had seen nothing, the town ought to have been kept closed. Then Rougeon decided that the public crier, accompanied by a drummer, should go through the streets, proclaim a state of siege, and announce to the inhabitants that whoever might go out would not be allowed to return. The gates were officially closed in broad daylight. This measure, adopted in order to reassure the inhabitants, raised the scare to its highest pitch, and there could scarcely have been a more curious sight than that of this little city thus padlocking and bolting itself up beneath the bright sunshine in the middle of the 19th century. When Plasson had buckled and tightened its belt of dilapidated ramparts, when it had bolted itself in like a besieged fortress at the approach of an assault, the most terrible anguish passed over the mournful houses. At every moment in the center of a town, people fancied they could hear a discharge of musketry in the Faubourg. They no longer received any news. They were, so to say, at the bottom of a cellar in a walled hole where they were anxiously awaiting either deliverance or the finishing stroke. For the last two days, the insurgents, who were scouring the country, had cut off all communication. Plassan found itself isolated from the rest of France. It felt that it was surrounded by a region in open rebellion, where the toxin was ever ringing and the Marseillaise was ever roaring like a river that has overflowed its banks. Abandoned to its fate and shuddering with alarm, the town lay there like some prey which would prove the reward of the victorious party. The strollers on the Cours Sauveur were ever swaying between fear and hope, according as they fancied they could see the blouses of insurgents or the uniforms of soldiers at the Grand Porte. Never had sub-prefecture, pent within tumble-down walls, endured more agonizing torture. Towards two o'clock, it was rumored that the coup d'etat had failed, that the prince president was imprisoned at Vincent, and that Paris was in the hands of the most advanced demagogues. It was reported also that Marseille, Toulon, Draguignan, the entire south belonged to the victorious insurrectionary army. The insurgents would arrive in the evening and put Plassans to the sword. Thereupon, a deputation repaired to the town hall to expostulate with the municipal commission for closing the gates, whereby they would only irritate the insurgents. Rougeon, who was losing his head, defended his order with all his remaining strength. This locking of the gates seemed to him one of the most ingenious acts of his administration. He advanced the most convincing arguments in its justification. But the others embarrassed him by their questions, asking him where were the soldiers, the regiment that he had promised. Then he began to lie and told them flatly that he'd promised nothing at all. The non-appearance of this legendary regiment, which the inhabitants longed for with such eagerness that they'd actually dreamt of its arrival, was the chief cause of the panic. 
Well-informed people even named the exact spot on the high road where the soldiers had been butchered. At four o'clock, Rougeon, followed by Granou, again repaired to the Valquera mansion. Small bands on their way to join the insurgents at Orcher still passed along in the distance through the valley of the Viorne. Throughout the day, urchins climbed the ramparts and bourgeois came to peep through the loopholes. These volunteer sentinels kept up the terror by counting the various bands which were taken for so many strong battalions. The timorous population fancied it could see from the battlements the preparations for some universal massacre. At dusk, as on the previous evening, the panic became yet more chilling. On returning to the municipal offices, Rougeon and his inseparable companion, Granou, recognized that the situation was growing intolerable. During their absence, another member of the commission had disappeared. They were only four now, and they felt they were making themselves ridiculous by staying there for hours, looking at each other's pale countenances and never saying a word. Moreover, they were terribly afraid of having to spend a second night on the terrace of the Valquera mansion. Rougeon gravely declared that as the situation of affairs was unchanged, there was no need for them to continue to remain there en permanence. If anything serious should occur, information would be sent to them. And by a decision duly taken in council, he deputed to Rudier the carrying on of the administration. Poor Rudier, who remembered that he had served as a national guard in Paris under Louis-Philippe, was meantime conscientiously keeping watch at the Grand Porte. Rougeon went home looking very downcast and creeping along under the shadows of the houses. He felt that Plassans was becoming hostile to him. He heard his name bandied about amongst the groups with expressions of anger and contempt. He walked upstairs, reeling and perspiring. Felicité received him with speechless consternation. She also was beginning to despair. Their dreams were being completely shattered. They stood silent face to face in the yellow drawing room. The day was drawing to a close, a murky winter day which imparted a muddy tint to the orange-colored wallpaper with its large flower pattern. Never had the room looked more faded, more mean, more shabby. And at this hour they were alone. They no longer had a crowd of courtiers congratulating them as on the previous evening. A single day it sufficed to topple them over, at the very moment when they were singing victory. If the situation did not change on the morrow, their game would be lost. Felicité, who when gazing on the previous evening at the ruins of the yellow drawing room, had thought of the plains of Austerlitz, now recalled the accursed field of Waterloo as she observed how mournful and deserted the place was. Then, as her husband said nothing, she mechanically went to the window that window where she had inhaled with delight the incense of the entire town. She perceived numerous groups below on the square, but she closed the blinds upon seeing some heads turn towards their house, for she feared that she might be hooted. She felt quite sure that those people were speaking about them. Indeed, voices rose through the twilight. A lawyer was clamoring in the tone of a triumphant pleader. That's just what I said. The insurgents left of their own accord, and they won't ask the permission of the 41 to come back. The 41, indeed. A fine farce. Why, I believe there were at least 200. No, indeed, said a burly trader, an oil dealer, and a great politician. There were probably not even ten. There was no fighting, or else we should have seen some blood in the morning. I went to the town hall myself to look. The courtyard was as clean as my hand. Then a workman who stepped timidly up to the group added, There was no need of any violence to seize the building. The door wasn't even shut. This remark was received with laughter, and the workman, thus encouraged, continued, As for those Rougeon, everybody knows that they're a bad lot. This insult pierced Felicité to the heart. 
the ingratitude of the people was heart-rending to her, for she herself was at last beginning to believe in the mission of the Rougeon. She called for her husband. She wanted him to hear how fickle was the multitude. It's all of a piece with their mirror, continued the lawyer. What a fuss they made about that broken glass. You know that Rougeon is quite capable of having fired his gun at it just to make believe there'd been a battle. Pierre restrained a cry of pain. What? They did not even believe in his mirror now. They would soon assert that he'd not heard a bullet whiz past his ear. The legend of the Rougeon would be blotted out. Nothing would remain of their glory. But his torture was not at an end yet. The groups manifested their hostility as heartily as they had displayed their approval on the previous evening. A retired hatter, an old man seventy years of age, whose factory had formerly been in the Faubourg, ferreted out the Rougeon's past history. He spoke vaguely, with the hesitation of a wandering memory, about the Fouquet's property and Adelaide and her amours with a smuggler. He said just enough to give a fresh start to the gossip. The tattlers drew closer together, and such words as rogues, thieves, and shameless intriguers ascended to the shutter, behind which Pierre and Felicite were perspiring with fear and indignation. The people on the square even went so far as to pity Macar. This was the final blow. On the previous day, Rougeon had been a Brutus, a stoic soul sacrificing his own affections to his country. Now he was nothing but an ambitious villain who felled his brother to the ground and made use of him as a stepping stone to fortune. You hear? You hear them, Pierre murmured in a stifled voice. Ah, the scoundrels! They're killing us! We shall never retrieve ourselves! Felicite, enraged, was beating a tattoo on the shutter with her impatient fingers. Let them talk, she answered. If we get the upper hand again, they shall see what stuff I'm made of. I know where the blow comes from. The new town hates us. She guessed rightly. The sudden unpopularity of the Rougeon was the work of a group of lawyers who were very much annoyed at the importance acquired by an old, illiterate oil dealer whose house had been on the verge of bankruptcy. The San Marc quarter had shown no sign of life for the last two days. The inhabitants of the old quarter and the new town alone remained in presence, and the latter had taken advantage of the panic to injure the yellow drawing room in the minds of the tradespeople and working classes. Rudier and Grenou were said to be excellent men, honorable citizens who'd been led away by the Rougeon's intrigues. Their eyes ought to be open to it. Ought not Monsieur Isidore Granou to be seated in the mayor's armchair in the place of that big portly beggar who had not a copper to bless himself with? Thus launched, the envious folks began to reproach Rougeon for all the acts of his administration, which only dated from the previous evening. He had no right to retain the services of the former municipal council. He'd been guilty of grave folly in ordering the gates to be closed. It was through his stupidity that five members of the commission had contracted inflammation of the lungs on the terrace of the Valcarvin mansion. There was no end to his faults. The Republicans likewise raised their heads. They talked of the possibility of a sudden attack upon the town hall by the workmen of the Faubourg. The reaction was at its last gasp. Pierre, at this overthrow of all his hopes, began to wonder what support he might still rely on if occasion should require any. Wasn't Aristide to come here this evening, he asked, to make it up with us? Yes, answered Felicite. He promised me a good article. The Independent has not appeared yet. But her husband interrupted her, crying, See, si, isn't that he who's just coming out of a sub-prefecture? The old woman glanced in that direction. He's got his arm in a sling again, she cried. Aristide's hand was indeed wrapped in the silk handkerchief once more. The empire was breaking up, but the republic was not yet triumphant, and he had judged it prudent to resume the part of a disabled man. He crossed the square stealthily without raising his head. 
then doubtless hearing some dangerous and compromising remarks among the groups of bystanders, he made all haste to turn the corner of the Rue de la Bain. Bah! He won't come here, said Felicité bitterly. It's all up with us. Even our children forsake us. She shut the window violently, in order that she might not see or hear anything more. When she'd lit the lamp, she and her husband sat down to dinner, disheartened and without appetite, leaving most of their food on their plates. They only had a few hours left them to take a decisive step. It was absolutely indispensable that before daybreak, Plasson should be at their feet beseeching forgiveness, or else they must entirely renounce the fortune which they had dreamed of. The total absence of any reliable news was the sole cause of their anxious indecision. Felicité, with her clear intellect, had quickly perceived this. If they had been able to learn the result of the coup d'etat, they would either have faced it out and have still pursued their role of deliverers, or else have done what they could to efface all recollection of their unlucky campaign. But they had no precise information. They were losing their heads. The thought that they were thus risking their fortune on a fro, in complete ignorance of what was happening, brought a cold perspiration to their brows. And why the devil doesn't Eugène write to me? Rougeon suddenly cried, in an outburst of despair, forgetting that he was betraying the secret of his correspondence to his wife. But Felicité pretended not to have heard. Her husband's exclamation had profoundly affected her. Why, indeed, did not Eugène write to his father? After keeping him so accurately informed of the progress of the Bonapartist cause, he ought at least to have announced the triumph or defeat of Prince Louis. Mere prudence would have counseled the dispatch of such information. If he remained silent, it must be that the victorious Republic had sent him to join the pretender in the dungeons of Vincent. At this thought, Felicité felt chill to the marrow. Her son's silence destroyed her last hopes. At that moment, somebody brought up the Gazette, which had only just appeared. Ah, said Pierre with surprise, Vuillet has issued his paper. Thereupon he tore off the wrapper, read the leading article, and finished it looking white as a sheet and swaying on his chair. Here, read, he resumed, handing the paper to Felicité. It was a magnificent article, attacking the insurgents with unheard-of violence. Never had so much stinging bitterness, so many falsehoods, such bigoted abuse flowed from pen before. Fouillet commenced by narrating the entry of the insurgents into Plassans. The description was a perfect masterpiece. He spoke of those bandits, those villainous-looking countenances, that scum of the galleys invading the town, intoxicated with brandy, lust, and pillage. Then he exhibited them parading their cynicism in the streets, terrifying the inhabitants with their savage cries and seeking only violence and murder. Further on, the scene at the town hall and the arrest of the authorities became a most horrible drama. Then they seized the most respectable people by the throat, and the mayor, the brave commander of the National Guard, the postmaster, that kindly functionary, were even like the divinity, crowned with thorns by those wretches who spat in their faces. The passage devoted to Miette and her red police was quite a flight of imagination. Fouillet had seen ten, twenty girls steeped in blood, and who, he wrote, did not belong among those monsters, some infamous creatures clothed in red, who must have bathed themselves in the blood of the martyrs murdered by the brigands along the high roads. They were brandishing banners and openly receiving the vile caresses of the entire horde. And Voye added, with biblical magniloquence, the Republic ever marches on amidst debauchery and murder. That, however, was only the first part of the article. The narrative being ended, the editor asked if the country would any longer tolerate the shamelessness of those wild beasts who respected neither property nor persons. 
He made an appeal to all valorous citizens, declaring that to tolerate such things any longer would be to encourage them, and that the insurgents would then come and snatch the daughter from her mother's arms, the wife from her husband's embraces. And at last, after a pious sentence in which he declared that heaven willed the extermination of the wicked, he concluded with this trumpet blast. It is asserted that these wretches are once more at our gates. Well, then, let each one of us take a gun and shoot them down like dogs. I, for my part, shall be seen in the front rank, happy to rid the earth of such vermin. This article, in which periphrastic abuse was strung together with all the heaviness of touch which characterizes French provincial journalism, quite terrified Rougeon who muttered as Felicité replaced the gazette on the table, Ah, the wretch! He's giving us the last blow. People believe that I inspired this diatribe. But, his wife remarked pensively, did you not this morning tell me that he absolutely refused to write against the Republicans? The news that circulated had terrified him, and he was as pale as death, you said. Yes. Yes, I can't understand it at all. When I insisted, he went so far as to reproach me for not having killed all the insurgents. It was yesterday that he ought to have written that article. Today he'll get us all butchered. Felicite was lost in amazement. What could have prompted Vuillet's change of front? The idea of that wretched semi-sacristan carrying a musket and firing on the ramparts of Plassans seemed to her one of the most ridiculous things imaginable. There was certainly some determining cause underlying all this which escaped her. Only one thing seemed certain. Vuillet was too impudent in his abuse and too ready with his valor for the insurrectionary band to be really so near the town as some people asserted. He's a spiteful fellow, I always said so, Rougeon resumed after reading the article again. He's only been waiting for an opportunity to do us this injury. What a fool I was to leave him in charge of the post office. This last sentence proved a flash of light. Felicite started up quickly as though at some sudden thought. Then she put on a cap and threw a shawl over her shoulders. Where are you going, pray? Her husband asked her with surprise. It's past nine o'clock. You go to bed, she replied rather brusquely. You're not well. Go and rest yourself. Sleep on till I come back. I'll wake you if necessary, and then we can talk the matter over. She went out with her usual nimble gait, ran to the post office, and abruptly entered the room where V.A. was still at work. On seeing her, he made a hasty gesture of vexation. Never in his life Vuillet felt so happy. Since he'd been able to slip his little fingers into the mailbag, he'd enjoyed the most exquisite pleasure, the pleasure of an inquisitive priest about to relish the confessions of his penitence. All the sly blabbing, all the vague chatter of sacristies resounded in his ears. He poked his long, pale nose into the letters, gazed amorously at the superscriptions with his suspicious eyes, Sound of the envelopes just like little abbeys sound the souls of maidens. He experienced endless enjoyment, was titillated by the most enticing temptation. The thousand secrets of Plassans lay there. He held in his hand the honor of women, the fortunes of men, and had only to break a seal to know as much as the grand vicar at the cathedral, who was the confidant of all the better people of the town. Vuillet was one of those terribly bitter, frigid gossips who worm out everything but never repeat what they hear, except by way of dealing somebody a mortal blow. He had consequently often longed to dip his arms into the public letterbox. Since the previous evening, the private room at the post office had become a big confessional full of darkness and mystery, in which he tasted exquisite rapture while sniffing at the letters which exhaled veiled longings and quivering avowals. Moreover, he carried on his work with consummate impudence. The crisis through which the country was passing secured him perfect impunity. If some letter should be delayed or others should miscarry altogether, 
It would be the fault of those villainous Republicans who were scouring the country and interrupting all communications. The closing of the town gates had for a moment vexed him, but he'd come to an understanding with Rudier, whereby the couriers were allowed to enter and bring the mails directly to him without passing by the town hall. As a matter of fact, he had only opened a few letters, the important ones, those in which his keen scent divined some information which it would be useful for him to know before anybody else. Then he contented himself by locking up in a drawer for delivery subsequently such letters as might give information and rob him of the merit of his valor at a time when the whole town was trembling with fear. This pious personage, in selecting the management of the post office as his own share of the spoils, had given proof of singular insight into the situation. When Madame Rougeau entered, he was taking his choice of a heap of letters under the pretext, no doubt, of classifying them. He rose with his humble smile and offered her a seat, his reddened eyes blinking rather uneasily. But Felicité did not sit down. She roughly exclaimed, I want the letter! At this, Fouillet's eyes opened widely with an expression of perfect innocence. What letter, madame? he asked. The letter you received this morning from my husband. Come, Monsieur Vouillet, I'm in a hurry. And as he stammered that he did not know that he'd not seen anything, that it was very strange, Felicité continued in a covertly threatening voice. A letter from Paris, from my son Eugène. You know what I mean, don't you? I look for it myself. Thereupon she stepped forward as if intending to examine the various packets which littered the writing table. But he at once bestirred himself and said he would go and see. The service was necessarily in great confusion. Perhaps indeed there might be a letter. In that case he would find it, but as far as he was concerned, he swore he had not seen any. While he was speaking, he moved about the office, turning over all the letters. Then he opened the drawers and the portfolios. Felicité waited, quite calm and collected. Yes, indeed, you're right. Here's a letter for you, he cried at last, and he took a few papers from a portfolio. Ah, oh, those confounded clerks. They take advantage of the situation to do nothing in the proper way. Felicité took the letter and examined the seal attentively, apparently quite regardless of the fact that such scrutiny might wound Vouillet's susceptibilities. She clearly perceived that the envelope must have been opened. The bookseller, in his unskillful way, had used some sealing wax of a darker color to secure it again. She took care to open the envelope in such a manner as to preserve the seal intact, so might it might serve as proof of this. Then she read the note. Eugène briefly announced the complete success of the coup d'état. Paris was subdued, the provinces, generally speaking, remained quiet, and he counseled his parents to maintain a very firm attitude in the face of the partial insurrection which was disturbing the South. In conclusion, he told them that the foundation of their fortune was laid if they did not weaken. Madame Rougeon put the letter in her pocket and sat down slowly, looking into Vouillet's face. The latter had resumed his sorting in a feverish manner, as though he were very busy. "'Listen to me, Monsieur Vouillet,' she said to him. And when he raised his head, "'Let us play our cards openly.' You do wrong to betray us. Some misfortune may befall you. If, instead of unsealing our letters, at this he protested and feigned great indignation, but she calmly continued, I know, I know your school, you never confess. Come, don't let us waste any more words. What interest have you in favoring the coup d'etat? And as he continued to assert his perfect honesty, she at last lost patience. "'You take me for a fool!' she cried. "'I've read your article. You would do much better to act in concert with us.' Thereupon, without avowing anything, he flatly submitted that he wished to have the custom of the college. Formerly it was he who had supplied that establishment with school books, but it had become known that he sold objectionable literature clandestinely to the students, 
for which reason indeed he'd almost been prosecuted at the correctional police court. Since then he had jealously longed to be received back into the good graces of the directors. Felicité was surprised at the modesty of his ambition and told him so. To open letters and risk the galleys just for the sake of selling a few dictionaries and grammars. Eh, he exclaimed in a shrill voice, it is an assured sale of four or five thousand francs a year. I don't aspire to impossibilities like some people. She did not take any notice of his last taunting words. No more was said about his opening the letters. A treaty of alliance was concluded, by which Vouillet engaged that he would not circulate any news or take any step in advance on condition that the Rougeons should secure him the custom of the college. As she was leaving, Felicité advised him not to compromise himself any further. It would be sufficient for him to detain the letters and distribute blame only on the second day. What a knave, she muttered when she reached the street, forgetting that she herself had just laid an interdict upon the mail. She went home slowly, wrapped in thought. She even went out of her way, passing along the Cours Sauvaire, as if to gain time and ease for reflection before going in. Under the trees of the promenade she met Monsieur de Carnavant, who was taking advantage of the darkness to ferret about the town without compromising himself. The clergy of Plessant, to whom all energetic action was distasteful, had, since the announcement of the coup d'etat, preserved absolute neutrality. In the priest's opinion, the empire was virtually established, and they awaited an opportunity to resume in some new direction their secular intrigues. The Marquis, who had now become a useless agent, remained only inquisitive on one point. He wished to know how the turmoil would finish, and in what manner the Rougeon would play their role to the end. "'Oh, it's you, little one!' he exclaimed, as soon as he recognized Felicité. "'I wanted to see you. Your affairs are getting muddled.' "'Oh, no. Everything is going all right,' she replied in an absent-minded way. So much the better. You'll tell me all about it, won't you? Ah, I must confess that I gave your husband and his colleagues a terrible fright the other night. You should have seen how comical they looked on the terrace while I was pointing out a band of insurgents in every cluster of trees in the valley. You forgive me. I'm much obliged to you, said Felicite quickly. You should have made them die of fright. My husband is a big sly boots. Come and see me some morning when I'm alone. Then she turned away as though this meeting with the Marquise had determined her. From head to foot, the whole of her little person betokened implacable resolution. At last, she was going to revenge herself on Pierre for his petty mysteries, have him under her heel, and secure once for all her omnipotence at home. They would be a fine scene. Quite a comedy, indeed, the points of which she was already enjoying in anticipation while she worked out her plan with all the spitefulness of an injured woman. She found Pierre in bed, sleeping heavily. She brought the candle near him for an instant and gazed with an air of compassion at his big face, across which slight twitches occasionally passed. Then she sat down at the head of the bed, took off her cap, let her hair fall loose, assumed the appearance of one in despair, and began to sob quite loudly. Hello, what's the matter? What are you crying for? asked Pierre, suddenly awaking. She did not reply, but cried more bitterly. Come, come, do answer, continued her husband, frightened by this mute despair. Where have you been? Have you seen the insurgents? She shook her head. Then, in a faint voice, she said, I've just come from the Valcara mansion. I wanted to ask Monsieur de Carnavant's advice. Ah, oh, my dear, all is lost. Pierre sat up in bed, very pale. His bull neck, which his unbuttoned nightshirt exposed to view, all his soft, flabby flesh seemed to swell with terror. At last he sank back, 
pale and tearful, looking like some grotesque Chinese figure in the middle of the untidy bed. The Marquise, continued Felicité, thinks that Prince Louis has succumbed. We are ruined. We shall never get a sou. Thereupon, as often happens with cowards, Pierre flew into a passion. It was the Marquis's fault. It was his wife's fault, the fault of all his family. Had he ever thought of politics at all until Monsieur de Carnavon and Felicité had driven him to that tomfoolery? I wash my hands of it altogether, he cried. It's you two who are responsible for the blunder. Wasn't it better to go on living on our little savings in peace and quietness? But then you were always determined to have your own way. You see what it has brought us to. He was losing his head completely and forgot that he'd shown himself as eager as his wife. However, his only desire now was to vent his anger by laying the blame of his ruin upon others. And moreover, he continued, could we ever have succeeded with children like ours? Eugène abandons us just at the critical moment. Aristide has dragged us through the mire. And even that big simpleton Pascal is compromising us with his philanthropic practicing among the insurgents. And to think that we brought ourselves to poverty simply to give them a university education. Then, as he drew breath, Felicité said to him softly, You are forgetting Macar. Ah, yes. I was forgetting him, he resumed more violently than ever. There's another whom I can't think of without losing all patience. But that's not all. You know little Silver. Well, I saw him at my mother's the other evening with his hands covered with blood. He's put some gendarme's eye out. I did not tell you of it as I didn't want to frighten you. But you'll see one of my nephews in the Assize Court. Ah, oh, what a family. As for Macart, he's annoyed us to such extent that I felt inclined to break his head for him the other day when I had a gun in my hand. Yes, I had a mind to do it. Felicité let the storm pass over. She had received her husband's reproaches with angelic sweetness, bowing her head like a culprit whereby she was able to smile in her sleeve. Her demeanor provoked and maddened Pierre. When speech failed the poor man, she heaved deep sighs, feigning repentance, and then she repeated in a disconsolate voice, Whatever shall we do? Whatever shall we do? We are over head and ears in debt. It's your fault, Pierre cried, with all his remaining strength. The Rougeon, in fact, owed money on every side. The hope of approaching success had made them forget all prudence. Since the beginning of 1851, they'd gone so far as to entertain the frequenters of the yellow drawing room every evening with syrup and punch and cakes, providing, in fact, complete collations at which they one and all drank to the death of the Republic. Besides this, Pierre had placed a quarter of his capital at the disposal of the reactionary party, as a contribution towards the purchase of guns and cartridges. The pastry cook's bill amounts to at least a thousand francs, Felicité resumed in her sweetest tone, and we probably owe twice as much to the liquor dealer. Then there's the butcher, the baker, the greengrocer. Pierre was in agony, and Felicité struck him a final blow by adding, I say nothing of the 10,000 francs you gave for the guns. I, I, he faltered, but I was deceived. I was robbed. It was that idiot Sicardo who let me in for that by swearing that the Napoleonists would be triumphant. I thought I was only making an advance. But the old dolt will have to repay me my money. Ah, you won't get anything back, said his wife, shrugging her shoulders. We shall suffer the fate of war. When we have paid off everything, we shan't even have enough to buy dry bread with. Ah, it's been a fine campaign. We can now go and live in some hovel in the old quarter. This last phrase had a most lugubrious sound. It seemed like the knell of their existence. Pierre pictured the hovel in the old quarter, which had just been mentioned by Felicité. T'was there, then, that he would die on a pallet, 
after striving all his life for the enjoyment of ease and luxury. In vain had he robbed his mother, steeped his hands in the foulest intrigues, and lied and lied for many a long year. The empire would not pay his debts, that empire which alone could save him. He jumped out of bed in his nightshirt, crying, No, I'll take my gun. I would rather let the insurgents kill me. Well, Felicite rejoined with great composure, you can have that done tomorrow or the day after. The Republicans are not far off, and that day will do as well as another to make an end of matters. Pierre shuddered. It seemed as if someone had suddenly poured a large pail of cold water over his shoulders. This ends Chapter 6, Part 2. Section 15 of The Fortune of the Rougeon, Book 1 of Rougeon Maca Cycle, by Emile Zola, translated by Henry Bizzatelli. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Mark Leder. Chapter 6, Part 3. He slowly got into bed again and when he was warmly wrapped up in the sheets, he began to cry. This fat fellow easily burst into tears, gently flowing, inexhaustible tears, which streamed from his eyes without an effort. A terrible reaction was now going on within him. After his wrath, he became as weak as a child. Felicité, who'd been waiting for this crisis, was delighted to see him so spiritless, so resourceless, and so humbled before her. She still preserved silence and an appearance of distressed humility. After a long pause, her seeming resignation, her mute dejection, irritated Pierre's nerves. But do something, he implored. Let us think matters over together. Is there really no hope left us? None. You know very well, she replied. You explained the situation yourself just now. We have no help to expect from anyone. Even our children have betrayed us. Let us flee, then. Shall we leave Plassan tonight, immediately? Flee? Why, my dear, tomorrow we should be the talk of the whole town. Don't you remember, too, that you have had the gates closed? A violent struggle was going on in Pierre's mind, which he exerted to the utmost in seeking for some solution. At last, as though he felt vanquished, he murmured in supplicating tones, I beseech you, do try to think of something. You haven't said anything yet. Felicité raised her head, feigning surprise, and with a gesture of complete powerlessness she said, I am a fool in these matters. I don't understand anything about politics. You've told me so a hundred times. And then, as her embarrassed husband held his tongue and lowered his eyes, she continued slowly, but not reproachfully, You have not kept me informed of your affairs, have you? I know nothing at all about them. I can't even give you any advice. It was quite right of you, though. Women chatter sometimes, and it is a thousand times better for the men to steer the ship alone. She said this with such refined irony that her husband did not detect that she was deriding him. He simply felt profound remorse. And all of a sudden he burst out into a confession. He spoke of Eugène's letters, explained his plans, his conduct, with all the loquacity of a man who is relieving his conscience and imploring a savior. At every moment he broke off to ask, What would you have done in my place? Or else he cried, Isn't that so? I was right. I could not act otherwise. But Felicité did not even deign to make a sign. She listened with all the frigid reserve of a judge. In reality, she was tasting the most exquisite pleasure. She'd got that sly boots fast at last. She played with him like a cat playing with a ball of paper, 
and he virtually held out his hands to be manacled by her. But wait, he said hastily, jumping out of bed. I'll give you Eugène's correspondence to read. You can judge the situation better then. She vainly tried to hold him back by his nightshirt. He spread out the letters on the table by the bedside, and then got into bed again and read whole pages of them, and compelled her to go through them herself. She suppressed a smile and began to feel some pity for the poor man. Well, he said anxiously when he'd finished, now you know everything. Do you see any means of saving us from ruin? She still gave no answer. She appeared to be pondering deeply. You are an intelligent woman, he continued, in order to flatter her. I did wrong in keeping any secret from you. I see it now. Let us say nothing more about that, she replied. In my opinion, if you had enough courage... And as he looked at her eagerly, she broke off and said with a smile, But you promise not to distrust me any more? You will tell me everything, eh? You'll do nothing without consulting me. He swore and accepted the most rigid conditions. Felicite then got into bed, and in a whisper, as if she feared somebody might hear them, she explained at length her plan of campaign. In her opinion, the town must be allowed to fall into still greater panic, while Pierre was to maintain an heroic demeanor in the midst of a terrified inhabitants. A secret presentiment, she said, warned her that the insurgents were still at a distance. Moreover, the party of order would sooner or later carry the day, and the Rougeons would be rewarded. After the role of deliverer, that of martyr was not to be despised. And she argued so well and spoke with so much conviction that her husband, surprised at first by the simplicity of her plan, which consisted in facing it out, at last detected in it a marvelous tactical scheme and promised to conform to it with the greatest possible courage. And don't forget that it is I who am saving you, the old woman murmured in a coaxing tone. Will you be nice to me? They kissed each other and said good night. But neither of them slept. After a quarter of an hour had gone by, Pierre, who'd been gazing at the round reflection of a night lamp on the ceiling, turned and in a faint whisper told his wife of an idea that had just occurred to him. Oh, no, no, Felicite murmured with a shudder. That would be too cruel. Well, he resumed, but you want to spread consternation among the inhabitants? They would take me seriously if what I told you should occur. Then, perfecting his scheme, he cried, We might employ Makar. That would be a means of getting rid of him. Felicite seemed to be struck with the idea. She reflected, seemed to hesitate, and then, in a distressful tone, faltered, Perhaps you are right. We must see. After all, we should be very stupid if we were over-scrupulous, for it's a matter of life and death to us. Let me do it. I'll see McCart tomorrow and ascertain if we can come to an understanding with him. You would only wrangle and spoil all. Good night. Sleep well, my poor dear. Our troubles will soon be ended, you'll see. They again kissed each other and fell asleep. The patch of light on the ceiling now seemed to be assuming the shape of a terrified eye that stared wildly and fixedly upon the pale, slumbering couple who reeked with crime beneath their very sheets and dreamt they could see a rain of blood falling in big drops which turned into golden coins as they plashed upon the floor. On the morrow, before daylight, Felicite repaired to the town hall, armed with instructions from Pierre to seek an interview with Macar. She took her husband's National Guard uniform with her, wrapped in a cloth. There were only a few men fast asleep in the guardhouse. The doorkeeper, who was entrusted with the duty of supplying Macar with food, went upstairs with her to open the door of a dressing room, which had been turned into a cell. 
Then, quietly, he came down again. McCart had now been kept in the room for two days and two nights. He had had time to indulge in lengthy reflections. After his sleep, his first hours had been given up to outbursts of impotent rage. Goaded by the idea that his brother was lording it in the adjoining room, he'd felt a great longing to break the door open. At all events, he would strangle Rujon with his own hands as soon as the insurgents should return and release him. But in the evening, at twilight, he calmed down and gave over striding furiously round the little room. He inhaled a sweet odor there. A feeling of comfort relaxed his nerves. Monsieur Garcinet, who was very rich, refined, and vain, had caused this little room to be arranged in a very elegant fashion. The sofa was soft and warm, scents, pomades, and soaps adorned the marble washstand, and the pale light fell from the ceiling with a soft glow, like the gleams of a lamp suspended in an alcove. McCart, amidst this perfumed, soporific atmosphere, fell asleep, thinking that those scoundrels, the rich, were very fortunate all the same. He covered himself with a blanket which had been given to him, and with his head and back and arms reposing on the cushions, he stretched himself out on the couch until morning. When he opened his eyes, a ray of sunshine was gliding through the opening above. Still he did not leave the sofa. He felt warm and lay thinking as he gazed around him. He bethought himself that he would never again have such a place to wash in. The washstand particularly interested him. It was by no means hard, he thought, to keep oneself spruce when one had so many little pots and files at one's disposal. This made him think bitterly of his own life of privation. The idea occurred to him that perhaps he'd been on the wrong track. There's nothing to be gained by associating with beggars. He ought to have played the scamp. He should have acted in concert with the Rougeons. Then, however, he rejected this idea. The Rougeons were villains who'd robbed him. But the warmth and softness of the sofa continued to work upon his feelings and fill him with vague regrets. After all, the insurgents were abandoning him and allowing themselves to be beaten like idiots. Eventually, he came to the conclusion that the Republic was mere dupery. Those Rougeons were lucky and he recalled his own bootless wickedness and underhand intrigues. Not one member of the family had ever been on his side, neither Aristide, nor Silver's brother, nor Silver himself, who was a fool to grow so enthusiastic about the Republic and would never do any good for himself. Then McCart reflected that his wife was dead, that his children had left him, and that he would die alone like a dog in some wretched corner without a copper to bless himself with. Decidedly, he ought to have sold himself to the reactionary party. Pondering in this fashion, he eyed the washstand, feeling a strong inclination to go and wash his hands with a certain powder soap which he saw in a glass jar. Like all lazy fellows who live upon their wives or children, he had foppish tastes. Although he wore patched trousers, he liked to inundate himself with aromatic oil. He spent hours with his barber, who talked politics, and brushed his hair for him between their discussions. So, at last, the temptation became too strong, and McCart installed himself before the washstand. He washed his hands and face, dressed his hair, perfumed himself, in fact went through a complete toilet. He made use in turn of all the bottles, all the various soaps and powders, but his greatest pleasure was to dry his hands with the mayor's towels, which were so soft and thick. He buried his wet face in them and inhaled with delight all the odor of wealth. Then, having pomaded himself and smelling sweetly from head to foot, he once more stretched himself on the sofa, feeling quite youthful again and disposed to the most conciliatory thoughts. 
he felt yet greater contempt for the Republic since he dipped his nose into Monsieur Garcinet's files. The idea occurred to him that there was, perhaps, still time for him to make peace with his brother. He wondered what he might well ask in return for playing the traitor. His rancor against the Rougeons still gnawed at his heart, but he was in one of those moods when, lying on one's back in silence, one is apt to admit stern facts and scold oneself for neglecting to feather a comfortable nest in which one may wallow in slothful ease, even at the cost of relinquishing one's most cherished animosities. Towards evening, Antoine determined to send for his brother on the following day. But when, in the morning, he saw Felicité enter the room, he understood that his aid was wanted. So he remained on his guard. The negotiations were long and full of pitfalls, being conducted on either side with infinite skill. At first they both indulged in vague complaints. Then Felicité, who was surprised to find Macart almost polite after the violent manner in which he'd behaved at her house on the Sunday evening, assumed a tone of gentle reproach. She deplored the hatred which severed their families, but in truth he had so calumniated his brother and manifested such bitter animosity towards him that he had made poor Rougeon quite lose his head. But dash it, my brother has never behaved like a brother to me, McCart replied with restrained violence. Has he ever given me any assistance? He would have let me die in my hovel when he behaved differently towards me. You remember, at the time he gave me two hundred francs. I am sure no one can reproach me with having said a single unpleasant word about him. I said everywhere that he was a very good-hearted fellow. This clearly signified, if you would continue to supply me with money, I should have been very pleasant towards you and would have helped you, instead of fighting against you. It's your own fault. You ought to have bought me. Felicité understood this so well that she replied, I know you have accused us of being hard upon you because you imagine we are in comfortable circumstances, but you are mistaken, my dear brother. We are poor people. We've never been able to act towards you as our hearts would have desired. She hesitated a moment and then continued, if it were absolutely necessary in some serious contingency, we might perhaps be able to make a sacrifice. But truly, we are very poor, very poor. McCart pricked up his ears. I have them, he thought. Then, without appearing to understand his sister-in-law's indirect offer, he detailed the wretchedness of his life in a doleful manner and spoke of his wife's death and his children's flight. Felicité, on her side, referred to the crisis through which the country was passing and declared that the Republic had completely ruined them. Then, from word to word, she began to bemoan the exigencies of a situation which compelled one brother to imprison another. How their hearts would bleed if justice refused to release its prey. And finally she let slip the word, galleys. Bah! I defy you, said McCart calmly. But she hastily exclaimed, Oh, I would rather redeem the honor of the family with my own blood. I tell you all this to show you that we shall not abandon you. I have come to give you the means of effecting your escape, my dear Antoine. They gazed at each other for a moment, sounding each other with a look, before engaging in the contest. Unconditionally, he asked at length. Without any condition, she replied. Then she sat down beside him on the sofa and continued in a determined voice. And even before crossing the frontier, if you want to earn a thousand franc note, I can put you in the way of doing so. There was another pause. If it's all above board, I shall have no objection. Antoine muttered, apparently reflecting. 
You know I don't want to mix myself up with your underhand dealings. But there are no underhand dealings about it, Felicite resumed, smiling at the old rascal's scruples. Nothing can be more simple. You will presently leave this room and go and conceal yourself in your mother's house. And this evening you can assemble your friends and come and seize the town hall again. McCart did not conceal his extreme surprise. He did not understand it at all. I thought, he said, that you were victorious. Oh, I haven't got time now to tell you all about it, the old woman replied somewhat impatiently. Do you accept or not? Well, no, I don't accept. I want to think it over. It would be very stupid of me to risk a possible fortune for a thousand francs. Felicite rose. Just as you like, my dear fellow, she said coldly. You don't seem to realize the position you are in. You came to my house and treated me as though I were a mere outcast, and then when I'm kind enough to hold out a hand to you in the hole into which you have stupidly let yourself fall, you stand on ceremony and refuse to be rescued. Well then, stay here. Wait till the authorities come back. As for me, I wash my hands of the whole business. With these words she reached the door. But give me some explanations, he implored. I can't strike a bargain with you in perfect ignorance of everything. For two days past I've been quite in the dark as to what's going on. How do I know that you are not cheating me? Bah! You're a simpleton, replied Felicite, who had retraced her steps at Antoine's doleful appeal. You are very foolish not to trust yourself implicitly to us. A thousand francs! That's a fine sum, a sum that one would only risk in a winning cause. I advise you to accept. He still hesitated. But when we want to seize the place... Shall we be allowed to enter quietly? Ah, I don't know, she said with a smile. There will perhaps be a shot or two fired. He looked at her fixedly. Well, but I say, little woman, he resumed in a hoarse voice, you don't intend, do you, to have a bullet lodged in my head? Felicite blushed. She was, in fact, just thinking that they would be rendered a great service if, during the attack on the town hall, a bullet should rid them of Antoine. It would be a gain of a thousand francs, besides all the rest. So she muttered with irritation, What an idea! Really, it's abominable to think such things! Then, suddenly calming down, she added, Do you accept? You understand now, don't you? McCart had understood perfectly. It was an ambush that they were proposing to him. He did not perceive the reasons or the consequences of it, and this was what induced him to haggle. After speaking of the Republic as though it were a mistress whom, to his great grief, he could no longer love, he recapitulated the risks which he would have to run, and finished by asking for two thousand francs. But Felicite abided by her original offer. They debated the matter until she promised to procure him, on his return to France, some post in which he would have nothing to do and which would pay him well. The bargain was then concluded. She made him don the uniform she'd brought with her. He was to betake himself quietly to Aunt Dides and afterwards, towards midnight, assemble all the Republicans he could in the neighborhood of a town hall, telling them that the municipal officers were unguarded and that they had only to push open the door to take possession of them. Antoine then asked for earnest money and received two hundred francs. Felicite undertook to pay the remaining eight hundred on the following day. The Rougeons were risking the last sum they had at their disposal. When Felicité had gone downstairs, she remained on the square for a moment to watch McCart go out. He passed the guardhouse, quietly blowing his nose. 
He'd previously broken the skylight in the dressing room to make it appear that he'd escaped that way. It's all arranged, Felicite said to her husband when she returned home. It will be at midnight. It doesn't matter to me at all now. I should like to see them all shot. How they slandered us yesterday in the street. It was rather silly of you to hesitate, replied Pierre, who was shaving. Everyone would do the same in our place. That morning, it was a Wednesday, he was particularly careful about his toilet. His wife combed his hair and tied his cravat, turning him about like a child going to a distribution of prizes. And when he was ready, she examined him, declared that he looked very nice, and that he would make a very good figure in the midst of the serious events that were preparing. His big, pale face wore an expression of grave dignity and heroic determination. She accompanied him to the first landing, giving him her last advice. He was not to depart in any way from his courageous demeanor, however great the panic might be. He was to have the gates closed more hermetically than ever and leave the town in agonies of terror within its ramparts. It would be all the better if he were to appear the only one willing to die for the cause of order. What a day it was! The Rougeons still speak of it as a glorious and decisive battle. Pierre went straight to the town hall, heedless of the looks or words that greeted him on his way. He installed himself there in magisterial fashion, like a man who did not intend to quit the place whatever might happen. And he simply sent a note to Rudier to advise him that he was resuming authority. Keep watch at the gates, he added, knowing that these lines might become public. I myself will watch over the town and ensure the security of life and property. It is at the moment when evil passions reappear and threaten to prevail that good citizens should endeavor to stifle them, even at the peril of their lives. The style and the very errors in spelling made this note, the brevity of which suggested the laconic style of the ancients, appear all the more heroic. Not one of the gentlemen of the Provisional Commission put in an appearance. The last two who had hitherto remained faithful and Grenoux himself even, prudently stopped at home. Thus, Rougeon was the only member of the commission who remained at his post, in his presidential armchair, all the others having vanished as the panic increased. He did not even deign to issue an order summoning them to attend. He was there, and that sufficed, a sublime spectacle which a local journal depicted later on in a sentence, Courage giving the hand to duty. During the whole morning, Pierre was seen animating the town hall with his goings and comings. He was absolutely alone in the large empty building whose lofty halls re-echoed with the noise of his heels. All the doors were left open. He made an ostentatious show of his presidency over a non-existent council in the midst of this desert and appeared so deeply impressed with the responsibility of his mission that the doorkeeper, meeting him two or three times in the passages, bowed to him with an air of mingled surprise and respect. He was seen, too, at every window, and in spite of the bitter cold, he appeared several times on the balcony with bundles of papers in his hands, like a busy man attending to important dispatches. Then... Towards noon, he passed through the town and visited the guardhouses. Speaking of a possible attack and letting it be understood that the insurgents were not far off, but he relied, he said, on the courage of the brave National Guards. If necessary, they must be ready to die to the last man for the defense of the good cause. When he returned from this round, slowly and solemnly, after the manner of a hero who has set the affairs of his country in order and now only awaits death, he observed signs of perfect stupor along his path. The people promenading in the cour, the incorrigible little householders, whom no catastrophe would have prevented from coming at certain hours to bask in the sun, looked at him in amazement as if they did not recognize him and could not believe that one of their own set, a former oil dealer, should have the boldness to face a whole army. 
In the town, the anxiety was at its height. The insurrectionists were expected every moment. The rumor of McCart's escape was commenced upon in a most alarming manner. It was asserted that he'd been rescued by his friends, the Reds, and that he was only waiting for nighttime in order to fall upon the inhabitants and set fire to the four corners of the town. Plassant, closed in and terror-stricken, gnawing at its own vitals within its prison-like walls, no longer knew what to imagine in order to frighten itself. The Republicans, in the face of Rougeon's bold demeanor, felt for a moment distrustful. As for the new town, the lawyers and retired tradespeople who had denounced the yellow drawing room on the previous evening, they were so surprised that they dared not again openly attack such a valiant man. They contented themselves with saying, it was madness to brave victorious insurgents like that, and such useless heroism would bring the greatest misfortunes upon Plassan. Then, at about three o'clock, they organized a deputation. Pierre, though he was burning with desire to make a display of his devotion before his fellow citizens, had not ventured to reckon upon such a fine opportunity. He spoke sublimely. It was in the mayor's private room that the president of the Provisional Commission received the deputation from the new town. The gentleman of the deputation, after paying homage to his patriotism, besought him to forego all resistance. But he, in a loud voice, talked of duty, of his country, of order, of liberty, and various other things. Moreover, he did not wish to compel anyone to imitate him. He was simply discharging a duty which his conscience and his heart dictated to him. "'You see, gentlemen, I am alone,' he said in conclusion. I will take all the responsibility so that nobody but myself may be compromised. And if a victim is required, I willingly offer myself. I wish to sacrifice my own life for the safety of the inhabitants. A notary, the wiseacre of the party, remarked that he was running to certain death. I know it, he resumed solemnly. I am prepared. The gentlemen looked at each other. Those words, I am prepared, filled them with admiration. Decidedly, this man was a brave fellow. The notary implored him to call in the aid of a gendarme, but he replied that the blood of those brave soldiers was precious, and he would not have it shed except in the last extremity. The deputation slowly withdrew, feeling deeply moved. An hour afterwards, Plasson was speaking of Rougeon as of a hero. The most cowardly called him an old fool. Towards evening, Rougeon was much surprised to see Grenu hasten to him. The old almond dealer threw himself in his arms, calling him great man and declaring that he would die with him. The words, I am prepared, which had just been reported to him by his maidservant, who had heard it at the greengrocer's, had made him quite enthusiastic. There was charming naivete in the nature of this grotesque, timorous old man. Pierre kept him with him, thinking that he would not be of much consequence. He was even touched by the poor fellow's devotion, and resolved to have him publicly complimented by the prefect, in order to rouse the envy of the other citizens who had so cowardly abandoned him and so both of them awaited the night in the deserted building. At the same time, Aristide was striding about at home in an uneasy manner. Fouillet's article had astonished him. His father's demeanor stupefied him. He had just caught sight of him at the window, in a white cravat and black frock coat, so calm at the approach of danger that all his ideas were upset. Yet the insurgents were coming back triumphant. That was the belief of the whole town. But Aristide felt some doubts on the point. He had suspicions of some lugubrious farce. As he did not dare to present himself at his parents' house, he sent his wife thither. And when Angèle returned, she said to him in her drawling voice, 
Your mother expects you. She's not angry at all. She seems rather to be making fun of you. She told me several times that you could just put your sling back in your pocket. Aristide felt terribly vexed. However, he ran to the Rue de Laban, prepared to make the most humble submission. His mother was content to receive him with scornful laughter. Ah, my poor fellow, said she, you're certainly not very shrewd. But what can one do in a hole like Plassan? he angrily retorted. On my word of honor, I'm becoming a fool here. No news and everybody shivering. That's what it is to be shut up in these villainous ramparts. Ah, if I had only been able to follow Eugène to Paris. Then, seeing that his mother was still smiling, he added bitterly, You haven't been very kind to me, mother. I know many things, I do. My brother kept you informed of what was going on, and you've never given me the faintest hint that might have been useful to me. You know that, do you? exclaimed Felicite, becoming serious and distrustful. Well, you're not so foolish as I thought, then. Do you open letters like some one of my acquaintance? No, but I listen at doors, Aristide replied with great assurance. This frankness did not displease the old woman. She began to smile again and asked more softly, Well, then, you blockhead, how is it you didn't rally to us sooner? Ah, that's where it is, the young man said, with some embarrassment. I didn't have much confidence in you. You received such idiots, my father-in-law, Grenou, and the others. And then I didn't want to go too far. He hesitated and then resumed with some uneasiness. Today, you are at least quite sure of the success of the coup d'etat, aren't you? I cried Felicite wounded by her son's doubts. No, I'm not sure of anything. And yet you sent word to say that I was to take off my sling. Yes, because all the gentlemen are laughing at you. Aristide remained stock still, apparently contemplating one of the flowers on the orange-colored wallpaper. And his mother felt sudden impatience as she saw him hesitating thus. Ah, well, she said, I've come back again to my former opinion. You're not very shrewd. And you think you ought to have had Eugène's letters to read? Why, my poor fellow, you would have spoilt everything with your perpetual vacillation. You never can make up your mind. You are hesitating now. I hesitate, he interrupted, giving his mother a cold, keen glance. Ah, well, you don't know me. I would set the whole town on fire if it were necessary, and I wanted to warm my feet. But understand me, I've no desire to take the wrong road. I'm tired of eating hard bread, and I hope to play fortune a trick. But I only play for certainties. He spoke these words so sharply, with such a keen longing for success, that his mother recognized the cry of her own blood. Your father is very brave, she whispered. Yes, I've seen him, he resumed with a sneer. He's got a fine look on him. He reminded me of Leonidas at Thermopylae. Is it you, mother, who've made him cut this figure? And he added cheerfully with a gesture of determination. Well, so much the worse. I'm a Bonapartist. Father is not the man to risk the chance of being killed unless it pays him well. You're quite right, his mother replied. I mustn't say anything, but tomorrow you'll see. He did not press her, but swore that she would soon have reason to be proud of him. And then he took his departure, while Felicite, feeling her old preference reviving, said to herself at the window where she watched him going off, that he had the devil's own wit that she would never have had sufficient courage to let him leave without setting him in the right path. And now for the third time, a night full of anguish fell upon Plassans. The unhappy town was almost at its death rattle. 
The citizens hastened home and barricaded their doors with great clattering of iron bolts and bars. The general feeling seemed to be that, by the morrow, Plassan would no longer exist, that it would either be swallowed up by the earth or would evaporate in the atmosphere. When Rougeon went home to dine, he found the streets completely deserted. This desolation made him sad and melancholy. As a result of this, when he had finished his meal, he felt some slight misgivings and asked his wife if it were necessary to follow up the insurrection that McCart was preparing. "'Nobody will run us down now,' said he. "'You should have seen those gentlemen of the new town, how they bowed to me. It seems to me quite unnecessary now to kill anybody. Eh, what do you think? We shall feather our nest without that.' "'Ah, what a nerveless fellow you are!' Felicite cried angrily. "'It was your own idea to do it, and now you back out. "'I tell you that you'll never do anything without me. "'Go then, go your own way. "'Do you think the Republicans would spare you if they got hold of you?' Rougeon went back to the town hall and prepared for the ambush. Grenou was very useful to him. He dispatched him with orders to the different posts guarding the ramparts. The National Guards were to repair to the town hall in small detachments as secretly as possible. Rudier, that bourgeois who was quite out of his element in the provinces, and who would have spoilt the whole affair with his humanitarian preaching, was not even informed of it. Towards eleven o'clock the courtyard of the town hall was full of National Guards. Then Rougeon frightened him. He told them that the Republicans still remaining in Plassans were about to attempt a desperate coup de main and plumed himself on having been warned by his secret police. When he had pictured the bloody massacre which would overtake the town should these wretches get the upper hand, he ordered his men to cease speaking and extinguish all lights. He took a gun himself. Ever since the morning he'd been living as in a dream. He no longer knew himself. He felt Felicité behind him. The crisis of the previous night had thrown him into her hands, and he would have allowed himself to be hanged, thinking, It does not matter. My wife will come and cut me down. To augment the tumult and prolong the terror of the slumbering town, he begged Grenou to repair to the cathedral and have the toxin rung at the first shots he might hear. The Marquis's name would open the beadle's door. And then... In darkness and dismal silence, the National Guards waited in the yard, in a terrible state of anxiety, their eyes fixed on the porch, eager to fire, as though they were lying in wait for a pack of wolves. In the meantime, McCart had spent the day at Aunt Day's house. Stretching himself on the old coffer and lamenting the loss of Monsieur Garcinet's sofa, he had several times felt a mad inclination to break into his two hundred francs at some neighboring café. This money was burning a hole in his waistcoat pocket. However, he whiled away his time by spending it in imagination. His mother moved about in her stiff, automatic way, as if she were not even aware of his presence. During the last few days, her children had been coming to her rather frequently, in a state of pallor and desperation, but she departed neither from her taciturnity nor her stiff, lifeless expression. She knew nothing of the fears which were throwing the pent-up town topsy-turvy. She was a thousand leagues away from Plassans, soaring into the one constant fixed idea which imparted such a blank stare to her eyes. Now and again, however, at this particular moment, some feeling of uneasiness, some Human anxiety occasionally made her blink. Antoine, unable to resist the temptation of having something nice to eat, sent her to get a roast chicken from an eating house in the Faubourg. When it was set on the table, Hey, he said to her, you don't often eat fowl, do you? It's only for those who work, and I know how to manage their affairs. As for you, you always squandered everything. I bet you're giving all your savings to that little hypocrite Silver. He's got a mistress, the sly fellow. If you've a hoard of money hidden in some corner, he'll ease you of it nicely some day. 
McCart was in a jesting mood, glowing with wild exultation. The money he had in his pocket, the treachery he was preparing, the conviction that he'd sold himself at a good price, all filled him with the self-satisfaction characteristic of vicious people who naturally became merry and scornful amidst their evil practices. Of all his talk, however, Auntie Day only heard Silver's name. Have you seen him? she asked, opening her lips at last. Who? Silver? Antoine replied. He was walking about among the insurgents with a tall red girl on his arm. It'll serve him right if he gets into trouble. The grandmother looked at him fixedly, then in a solemn voice inquired, Why? Eh? Why, he shouldn't be so stupid, resumed McCart, feeling somewhat embarrassed. People don't risk their necks for the sake of ideas. I've settled my own little business. I'm no fool. But Auntie Day was no longer listening to him. She was murmuring, He had his hands covered with blood. They'll kill him like the other one. His uncles will send the gendarme after him. What are you muttering there? asked her son, as he finished picking the bones of a chicken. You know I like people to accuse me to my face. If I have sometimes talked to the little fellow about the Republic, it was only to bring him round to a more reasonable way of thinking. He was dotty. I love liberty myself, but it mustn't degenerate into license. And as for Rougeon, I esteem him. He's a man of courage and common sense. He had the gun, hadn't he? interrupted Aunt Day, whose wandering mind seemed to be following Silver far away along the high road. The gun? Ah, yes, McCart's carbine, continued Antoine, after casting a glance at the mantel shelf where the firearm was usually hung. I fancy I saw it in his hands. A fine instrument to scour the country with when one has a girl on one's arm. What a fool! Then he thought he might as well indulge in a few coarse jokes. Auntie Day had begun to bustle about the room again. She did not say a word. Towards the evening, Antoine went out after putting on a blouse and pulling over his eyes a big cap which his mother had bought for him. He returned into the town in the same manner as he'd quitted it, by relating some nonsensical story to the National Guards who were on duty at the Rome Gate. Then he made his way to the old quarter, where he crept from house to house in a mysterious manner. All the Republicans of advanced views, all the members of the Brotherhood who had not followed the insurrectionary army, met in an obscure inn where McCart had made an appointment with them. When about fifty men were assembled, he made a speech, in which he spoke of personal vengeance that must be wreaked, of a victory that must be gained, and of a disgraceful yoke that must be thrown off. And he ended by undertaking to deliver the town hall over to them in ten minutes. He had just left it. It was quite unguarded, he said, and the red flag would wave over it that very night if they so desired. The workmen deliberated. At that moment, the reaction seemed to be in its death throes. The insurgents were virtually at the gates of a town. It would therefore be more honorable to make an effort to regain power without awaiting their return, so as to be able to receive them as brothers, with the gates wide open and the streets and squares adorned with flags. Moreover, none of those present distrusted McCart. His hatred of the Rougeon, the personal vengeance of which he spoke, could be taken as guaranteeing his loyalty. It was arranged that each of them who was a sportsman and had a gun at home should fetch it, and that the band should assemble at midnight in the neighborhood of a town hall. A question of detail very nearly put an end to their plans. They had no bullets. However, they decided to load their weapons with small shot, and even that seemed unnecessary, as they were told that they would meet with no resistance. Once more, Plasson beheld a band of armed men filing along close to the houses in the quiet moonlight. When the band was assembled in front of a town hall, McCart, 
while keeping a sharp lookout boldly advanced to the building. He knocked, and when the doorkeeper, who'd learnt his lesson, asked what was wanted, he uttered such terrible threats that the man, feigning fright, made haste to open the door. Both leaves of it swung back slowly, and the ports then lay open and empty before them, while McCart shouted in a loud voice, Come on, my friends! That was the signal. He himself quickly jumped aside, and as the Republicans rushed in, there came from the darkness of the yard a stream of fire and a hail of bullets which swept through the gaping porch with a roar as of thunder. The doorway vomited death. The National Guards, exasperated by their long wait, eager to shake off the discomfort weighing upon them in that dismal courtyard, had fired a volley with feverish haste. The flash of the firing was so bright that, through the yellow gleams, McCart distinctly saw Rougeon taking aim. He fancied that his brother's gun was deliberately leveled at himself, and he recalled Felicite's blush and made his escape, muttering, No tricks. The rascal would kill me. He owes me eight hundred francs. In the meantime, a loud howl had arisen amid the darkness. The surprised Republicans shouted treachery and fired in their turn. A National Guard fell under the porch. But the Republicans on their side had three dead. They took to flight, stumbling over the corpses, stricken with panic and shouting through the quiet lanes, Our brothers are being murdered! in despairing voices which found no echo. Thereupon the defenders of order, having had time to reload their weapons, rushed into the empty square, firing at every street corner, wherever the darkness of a door, the shadow of a lamppost, or the jutting of a stone made them fancy they saw an insurgent. In this wise they remained there ten minutes, firing into space. The affray had burst over the slumbering town like a thunderclap. The inhabitants in the neighboring streets, roused from sleep by this terrible fusillade, sat up in bed, their teeth chattering with fright. Nothing in the world would have induced them to poke their noses out of the window. And slowly, athwart the air, in which the shots had suddenly resounded, one of the cathedral bells began to ring the tocsin with so irregular, so strange a rhythm that one might have thought the noise to be the hammering of an anvil or the echoes of a colossal kettle struck by a child in a fit of passion. This howling bell, whose sound the citizens did not recognize, terrified them yet more than the reports of the firearms had done. And there were some who thought they heard an endless train of artillery rumbling over the paving stones. They lay down again and buried themselves beneath their blankets, as if they would have incurred some danger by still sitting up in bed in their closely fastened rooms. With their seats drawn up to their chins, they held their breath and made themselves as small as possible, while their wives by their side almost fainted with terror as they buried their heads among the pillows. The National Guards, who'd remained at the ramparts, had also heard the shots, and thinking that the insurgents had entered by means of some subterranean passage, they ran up helter-skelter in groups of five or six, disturbing the silence of the streets with the tumult of their excited rush. Rudier was one of the first to arrive. However, Rougeon sent them all back to their posts after reprimanding them severely for abandoning the gates of the town. Thrown into consternation by this reproach, for in their panic they had, in fact, left the gates absolutely defenseless, they again set off at a gallop, hurrying through the streets with still more frightful uproar. Blasson might well have thought that an infuriated army was crossing it in all directions. The fusillade, the tocsin, the marches and countermarches of the National Guards, the weapons which were being dragged along like clubs, the terrified cries in the darkness, all produced a deafening tumult, such as might break forth in a town taken by assault and given over to plunder. It was the final blow of the unfortunate inhabitants who really believed that the insurgents had arrived. They had indeed said that it would be there last night, that Plasson would be swallowed up in the earth who would evaporate into smoke before daybreak, and now lying in their beds, they awaited the catastrophe in the most abject terror 
fancying at times that their homes were already tottering. Meanwhile, Granu still rang the tocsin. When, in other respects, silence had again fallen upon the town, the mournfulness of that ringing became intolerable. Rougeon, who was in a high fever, felt exasperated by its distant wailing. He hastened to the cathedral and found the door open. The beetle was on the threshold. "'Ah, that's quite enough,' he shouted to the man. "'Anybody would think there was someone crying. It's quite unbearable.' "'But it isn't me, sir,' replied the beetle in a distressed manner. "'It's Monsieur Granou. He's gone up into the steeple. "'I must tell you that I removed the clapper of the bell by his reverence's order, "'precisely to prevent the toxin from being sounded. "'But Monsieur Granou wouldn't listen to reason. "'He climbed up, and I've no idea what he could be making that noise with.' "'Thereupon, Rougeon hastily ascended the staircase which led to the bells, shouting, that will do, that will do, for goodness sake, leave off. When he had reached the top, he caught sight of Grinu. By the light of the moon which glided through an embouchure, the ex-almond dealer was standing there hatless and dealing furious blows with a heavy hammer. He did so with a right good will. He first threw himself back, then took a spring and finally fell upon the sonorous bronze as if he wanted to crack it. One might have thought he was a blacksmith striking hot iron. But a frock-coated blacksmith, short and bald, working in a wild and awkward way. Surprise kept Rougeon motionless for a moment at the sight of this frantic bourgeois, thus belaboring the bell in the moonlight. Then he understood the kettle-like clang which this strange ringer had disseminated over the town. He shouted to him to stop. But Grenu did not hear. Rougeon was obliged to take hold of his frock coat, and then the other, recognizing him, exclaimed in a triumphant voice, Ah, you've heard it. At first I tried to knock the bell with my fists, but that hurt me. Fortunately, I found this hammer. Just a few more blows, eh? However, Rougeon dragged him away. Grenu was radiant. He wiped his forehead and made his companion promise to let everybody know in the morning that he had produced all that noise with a mere hammer. What an achievement, and what a position of importance that furious ringing would confer upon him. Towards morning, Rougeon bethought himself of reassuring Felicité. In accordance with his orders, the National Guards had shut themselves up in the town hall. He'd forbidden them to remove the corpses, under the pretext that it was necessary to give the populace of the old quarter a lesson. And as, while hastening to the Rue de la Bain, he passed over the square, on which the moon was no longer shining, he inadvertently stepped on the clenched hand of a corpse that lay beside the footpath. At this he almost fell. That soft hand, which yielded beneath his heel, brought him an indefinable sensation of disgust and horror and thereupon he hastened at full speed along the deserted streets, fancying that a bloody fist was pursuing him. There are four of them on the ground, he said, as he entered his house. He and his wife looked at one another as though they were astonished at their crime. The lamplight imparted the hue of yellow wax to their pale faces. Have you left them there? asked Felicite. They must be found there. Of course. I didn't pick them up. They're lying on their backs. I stepped on something soft. Then he looked at his boot. His heel was covered with blood. While he was putting on a pair of shoes, Felicite resumed, Well, so much the better. It's over now. People won't be inclined to repeat that you only fire at mirrors. The fusillade which the Rougeons had planned in order that they might be finally recognized as the saviors of Plassans brought the whole terrified and grateful town to their feet. The day broke mournfully with the grey melancholy of a winter morning. The inhabitants, hearing nothing further, ventured forth, weary of trembling beneath their sheets. At first some ten or fifteen appeared. Later on, when a rumor spread that the insurgents had taken flight, 
leaving their dead in every gutter. Plasson rose in a body and descended upon the town hall. Throughout the morning, people strolled inquisitively round the four corpses. They were horribly mutilated, particularly one which had three bullets in the head. But the most horrible to look upon was the body of a National Guard who'd fallen under the porch. He had received the charge of a small shot used by the Republicans in lieu of bullets, full in the face, and blood oozed from his torn and riddled countenance. The crowd feasted their eyes upon this horror with the avidity for revolting spectacles which is so characteristic of cowards. The National Guard was freely recognized he was the pork butcher, Dubrul, the man whom Rudier had accused on the Monday morning of having fired with culpable eagerness. Of the three other corpses, two were journeyman hatters. The third was not identified. For a long while, gaping groups remained shuddering in front of the red pools which stained the pavement, often looking behind them with an air of mistrust as though that summary justice which had restored order during the night by force of arms were, even now, watching and listening to them, ready to shoot them down in their turn, unless they kissed with enthusiasm the hand that had just rescued them from a demagogy. The panic of the night further augmented the terrible effect produced in the morning by the sight of the four corpses. The true history of the fusillade was never known. The firing of the combatants, Grenou's hammering, the helter-skelter rush of the National Guards through the streets, had filled people's ears with such terrifying sounds that most of them dreamed of a gigantic battle waged against countless enemies. When the victors, magnifying the number of their adversaries with instinctive braggardism, spoke of about 500 men, everybody protested against such a low estimate. Some citizens asserted that they'd looked out of their windows and seen an immense stream of fugitives passing by for more than an hour. Moreover, everybody had heard the bandits running about. Five hundred men would never have been able to rouse a whole town. It must have been an army, and a fine big army, too, which the brave militia of Plassans had driven back into the ground. This phrase of their having been driven back into the ground first used by Rougeon, struck people as being singularly appropriate, for the guards who were charged with the defense of the rampart swore by all that was holy that not a single man had entered or quitted the town, a circumstance which tinged what had happened with mystery, even suggesting the idea of horned demons who'd vanished amidst flames, and thus fairly upsetting the minds of the multitude. It's true the guards avoided all mention of their mad gallops, and so the more rational citizens were inclined to believe that a band of insurgents had really entered the town either by a breach in the wall or some other channel. Later on, rumors of treachery were spread abroad, and people talked of an ambush. The cruel truth could no longer be concealed by the men whom Ricard had led to slaughter, but so much terror still prevailed and the sight of blood had thrown so many cowards into the arms of the reactionary party that these rumors were attributed to the rage of the vanquished Republicans. It was asserted, on the other hand, that Macart had been made prisoner by Rougeon, who kept him in a damp cell, where he was letting him slowly die of starvation. This horrible tale made people bow to the very ground whenever they encountered Rougeon. This ends Chapter 6. Part 3 Section 16 of The Fortune of the Rougeon, Book 1 of Rougeon Maca Cycle by Emile Zola, translated by Henri Visitelli. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Mark Leder. Chapter 6, Part 4 Thus it was that this grotesque personage, this pale, flabby, tongue-bellied citizen, became in one night a terrible captain whom nobody dared to ridicule any more. He had steeped his foot in blood. The inhabitants of the old quarter stood dumb with fright before the corpses. 
But towards 10 o'clock, when the respectable people of the new town arrived, the whole square hummed with subdued chatter. People spoke of the other attack, of the seizure of the mayor's office, in which a mirror only had been wounded. But this time they no longer pooh-poohed Rougeon. They spoke of him with respectful dismay. He was indeed a hero, a deliverer. The corpses, with open eyes, stared at those gentlemen, the lawyers and householders, who shuddered as they murmured that civil war had many cruel necessities. The notary, the chief of a deputation sent to the town hall on the previous evening, went from group to group, recalling the proud words, I am prepared, then used by the energetic man to whom the town owed its safety. There was a general feeling of humiliation. Those who had railed most cruelly against the 41, those especially who had referred to the Rougeon as intriguers and cowards who merely fired shots in the air, were the first to speak of granting a crown of laurels to the noble citizen of whom Plassan would be forever proud. For the pools of blood were drying on the pavement, and the corpses proclaimed to what a degree of audacity the party of disorder, pillage, and murder had gone, and what an iron hand had been required to put down the insurrection. Moreover, the whole crowd was eager to congratulate Grenou and shake hands with him. The story of the hammer had become known. By an innocent falsehood, however, of which he himself soon became unconscious, he asserted that, having been the first to see the insurgents, he had set about striking the bell in order to sound the alarm, so that, but for him, the National Guards would have been massacred. This doubled his importance. His achievement was declared prodigious. People spoke of him now as Monsieur Isidore. Don't you know the gentleman who sounded the toxin with a hammer? Although the sentence was somewhat lengthy, Grenou would willingly have accepted it as a title of nobility, and from that day forward he never heard the word hammer pronounced without imagining it to be some delicate flattery. While the corpses were being removed, Aristide came to look at them. He examined them on all sides, sniffing and looking inquisitively at their faces. His eyes were bright, and he had a sharp expression of countenance. In order to see some wound the better, he even lifted up the blouse of one corpse with the very hand which on the previous day had been suspended in a sling. This examination seemed to convince him and remove all doubt from his mind. He bit his lips remained there for a moment in silence, and then went off for the purpose of hastening the issue of the Independent, for which he'd written a most important article. And as he hurried along beside the houses, he recalled his mother's words, You will see tomorrow. Well, he had seen now, it was very clever. It even frightened him somewhat. In the meantime, Rougeon's triumph was beginning to embarrass him, Alone in Monsieur Garcinet's office, hearing the buzzing of the crowd, he became conscious of a strange feeling which prevented him from showing himself on the balcony. That blood in which he'd stepped seemed to have numbed his legs. He wondered what he should do until the evening. His poor, empty brain, upset by the events of the night, sought desperately for some occupation, some order to give or some measure to be taken, which might afford him some distraction. But he could think about nothing clearly. Whither was Felicité leading him? Was it really all finished now, or would he still have to kill somebody else? Then fear again assailed him. Terrible doubts arose in his mind, and he already saw the ramparts broken down on all sides by an avenging army of the Republicans, when a loud shout, The insurgents! The insurgents! burst forth under the very windows of his room. At this he jumped up, and raising a curtain, saw the crowd rushing about the square in a state of terror. What a thunderbolt! In less than a second he pictured himself ruined, plundered, and murdered. He cursed his wife, he cursed the whole town. Then, as he looked behind him in a suspicious manner, seeking some means of escape, he heard the mob break out, into applause. 
uttering shouts of joy, making the very glass rattle with their wild delight. Then he returned to the window. The women were waving their handkerchiefs, and the men were embracing each other. There were some among them who joined hands and began to dance. Rougeon stood there, stupefied, unable to comprehend it all and feeling his head swimming, the big, deserted, silent building in which he was alone quite frightened him. When he afterwards confessed his feelings to Felicité, he was unable to say how long his torture had lasted. He only remembered that a noise of footsteps, re-echoing through the vast halls, had roused him from his stupor. He expected to be attacked by men in blouses, armed with scythes and clubs, whereas it was the municipal commission which entered, quite orderly and in evening dress, each member with a beaming countenance. Not one of them was absent. A piece of good news had simultaneously cured all these gentlemen. Grenu rushed into the arms of his dear president. The soldiers, he stammered, the soldiers! A regiment had, in fact, just arrived, under the command of Colonel Masson and Monsieur de Blériot, prefect of the department. The gun barrels which had been observed from the ramparts far away in the plain had at first suggested the approach of the insurgents. Rougeon was so deeply moved on learning the truth that two big tears rolled down his cheeks. He was weeping, the great citizen. The municipal commission watched those big tears with most respectful admiration, but Grenou himself threw himself on his friend's neck, crying, Ah, oh, how glad I am! You know I'm a straightforward man. Well, we were all of us afraid. Is it not so, gentlemen? You alone were great, brave, sublime. What energy you must have had. I was just now saying to my wife, Rougeon is a great man. He deserves to be decorated. Then the gentleman proposed to go and meet the prefect. For a moment, Rougeon felt both stunned and suffocated. He was unable to believe in this sudden triumph and stammered like a child. However, he drew breath and went downstairs with the quiet dignity suited to the solemnity of the occasion. But the enthusiasm which greeted the commission and its president outside the town hall almost upset his magisterial gravity afresh. His name sped through the crowd, accompanied this time by the warmest eulogies. He heard everyone repeat Grenou's avowal and treat him as a hero who had stood firm and resolute amidst universal panic. And as far as the sub-prefecture, where the commission met the prefect, he drank his fill of popularity and glory. Monsieur de Blériot and Colonel Masson had entered the town alone, leaving their troops encamped on the Lyon Road. They'd lost considerable time through a misunderstanding as to the direction taken by the insurgents. Now, however, they knew the latter were at Orcher, and it would only be necessary to stop an hour at Plassans, just sufficient time to reassure the population and publish the cruel ordinances which decreed the sequestration of the insurgents' property and death to every individual who might be taken with arms in his hands. Colonel Masson smiled when, in accordance with the orders of the commander of the National Guards, the bolts of the Rome Gate were drawn back with a great rattling of rusty old iron. The detachment on duty there accompanied the prefect and the colonel as a guard of honor. As they traversed the Cour Sauveur, Rudier related Rougeon's epic achievements to the gentlemen. The three days of panic that had terminated with the brilliant victory of the previous night. When the two processions came face to face, therefore, Monsieur de Blériot quickly advanced towards the president of the commission, shook hands with him, congratulated him, and begged him to continue to watch over the town until the return of the authorities. Rougeon bowed, while the prefect, having reached the door of the sub-prefecture, where he wished to take a brief rest, proclaimed in a loud voice that he would not forget to mention his brave and noble conduct in his report. In the meantime, 
In spite of the bitter cold, everybody had come to their windows. Felicité, leaning forward at the risk of falling out, was quite pale with joy. Aristide had just arrived with a number of the Indépendants, in which he'd openly declared himself in favor of the coup d'état, which he welcomed as the aurora of liberty in order and of order in liberty. He'd also made a delicate allusion to the yellow drawing room, acknowledging his errors, declaring that youth is presumptuous and that great citizens say nothing, reflect in silence and let insults pass by in order to rise heroically when the day of struggle comes. He was particularly pleased with this sentence. His mother thought his article extremely well written. She kissed her dear child and placed him on her right hand. The Marquis de Canavan, weary of incarcerating himself and full of eager curiosity, had likewise come to see her and stood on her left, leaning on the window rail. When Monsieur de Blériot offered his hand to Rougeon on the square below, Félicité began to weep. Oh, see, see, she said to Aristide, he's shaken hands with him. Look, he's doing it again. And casting a glance at the windows, where groups of people were congregated, she added, How wild they must be. Look at Monsieur Perrot's wife. She's biting her handkerchief. And over there, the notary's daughter. And Madame Massicot. And the Brunet family. What faces, eh? How angry they look. Ah, indeed, it's our turn now. She followed the scene which was being acted outside the sub-prefecture with thrills of delight which shook her ardent grasshopper-like figure from head to foot. She interpreted the slightest gesture, invented words which she was unable to catch, and declared that Pierre bowed very well indeed. She was a little vexed when the prefect deigned to speak to poor Granou, who was hovering about him, fishing for a word of praise. No doubt Monsieur de Blériot already knew the story of the hammer, for the retired almond dealer turned as red as a young girl and seemed to be saying that he'd only done his duty. However, that which angered Felicité still more was her husband's excessive amiability in presenting Vuillet to the authorities. Vuillet, it is true, pushed himself forward amongst them, and Rougeon was compelled to mention him. "'What a schemer!' muttered Felicité. "'He creeps in everywhere. "'How confused my poor dear husband must be! "'See, there's the colonel speaking to him. "'What can he be saying to him?' "'Ah, little one,' the Marquis replied with a touch of irony. "'He's complimenting him for having closed the gate so carefully.' My father has saved the town, Aristide retorted curtly. Have you seen the corpses, sir? Monsieur de Carnavan did not answer. He withdrew from the window and sat down in an armchair, shaking his head with an air of some disgust. At that moment, the prefect having taken his departure, Rougeon came upstairs and threw himself upon his wife's neck. Ah, oh, my dear, he stammered. He was unable to say more. Félicité made him kiss Aristide after telling him of the superb article which the young man had inserted in the Indépendant. Pierre would have kissed the Marquise as well. He was deeply affected. However, his wife took him aside and gave him Eugène's letter, which she'd sealed up in an envelope again. She pretended that it had just been delivered. Pierre read it and then triumphantly held it out to her. You are a sorceress, he said to her laughing. You guessed everything. What folly I should have committed without you. We'll manage our little affairs together now. Kiss me, you're a good woman. He clasped her in his arms while she discreetly exchanged a knowing smile with the Marquise. This ends Chapter 6, Part 4. Section 17 of The Fortune of the Rougeon, Book 1 of Rougeon Macar Cycle by Emile Zola, translated by Henry Visitelli. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Mark Leader. 
Chapter 7 It was not until Sunday, the day after the massacre of saint Rour, that the troops passed through Plassans again. The prefect and the colonel, whom Monsieur Garçonnet had invited to dinner, once more entered the town alone. The soldiers went round the ramparts and encamped in the Faubourg, on the Nice Road. Night was falling. The sky, overcast since the morning, had a strange yellow tint, and illumined the town with a murky light, similar to the copper-colored glimmer of stormy weather. The reception of the troops by the inhabitants was timid. The blood-stained soldiers who passed by weary and silent in the yellow twilight horrified the cleanly citizens promenading on the cour. They stepped out of the way whispering terrible stories of fusillades and revengeful reprisals which still live in the recollection of the region. The coup d'etat terror was beginning to make itself felt, an overwhelming terror which kept the South in a state of tremor for many a long month. Plasson, in its fear and hatred of the insurgents, had welcomed the troops on their first arrival with enthusiasm. But now, at the appearance of that gloomy, taciturn regiment, whose men were ready to fire at a word from their officers, the retired merchants and even the notaries of a new town anxiously examined their consciences, asking if they had not committed some political peccadilloes which might be thought deserving of a bullet. The municipal authorities had returned on the previous evening in a couple of carts hired as saint Ruhr. Their unexpected entry was devoid of all triumphal display. Rougeon surrendered the mayor's armchair without much regret. The game was over, and with feverish longing he now awaited the recompense for his devotion. On the Sunday, he had not hoped for it until the following day, he received a letter from Eugène. Since the previous Thursday, Félicité had taken care to send her son the numbers of the Gazette and Independent, which, in special second editions, had narrated the Battle of the Night and the arrival of the prefect at Plassan. Eugène now replied by return of post that the nomination of a receivership would soon be signed, but added that he wished to give them some good news immediately. He had obtained the ribbon of the Legion of Honor for his father. Felicité wept with joy, her husband decorated. Her proud dream had never gone as far as that. Rougeon, pale with delight, declared they must give a grand dinner that very evening. He no longer thought of expense. He would have thrown his last fifty francs out of the drawing-room windows in order to celebrate that glorious day. Listen, he said to his wife, you must invite Sicardo. He's annoyed me with that rosette of his for a long time. Then uh, Granou and Rudier, I shouldn't be at all sorry to make them feel that it isn't their purses that will ever win them the cross. Fouillet is a skinflint, but the triumph ought to be complete. Invite him as well as the small fry. I was forgetting, you must go and call on the Marquise in person. We will seat him on your right. He'll look very well at our table." You know that Monsieur Garçonnet is entertaining the colonel and the prefect. That is to make me understand that I am nobody now. But I can afford to laugh at his mayoralty. It doesn't bring him in a sou. He's invited me, but I shall tell him that I also have some people coming. The others will laugh on the wrong side of their mouths tomorrow. And let everything be of the best. Have everything sent from the Hôtel de Provence. We must outdo the mayor's dinner." Felicité set to work. Pierre still felt some vague uneasiness amidst his rapture. The coup d'état was going to pay his debts. His son Aristide had repented of his faults, and he was at last freeing himself from Macar. But he feared some folly on Pascal's part and was especially anxious about the lot reserved for Silver. Not that he felt the least pity for the lad— he was simply afraid the matter of the gendarme might come before the assize court. Ah, if only some discriminating bullet had managed to rid him of that young scoundrel. As his wife had pointed out to him in the morning, all obstacles had fallen away before him. 
The family which had dishonored him had at the last moment worked for his elevation. His sons Eugène and Aristide, those spendthrifts, the cost of whose college life he had so bitterly regretted, were at last paying interest on the capital expended for their education. And yet the thought of that wretched Silver must come to mar his hour of triumph. While Felicité was running about to prepare the dinner for the evening, Pierre heard the arrival of a troops and determined to go and make inquiries. Sicardot, whom he had questioned on his return, knew nothing. Pascal must have remained to look after the wounded. As for Silver, he had not even been seen by the commander, who scarcely knew him. Rougeon therefore repaired to the Faubourg, intending to make inquiries there and at the same time pay Macart the 800 francs which he had just succeeded in raising with great difficulty. However, when he found himself in the crowded encampment and from a distance saw the prisoners sitting in long files on the beams in the Air saint mitre guarded by soldiers gun in hand, he felt afraid of being compromised and so slunk off to his mother's house with the intention of sending the old woman out to pick up some information. When he entered the hovel, it was almost night. At first, the only person he saw there was Makar, smoking and drinking brandy. Is that you? I'm glad of it, muttered Antoine. I'm growing deuced cold here. Have you got the money? But Pierre did not reply. He had just perceived his son Pascal leaning over the bed and thereupon he questioned him eagerly. The doctor, surprised by his uneasiness, which he attributed to paternal affection, told him that the soldiers had taken him and would have shot him had it not been for the intervention of some honest fellow whom he did not know. Saved by his profession of surgeon, he had returned to Poisson with the troops. This greatly relieved Rougeon. So there was yet another who would not compromise him. He was evincing his delight by repeated handshakings when Pascal concluded in a sorrowful voice, Oh, don't make merry. I have just found my poor grandmother in a very dangerous state. I brought her back this carbine, which she values very much. I found her lying here, and she has not moved since. Pierre's eyes were becoming accustomed to the dimness. In the fast, fading light, he saw Aunt Dide stretched, rigid and seemingly lifeless, upon her bed. Her wretched frame, attacked by neurosis from the hour of birth, was at length laid prostrate by a supreme shock. Her nerves had, so to say, consumed her blood. Moreover, some cruel grief seemed to have suddenly accelerated her slow wasting away. Her pale, nun-like face drawn and pinched by a life of gloom and cloister-like self-denial, was now stained with red blotches. With convulsed features, eyes that glared terribly and hands twisted and clenched, she lay at full length in her skirts, which failed to hide the sharp outlines of her scrawny limbs. Extended there with lips closely pressed, she imparted to the dim room all the horror of a mute death agony. Rougeon made a gesture of vexation. This heart-rending spectacle was very distasteful to him. He had company coming to dinner in the evening, and it would be extremely inconvenient for him to have to appear mournful. His mother was always doing something to bother him. She might just as well have chosen another day. However, he put on an appearance of perfect ease as he said, Bah, it's nothing. I've seen her like that a hundred times. You must let her lie still. It's the only thing that does her any good. Pascal shook his head. No, this fit isn't like the others, he whispered. I have often studied her and have never observed such symptoms before. Just look at her eyes. There is a peculiar fluidity, a pale brightness about them which causes me considerable uneasiness. And her face, how frightfully every muscle of it is distorted. Then, bending over to observe her features more closely, he continued in a whisper as though speaking to himself. 
I have never seen such a face, excepting among people who have been murdered or have died from fright. She must have experienced some terrible shock. But how did the attack begin? Rougeon impatiently inquired, at a loss for an excuse to leave the room. Pascal did not know. McCart, as he poured himself out another glass of brandy, explained that he had felt an inclination to drink a little cognac and had sent her to fetch a bottle. She'd not been long absent, and at the very moment when she returned, she'd fallen rigid on the floor without uttering a word. McCart himself had carried her to the bed. What surprises me, he said, by way of conclusion, is that she did not break the bottle. The young doctor reflected. After a short pause, he resumed. I heard two shots fired as I came here. Perhaps those ruffians have been shooting some more prisoners. If she passed through the ranks of the soldiers at that moment, the sight of blood might have thrown her into this fit. She must have had some dreadful shock. Fortunately, he had with him the little medicine case which he'd been carrying about ever since the departure of the insurgents. He tried to pour a few drops of reddish liquid between Aunt Day's closely set teeth, while McCart again asked his brother, Have you got the money? Yes, I've brought it. We'll settle now, Rougeon replied, glad of this diversion. Thereupon, McCart, seeing that he was about to be paid, began to moan. He had only learnt the consequence of his treachery when it was too late. Otherwise, he would have demanded twice or thrice as much. And he complained bitterly. Really, now a thousand francs was not enough. His children had forsaken him. He was all alone in the world and obliged to quit France. He almost wept as he spoke of his coming exile. Come now, will you take the eight hundred francs, said Rougeon, who was in haste to be off. No, certainly not. Double the sum. Your wife cheated me. If she told me distinctly what it was she expected of me, I would never have compromised myself for such a trifle. Rougeon laid the eight hundred francs upon the table. I swear I haven't got any more, he resumed. I will think of you later, but... Do, for mercy's sake, get away this evening. McCart, cursing and muttering protests, thereupon carried the table to the window and began to count the gold in the fading twilight. The coins tickled the tips of his fingers very pleasantly as he let them fall and jingled musically in the darkness. At last he paused for a moment to say, You promised to get me a berth, remember? I want to return to France, the post of rural guard in some pleasant neighborhood which I could mention would just suit me. Very well, I'll see about it, Rougeon replied. Have you got the eight hundred francs? Mercart resumed his counting. The last coins were just clinking when a burst of laughter made them turn their heads. Aunt Day was standing up in front of the bed with her bodice unfastened her white hair hanging loose and her face stained with red blotches. Pascal had in vain endeavored to hold her down. Trembling all over and with her arms outstretched, she shook her head deliriously. The blood money! The blood money! She again and again repeated. I heard the gold, and it is they, they who sold him. Ah, the murderers! They are a pack of wolves! Then she pushed her hair aback and passed her hand over her brow as though seeking to collect her thoughts. And she continued, Ah, I have long seen him with a bullet hole in his forehead. There were always people lying in wait for him with guns. They used to sign to me that they were going to fire. It's terrible. I feel someone breaking my bones and battering out my brains. Oh, mercy, mercy, I beseech you. He shall not see her any more. Never. Never. I will shut him up. I will prevent him from walking out with her. Mercy, mercy, don't fire. It is not my fault if you knew. She'd almost fallen on her knees 
and was weeping and entreating while she stretched her poor trembling hands towards some horrible vision which she saw in the darkness. Then she suddenly rose upright, and her eyes opened still more widely as a terrible cry came from her convulsed throat, as though some awful sight, visible to horror alone, had filled her with mad terror. Oh, the gendarme, she said, choking and falling backwards on the bed, where she rolled about, breaking into long bursts of furious, insane laughter. Pascal was studying the attack attentively. The two brothers, who felt very frightened and only detected snatches of what their mother said, had taken refuge in a corner of the room. When Rougeon heard the word gendarme, he thought he understood her. Ever since the murder of her lover, the elder Macar on the frontier, Auntie Day had cherished a bitter hatred against all gendarme and custom house officers, whom she mingled together in one common longing for vengeance. Why? It's the story of the poacher that she's telling us, he whispered. But Pascal made a sign to him to keep quiet. The stricken woman had raised herself with difficulty and was looking round her with a stupefied air. She remained silent for a moment, endeavoring to recognize the various objects in the room as though she were in some strange place. Then, with a sudden expression of anxiety, she asked, Where's the gun? The doctor put the carbine into her hands. At this, she raised a light cry of joy and gazed at the weapon, saying in a soft, sing-song, girlish whisper, That's it. Oh, I recognize it. It's all stained with blood. The stains are quite fresh today. His red hands have left marks of blood on the butt. Ah, poor, poor Auntie Day. Then she became dizzy once more and lapsed into silent thought. The gendarme was dead, she murmured at last. But I've seen him again. He's come back. They never die, those blackguards. Again did gloomy passion come over her, and shaking the carbine, she advanced towards her two sons, who, speechless with fright, retreated to the very wall. Her loosened skirts trailed along the ground as she drew up her twisted frame, which age had reduced to mere bones. "'It's you who fired!' she cried. "'I heard the gold! Wretched woman that I am! I brought nothing but wolves into the world! A whole family! A whole litter of wolves!' There was only one poor lad, and him they have devoured. Each had a bite at him, and their lips are covered with blood. Ah, the accursed villains! They've robbed, they've murdered, and they live like gentlemen. Village, accursed villains! She sang, laughed, cried, and repeated, accursed villains! in strangely sonorous tones which suggested a crackling of a fusillade. Pascal, with tears in his eyes, took her in his arms and laid her on the bed again. She submitted like a child, but persisted in her wailing cries, accelerating their rhythm and beating time on the sheets with her withered hands. "'That's just what I was afraid of,' the doctor said. "'She's mad.' The blow has been too heavy for a poor creature already subject as she is to acute neurosis. She will die in a lunatic asylum like her father. But what could she have seen? asked Rougeon, at last venturing to quit the corner where he'd hidden himself. I have a terrible suspicion, Pascal replied. I was going to speak to you about Silver when you came in. He's a prisoner. You must endeavor to obtain his release from the prefect if there's still time. The old oil dealer turned pale as he looked at his son. Then, rapidly, he responded, Listen to me. You stay here and watch her. I'm too busy this evening. We will see tomorrow about conveying her to the lunatic asylum at Les Toulettes. As for you, Macar, you must leave this very night. Swear to me that you will. 
I'm going to find Monsieur de Blériot. He stammered as he spoke and felt more eager than ever to get out into the fresh air of the streets. Pascal fixed a penetrating look on the mad woman and then on his father and uncle. His professional instinct was getting the better of him and he studied the mother and the sons with all the keenness of a naturalist observing the metamorphosis of some insect. He pondered over the growth of that family to which he belonged, over the different branches growing from one parent stock, whose sap carried identical germs to the farthest twigs, which bent in diverse ways according to the sunshine or shade in which they lived. And for a moment, as by the glow of a lightning flash, he thought he could espy the future of the rougeon macart family, a pack of unbridled, insatiate appetites amidst a blaze of gold and blood. Auntie Day, however, had ceased her wailing chant at the mention of Silver's name. For a moment she listened anxiously. Then she broke out into terrible shrieks. Night had now completely fallen, and the black room seemed void and horrible. The shrieks of the madwoman, who was no longer visible, rang out from the darkness as from a grave. Rougeon, losing his head, took to flight, pursued by those taunting cries, whose bitterness seemed to increase amidst the gloom. As he was emerging from the impasse saint with hesitating steps, Wondering whether it would not be dangerous to solicit Silver's pardon from the prefect, he saw Aristide prowling about the timber yard. The latter, recognizing his father, ran up to him with an expression of anxiety and whispered a few words in his ear. Pierre turned pale and cast a look of alarm towards the end of the yard, where the darkness was only relieved by the ruddy glow of a little gypsy fire. Then they both disappeared down the Rue de Rome, quickening their steps as though they'd committed a murder, and turning up their coat collars in order that they might not be recognized. That saves me an errand, Rougeon whispered. Let us go to dinner. They're waiting for us. When they arrived, the yellow drawing room was resplendent. Felicité was all over the place. Everybody was there. Cicardo, Granou, Rudier, Vouillet, the oil dealers, the almond dealers, the whole set. The Marquise, however, had excused himself on the plea of rheumatism, and besides, he was about to leave Plassan on a short trip. Those blood-stained bourgeois offended his feelings of delicacy, and moreover his relative, the Comte de Valquera, had begged him to withdraw from public notice for a little time. M. de Canavan's refusal vexed the Rougeon, but Felicité consoled herself by resolving to make a more profuse display. She hired a pair of candelabra and ordered several additional dishes as a kind of substitute for the Marquise. The table was laid in the yellow drawing room in order to impart more solemnity to the occasion. The Hôtel de Provence had supplied the silver, the china, and the glass. The cloth had been laid ever since five o'clock in order that the guests on arriving might feast their eyes upon it. At either end of a table on the white cloth were bouquets of artificial roses in porcelain vases gilded and painted with flowers. When the habitual guests of the yellow drawing room were assembled there, they could not conceal their admiration of the spectacle. Several gentlemen smiled with an air of embarrassment while they exchanged furtive glances, which clearly signified, These Rougeon are mad. They're throwing their money out of the window. The truth was that Felicité, on going round to invite her guests, had been unable to hold her tongue. So everybody knew that Pierre had been decorated and that he was about to be nominated to some post, of which, of course, they pulled wry faces. Rudier indeed observed that, the little black woman was puffing herself out too much. Now that prize they had come, this band of bourgeois, who had rushed upon the expiring republic, each one keeping an eye on the other and glorying in giving a deeper bite than his neighbor, did not think it fair that their host should have all the laurels of the battle. 
even those who'd merely howled by instinct, asking no recompense of the rising empire, were greatly annoyed to see that, thanks to them, the poorest and least reputable of them all should be decorated with the red ribbon. The whole yellow drawing room ought to have been decorated. Not that I value the decoration, Rudier said to Grenou, whom he dragged into the embrasure of a window. I refused it in the time of Louis Philippe, when I was purveyor to the court. Ah, Louis Philippe was a good king. France will never find his equal. Rudier was becoming an Orleanist once more, and he added with the crafty hypocrisy of an old hosier from the Rue Saint-Honoré, But you, my dear Granou, don't you think the ribbon would look well in your buttonhole? After all, you did as much to save the town as Rougeon did. Yesterday, when I was calling upon some very distinguished persons, they could scarcely believe it possible that you'd made so much noise with a mere hammer. Grenou stammered his thanks, and, blushing like a maiden at her first confession of love, whispered in Rudier's ear, Don't say anything about it, but I have reason to believe that Rougeon will ask the ribbon for me. He's a good fellow at heart, you know. The old hosier thereupon became grave and assumed a very affable manner. When Vuillet came and spoke to him of the well-deserved reward that their friend had just received, he replied in a loud voice, so as to be heard by Félicité, who was sitting a little way off, that men like Rougeon were an ornament to the Legion of Honor. The bookseller joined in the chorus. He had that morning received a formal assurance that the custom of the college would be restored to him. As for Sicardo, he at first felt somewhat annoyed to find himself no longer the only one of the set who was decorated. According to him, none but soldiers had a right to the ribbon. Pierre's valor surprised him. However, being in reality a good-natured fellow, he at last grew warmer and ended by saying that the Napoleons always knew how to distinguish men of spirit and energy. Rougeon and Aristide consequently had an enthusiastic reception. On their arrival, all hands were held out to them. Some of the guests went so far as to embrace them. Angèle sat on the sofa by the side of her mother-in-law, feeling very happy and gazing at the table with the astonishment of a gourmand who'd never seen so many dishes at once. When Aristide approached, Sicardot complimented his son-in-law upon his superb article in the Indépendant. He restored his friendship to him. The young man, in answer to the fatherly questions which Sicardot addressed to him, replied that he was anxious to take his little family with him to Paris, where his brother Eugène would push him forward, but he was in want of five hundred francs. Sicardo thereupon promised him the money, already foreseeing the day when his daughter would be received at the Tuileries by Napoleon III. In the meantime, Felicité had made a sign to her husband. Pierre, surrounded by everybody and anxiously questioned about his pallor, could only escape for a minute. He was just able to whisper in his wife's ear that he had found Pascal and that Macart would leave that night. Then, lowering his voice still more, he told her of his mother's insanity and placed his finger on his lips as if to say, Not a word that would spoil the whole evening. Felicité bit her lips. They exchanged a look in which they read their common thoughts. So now the old woman would not trouble them any more. The poacher's hovel would be raised to the ground as, as the walls of the Fouquet's enclosure had been demolished, and they would forever enjoy the respect and esteem of Plassans. But the guests were looking at the table. Felicité showed the gentlemen their seats. It was perfect bliss. As each one took his spoon, Sicardot made a gesture to solicit a moment's delay. Then he rose and gravely said, Gentlemen, on behalf of the company present, I wish to express to our host how pleased we are at the rewards which his courage and patriotism have procured for him. I now see that he must have acted upon a heaven-sent inspiration in remaining here, while those beggars were dragging myself and others along the high roads. Therefore, 
I heartily applaud the decision of the government. Let me finish. You can then congratulate our friend. Know then that our friend, besides being a chevalier of the Legion of Honor, is also to be appointed to a receiver of taxes. There was a cry of surprise. They had expected a small post. Some of them tried to force a smile, but aided by the side of the table, the compliments again poured forth profusely. Sicardo once more begged for silence. Wait one moment, he resumed. I have not finished. Just one word. It is probable that our friend will remain among us, owing to the death of Monsieur Perrot. While the guests burst out into exclamations, Felicité felt a keen pain in her heart. Sicardot had already told her that the receiver had been shot, but at the mention of that sudden and shocking death, just as they were starting on that triumphal dinner, it seemed as if a chilling gust swept past her face. She remembered her wish. It was she who had killed that man. However, amidst the tinkling music of the silver, the company began to do honor to the banquet. In the provinces, people eat very much and very noisily. By the time the releve was served, the gentlemen were all talking together, they showered kicks upon the vanquished, flattered one another, and made disparaging remarks about the absence of the Marquise. It was impossible, they said, to maintain intercourse with the nobility. Rudier even gave out that the Marquise had begged to be excused because his fear of the insurgents had given him jaundice. At the second course, they all scrambled like hounds at the quarry. The oil dealers and almond dealers were the men who saved France. They clinked glasses to the glory of the Rougeon. Granou, who was very red, began to stammer, while Vuillet, very pale, was quite drunk. Nevertheless, Sicardo continued filling his glass. For her part, Angel, who had already eaten too much, prepared herself some sugar and water. The gentlemen were so delighted at being freed from panic and finding themselves together again in that yellow drawing room, round a good table, in the bright light radiating from the candelabra and the chandelier, which they now saw for the first time without its fly-specked cover that they gave way to most exuberant folly and indulged in the coarsest enjoyment. Their voices rose in the warm atmosphere more huskily and eulogistically at each successive dish till they could scarcely invent fresh compliments. However, one of them, an old retired master tanner, hit upon this fine phrase, that the dinner was a perfect feast worthy of Flacullus. Pierre was radiant, and his big pale face perspired with triumph. Felicité, already accustoming herself to her new station in life, said that they would probably rent poor Monsieur Perrot's flat until they could purchase a house of their own in the new town. She was already planning how she would place her future furniture in the receiver's rooms. She was entering into possession of her Tuileries, at one moment, however, as the uproar of voices became deafening, she seemed to recollect something, and quitting her seat, she whispered in Aristide's ear, And Silver? The young man started with surprise at the question. He is dead, he replied, likewise in a whisper. I was there when the gendarme blew his brains out with a pistol. Felicité in her turn shuddered. She opened her mouth to ask her son why he had not prevented the murder by claiming the lad, but abruptly hesitating, she remained there speechless. Then Aristide, who had read her question on her quivering lips, whispered, You understand, I said nothing. So much the worse for him. I did quite right. It's a good riddance. This brutal frankness displeased Felicité. So Aristide had his skeleton like his father and mother. He would certainly not have confessed so openly that he'd been strolling about the Faubourg and had allowed his cousin to be shot had not the wine from the Hôtel de Provence and the dreams he was building upon his approaching arrival in Paris made him depart from his habitual cunning. 
The words once spoken, he swung himself to and fro on his chair. Pierre, who'd watched the conversation between his wife and son from a distance, understood what had passed and glanced at them like an accomplice, imploring silence. It was the last blast of terror, as it were, which blew over the Rougeon amidst the splendor and enthusiastic merriment of a dinner. True, Felicité, on returning to her seat, espied a taper burning behind a window on the other side of the road. Someone sat watching Monsieur Perrot's corpse, which had been brought back from saint Roux that morning. She sat down, feeling as if that taper were heating her back. But the gaiety was now increasing, and exclamations of rapture rang through the yellow drawing-room when the dessert appeared. At that same hour, the Faubourg was still shuddering at the tragedy which had stained the Arsam Mitru with blood. The return of the troops, after the carnage on the Noir Plain, had been marked by the most cruel reprisals. Men were beaten to death behind bits of wall with the butt-ends of muskets. Others had their brains blown out in ravines by the pistols of gendarmes. In order that terror might impose silence, the soldiers strewed their road with corpses. One might have followed them by the red trail which they left behind. Footnote. Though Monsieur Zola has changed his place in his account of the insurrection, that account is strictly accurate in all its chief particulars. What he says of the savagery, both of the soldiers and of their officers, is confirmed by all impartial historical writers. Editor. It was a long butchery. At every halting place, a few insurgents were massacred. Two were killed at saint Roux, three at Auxerre, one at Péage. When the troops were encamped at Plassans on the Nice Road, it was decided that one more prisoner, the most guilty, should be shot. The victors judged it wise to leave this fresh corpse behind them in order to inspire the town with respect for the new-born empire. But the soldiers were now weary of killing. None offered himself for the fatal task. The prisoners, thrown on the beams in the timber yard as though on a camp bed, and bound together in pairs by the hands, listened and waited in a state of weary, resigned stupor. At that moment, the gendarme Rangad roughly opened a way for himself through the crowd of inquisitive idlers. As soon as he heard that the troops had returned with several hundred insurgents, he'd risen from bed, shivering with fever and risking his life in the cold, dark December air. Scarcely was he out of doors when his wound reopened, the bandage which covered his eyeless socket became stained with blood, and a red streamlet trickled over his cheek and moustache. He looked frightful in his dumb fury with his pale face and blood-stained bandage, as he ran along closely scrutinizing each of the prisoners. He followed the beams, bending down and going to and fro, making the bravest shudder by his abrupt appearance. And all of a sudden, Ugh, the bandit! I've got him, he cried. He had just laid his hand on Silver's shoulder. Silver, crouching down on a beam with lifeless and expressionless face, was looking straight before him into the pale twilight with a calm, stupefied air. Ever since his departure from saint Roux, he had retained that vacant stare. Along the high road for many a league, whenever the soldiers urged on the march of their captives with the butt ends of their rifles, he'd shown himself as gentle as a child. Covered with dust, thirsty and weary, he trudged onward without saying a word, like one of those docile animals that herdsmen drive along. He was thinking of Miette. He ever saw her lying on the banner, under the trees with her eyes turned upwards, for three days he'd seen none but her, and at this very moment, amidst the growing darkness, he still saw her. Rangard turned towards the officer, who'd failed to find among the soldiers the requisite men for an execution. This villain put my eye out, he said, pointing to Silver. Hand him over to me. It's as good as done for you. The officer did not reply in words but withdrew with an air of indifference, making a vague gesture. 
The gendarme understood that the man was surrendered to him. Come, get up, he resumed, as he shook him. Silver, like all the other prisoners, had a companion attached to him. He was fastened by the arm to a peasant of Pujol named Mourg, a man about fifty, who'd been brutified by the scorching sun and the hard labor of tilling the ground. Crooked backed already, his hands hardened, his face coarse and heavy, he blinked his eyes in a stupid manner with the stubborn, distrustful expression of an animal subject to the lash. He'd set out armed with a pitchfork because his fellow villagers had done so, but he could not have explained what had thus set him adrift on the high roads. Since he'd been a prisoner, he understood it still less. He had some vague idea that he was being conveyed home. His amazement at finding himself bound, the sight of all the men staring at him, stupefied him still more. As he only spoke and understood the dialect of the region, he could not imagine what the gendarme wanted. He raised his coarse, heavy face towards him with an effort. Then, fancying he was being asked the name of his village, he said in his hoarse voice, I come from Pujol. A burst of laughter ran through the crowd, and some voices cried, Release the peasant. Bah, Rangad replied, the more of this vermin that's crossed, the better. As they're together, they can both go. There was a murmur. But the gendarme turned his terrible blood-stained face upon the onlookers, and they slunk off. One cleanly little citizen went away declaring that if he remained any longer, it would spoil his appetite for dinner. However, some boys who recognized Silvere began to speak of the red girl. Thereupon, the little citizen retraced his steps in order to see the lover of the female standard-bearer, that depraved creature who'd been mentioned in the Gazette. Silver, for his part, neither saw nor heard anything. Rangad had to seize him by the collar. Thereupon he got up, forcing Mulk to rise also. Come, said the gendarme, it won't take long. Silver then recognized the one-eyed man. He smiled. He must have understood, but he turned his head away. The sight of the one-eyed man, of his mustache, which congealed blood stiffened as with sinister rhyme, caused him profound grief. He would have liked to die in perfect peace. So he avoided the gaze of Rangad's one eye, which glared from beneath the white bandage. And of his own accord, he proceeded to the end of the Ar saint mitre to the narrow lane hidden by the timber stacks. Mourg followed him thither. The air stretched out with an aspect of desolation under the sallow sky. A murky light fell here and there from the copper-colored clouds. Never had a sadder and more lingering twilight cast its melancholy over this bare expanse, this woodyard with its slumbering timber, so stiff and rigid in the cold. The prisoners, the soldiers, and the mob along the high road disappeared amid the darkness of the trees. The expanse, the beams, the piles of planks alone grew pale under the fading light, assuming a muddy tint that vaguely suggested the bed of a dried-up torrent. The sawyer's trestles, rearing their meager framework in a corner, seemed to form gallows or the uprights of a guillotine. And there was no living soul there excepting three gypsies who showed their frightened faces at the door of their van. An old man and woman and a big girl with woolly hair whose eyes gleamed like those of a wolf. Before reaching the secluded path, Silver looked round him. He bethought himself of a far away Sunday when he'd crossed the wood yard in the bright moonlight. How calm and soft it had been. How slowly had the pale rays passed over the beams. Supreme silence had fallen from the frozen sky and amidst the silence the woolly-haired gypsy girl had sung in a low key and an unknown tongue. Then Silver remembered that the seemingly far-off Sunday was only a week old. But a week ago he'd come to bid me at farewell. How long past it seemed. 
He felt as though he'd not set foot in the woodyard for years. But when he reached the narrow path, his heart failed him. He recognized the odor of the grass, the shadows of the planks, the holes in the wall. A woeful voice rose from all those things. The path stretched out sad and lonely. It seemed longer to him than usual, and he felt a cold wind blowing down it. The spot had aged cruelly. He saw that the wall was moss-eaten, that the verdant carpet was dried up by frost, that the piles of timber had been rotted by rain. It was perfect devastation. The yellow twilight felt like fine dust upon the ruins of all that had been most dear to him. He was obliged to close his eyes that he might again behold the lane green and live his happy hours afresh. It was warm weather, and he was racing with me yet in the balmy air. Then the cruel December rains fell unceasingly, yet they still came there, sheltering themselves beneath the planks and listening with rapture to the heavy plashing of the shower. His whole life, all his happiness, passed before him like a flash of lightning. Miette was climbing over the wall, running to him, shaking with sonorous laughter. She was there. He could see her, gleaming white through the darkness, with her living helm of ink-black hair. She was talking about the magpies' nests, which are so difficult to steal, and she dragged him along with her. Then he heard the gentle murmur of the viorne in the distance, the chirping of the belated grasshoppers, and the blowing of the breeze among the poplars in the meadows of St. Clair. Ah, how they used to run! How well he remembered it! She'd learned to swim in a fortnight. She was a plucky girl. She had only had one great fault. She was inclined to pilfering. But he would have cured her of that. Then the thought of their first embraces brought him back to the narrow path. They had always ended by returning to that nook. He fancied he could hear the gypsy girl's song dying away, the creaking of the last shutters, the solemn striking of the clocks. Then the hour of separation came, and Miette climbed the wall again and threw him a kiss. And he saw her no more. Emotion choked him at the thought. He would never see her again. Never. When you're ready, jeered the one-eyed man. Come, choose your place. Silver took a few more steps. He was approaching the end of the path and could see nothing but a strip of sky in which the rust-colored light was fading away. Here had he spent his life for two years past. The slow approach of death added an ineffable charm to this pathway, which had so long served as a lover's walk. He loitered, bidding a long and lingering farewell to all he loved, the grass, the timber, the stone of the old wall, all those things into which Miette had breathed life. And again his thoughts wandered. They were waiting till they should be old enough to marry. Auntie Day would remain with them. Ah, if they had fled far away very far away to some unknown village where the scamps of the Faubourg would no longer have been able to come and cast Chantagray's crime in his daughter's face. What peaceful bliss! They would have opened a wheelwright's workshop beside some high road. No doubt, he cared little for his ambitions now. He no longer thought of coach-making, of carriages with broad, varnished panels as shiny as mirrors. In the stupor of his despair, he could not remember why his dream of bliss would never come to pass. Why did he not go away with Miette and Aunt Dide? Then as he racked his memory, he heard the sharp crackling of a fusillade. He saw a standard fall before him, its staff broken and its folds drooping like the wings of a bird brought down by a shot. It was the Republic falling asleep with Miette under the red flag, Ah, what wretchedness. They were both dead. Both had bleeding wounds in their breasts. And it was they, the corpses of his two loves, that now barred his path of life. 
he had nothing left him and might well die himself. These were the thoughts that had made him so gentle, so listless, so childlike all the way from saint Ruhr. The soldiers might have struck him. He would not have felt it. His spirit no longer inhabited his body. It was far away, prostrate beside the loved ones who were dead under the trees amidst the pungent smoke of the gunpowder. But the one-eyed man was growing impatient, giving a push to Morg, who was lagging behind. He growled, Get along, do. I don't want to be here all night. Silver stumbled. He looked at his feet. A fragment of a skull lay whitening in the grass. He thought he heard a murmur of voices filling the pathway. The dead were calling him, those long departed ones whose warm breath had so strangely perturbed him and his sweetheart during the sultry July evenings. He recognized their low whispers. They were rejoicing. They were telling him to come and promising to restore Miette to him beneath the earth in some retreat which would prove still more sequestered than this old trysting place. The cemetery, whose oppressive odors and dark vegetation had breathed eager desire into the children's hearts, while alluringly spreading out its couches of rank grass, without succeeding, however, in throwing them into one another's arms, now longed to imbibe Silver's warm blood. For two summers past it had been expecting the young lovers. "'Is it here?' asked the one-eyed man. Silver looked in front of him. He'd reached the end of the path. His eyes fell on the tombstone, and he started. Miette was right. That stone was for her. Here lieth, Marie, died. She was dead. That slab had fallen over her. His strength failing him, he leant against the frozen stone. How warm it had been when they sat in that nook, chatting for many a long evening. He'd always come that way, and the pressure of her foot as she alighted from the wall had worn away the stone's surface in one corner. The mark seemed instinct with something of her lissom figure, and to Silver it appeared as if some fatalism attached to all these objects, as if the stone were there precisely in order that he might come to die beside it, there where he had loved. The one-eyed man cocked his pistols. Death. Death. The thought fascinated Silver. It was to this spot, then, that they had led him by the long white road which descends from saint Ruhr to Plassans. If he'd known it, he would have hastened on yet more quickly in order to die on that stone, at the end of a narrow path, in the atmosphere where he could still detect the scent of Miette's breath. Never had he hoped for such consolation in his grief. Heaven was merciful. He waited, a vague smile playing on his face. Morg, meantime, had caught sight of the pistols. Hitherto he had allowed himself to be dragged along, stupidly. But fear now overcame him, and he repeated in a tone of despair, I come from Pujol! I come from Pujol! Then he threw himself on the ground, rolling at the gendarme's feet, breaking out into prayers for mercy and imagining that he was being mistaken for someone else. What does it matter to me that you come from Pujol? Rangard muttered. And as the wretched man, shivering and crying with terror, and quite unable to understand why he was going to die, held out his trembling hands, his deformed, hard laborer's hands, exclaiming in his patois that he'd done nothing and ought to be pardoned, the one-eyed man grew quite exasperated at being unable to put the pistol to his temple, owing to his constant movements. "'Will you hold your tongue?' he shouted. Thereupon Moorg, mad with fright and unwilling to die, began to howl like a beast, like a pig that's being slaughtered. "'Hold your tongue, you scoundrel!' the gendarme repeated, and he blew his brains out. The peasant fell with a thud. His body rolled to the foot of a timber stack, where it remained doubled up. The violence of a shock had severed the rope which fastened him to his companion. 
Silver fell on his knees before the tombstone. It was to make his vengeance the more terrible that Rangad had killed Morg first. He played with his second pistol, raising it slowly in order to relish Silver's agony. But the latter looked at him quietly. Then again the sight of this man, with the one fierce scorching eye, made him feel uneasy. He averted his glance, fearing that he might die cowardly if he continued to look at that feverishly quivering gendarme with blood-stained bandage and bleeding moustache. However, as he raised his eyes to avoid him, he perceived Justin's head just above the wall, at the very spot where Miette had been wont to leap over. Justin had been at the Porte de Rome among the crowd when the gendarme had led the prisoners away. He had set off as fast as he could by way of the Jasmefrain in his eagerness to witness the execution. The thought that he alone of all the four Bourg scamps would view the tragedy at his ease as from a balcony made him run so quickly but that he twice fell down. And in spite of his wild chase, he arrived too late to witness the first shot. He climbed the mulberry tree in despair, but he smiled when he saw that Silver still remained. The soldiers had informed him of his cousin's death, and now the murder of the wheelwright brought his happiness to a climax. He awaited the shot with that delight which the sufferings of others always afforded him. The delight increased tenfold by the horror of the scene and a feeling of exquisite fear. Silver, on recognizing that vile scamp's head all by itself above the wall, that pale, grinning face with hair standing on end, experienced a feeling of fierce rage, a sudden desire to live. It was the last revolt of his blood, a momentary mutiny. He again sank down on his knees, gazing straight before him. The last vision passed before his eyes in the melancholy twilight. At the end of the path, at the entrance of the impasse Saint Mitre, he fancied he could see Aunt Dide standing erect, white and rigid like the statue of a saint, while she witnessed his agony from a distance. At that moment he felt the cold pistol on his temple. There was a smile on Justin's pale face. Closing his eyes, Silver heard the long-departed dead wildly summoning him. In the darkness he now saw nothing save Miette, wrapped in the banner, under the trees, with her eyes turned towards heaven. Then the one-eyed man fired, and all was over. The lad's skull burst open like a ripe pomegranate. His face fell upon the stone, with his lips pressed to the spot which Miette's feet had worn, that warm spot which still retained a trace of his dead love. And in the evening at dessert, at the Rougeon's abode, Bursts of laughter arose with the fumes from the table, which was still warm with the remains of the dinner. At last the Rougeons were nibbling at the pleasures of the wealthy. Their appetites, sharpened by thirty years of restrained desire, now fell to with wolfish teeth. These fierce, insatiate wild beasts, scarcely entering upon indulgence, exulted at the birth of the empire, the dawn of the rush for the spoils. The coup d'etat, which retrieved the fortune of the Bonapartes, also laid the foundation for that of the Rougeon. Pierre stood up, held out his glass, and exclaimed, I drink to Prince Louis, to the Emperor. The gentlemen, who had drowned their jealousies in champagne, rose in a body and clinked glasses with deafening shouts. It was a fine spectacle. The bourgeois of Plassans, Rudier, Granou, Fouillet, and all the others wept and embraced each other over the corpse of the Republic, which as yet was scarcely cold. But a splendid idea occurred to Sicardo. He took from Felicite's hair a pink satin bow, which he placed over her right ear in honor of the occasion, cut off a strip of the satin with his dessert knife, and then solemnly fastened it to Rougeon's buttonhole. The latter feigned modesty and pretended to resist, but his face beamed with joy as he murmured, No, I beg you, it's too soon. 
we must wait until the decree is published. Zones, Sicardo exclaimed, will you please keep that? It's an old soldier of Napoleon who decorates you. The whole company burst into applause. Felicité almost swooned with delight. Silent Granu jumped up on a chair in his enthusiasm, waving his napkin and making a speech which was lost amid the uproar. The yellow drawing room was wild with triumph. But the strip of pink satin fastened to Pierre's buttonhole was not the only red spot in that triumph of the Rougeon. A shoe with a blood-stained heel, still lay forgotten under the bedstead in the adjoining room. The taper burning at Monsieur Pierrot's bedside over the way gleamed, too, with the lurid redness of a gaping wound amidst the dark night. And yonder, far away, in the depths of the Air saint mitre a pool of blood was congealing upon a tombstone. End of chapter 7 End of The Fortune of the Rougeon, Book One of Rougeon Macar Cycle, by Emile Zola, translated by Henry Visitelli.